As every soul alive today knows, humankind has been locked in a death spiral known as the Succession Wars since the final collapse of the Star League. The first of these began almost immediately after Alexander Kerensky's exodus over 240 years ago, and there has been less than a decade of quiet since. Even dividing this period into separate conflicts remains a contentious issue among historians, as in many cases low-level fighting continued and a peace agreement was never reached. In its day, what we now call the First was simply known as the Great Succession War, and the idea that the chain of conflicts would continue for another two centuries was inconceivable. The era of the Star League was bookended by two of the most devastating calamities humanity had ever known, the Reunification War and the Star League Civil War. Each directly resulted in over a hundred million deaths in less than two decades. Despite its fabled reputation as a time of unity, by the latter years of the Star League, the Inner Sphere was poised for self-destruction. Kerensky's defense force was the only thing keeping the proverbial foot on the brake. But with their departure, there was nothing left to keep the Great Houses in check. The cataclysm that followed would lead to more wartime casualties than humanity's hundred millennia of history combined. By the end of 2784, this outcome had become an inevitability. Throughout the era of the Star League, each individual nation had been carefully kept in check, but with the shocking exodus of the peacekeeping SLDF, those left behind suddenly found themselves on equal footing. The seat of power was vacant, and supremacy overall was attainable. The ruling Cameron line had been exterminated during the Amaris coup, as had the Eusep Ramaris's offspring, and perhaps the only realistic candidate to replace them had left on a self-imposed exile. The surviving associate members had won their freedom during the brutal periphery uprising, the long-suffering territorial states having little interest in continued involvement in the League. This left the five council lords of the other member states, none with the authority to claim the position of First Lord outright, but all covetous of the power that came with it. If they wanted to press their claim, they would have to do so through force of arms. Humanity's slow slide back into feudalism was at its high watermark around this point. The fate of trillions within the Inner Sphere were now controlled by just a handful of ruling dynasties. The five heads of state that had disbanded the High Council in 2781, more through fear that their rivals would use it to seize power than a willingness to give it up themselves, were First Prince John Davian of the Federated Sons, Coordinator Minoru Kurita of the Traconis Combine, Captain General Kenyon Manick of the Free Worlds League, Chancellor Barbara Liao of the Capellan Confederation, and Archon Robert Steiner II of the Lyran Commonwealth. Upon the latter's return to his capital of Tharkad, he immediately fell ill and died shortly afterwards, the prevailing rumour at the time being that it was divine retribution for his involvement in the breakup of the Star League. His sister Jennifer took up the Archonship in his stead. These five would in time come to be known as the Successor Lords, a title that is still jealously clung to by their descendants to this day. The First Succession War was a true free-for-all with no meaningful alliances to speak of. Nor was there a single event that kicked off the fighting on all fronts simultaneously. As such, natives of each realm often date the conflict based on their own individual histories. However, more often than not, the engagements that took place in the years between Kerensky's departure and the point at which each head of state declared their first lordship are segregated into a period known as the Phony War, and it began within the ruins of the Terran hegemony. The nation that had grown up around humanity's birthplace was at one time the mightiest of all the interstellar states. Now, it was an irradiated wasteland. The SLDF had done their best to manage the humanitarian crisis as they advanced towards Terra, but many planets were still barely surviving at a subsistence level, while others were completely abandoned. Racing to their aid were the noble Great Houses, flooding the outer worlds with relief efforts and thereby clandestinely positioning themselves to claim ownership of those systems in the coming years. Some of the threatened planets attempted to band together into new realms, as had happened following the breakup of the Terran Alliance centuries earlier. 
The core worlds were in the worst state, still protected by the remnants of the Star League Defense Force, unofficially helmed by Jerome Blake. His branch of government, the Department of Communications, was the last vestige of the once colossal Bureau of Star League Affairs. His efforts made him the face of the recovery, without whom countless millions would have starved. Indeed, among some citizens, he was an almost saintly figure. Throughout the previous two years, the soon-to-be successor states had been claiming worlds along their borders, gradually closing in around Terra. One of the most rapacious was the Free Worlds League. The Captain General had faced a crisis when the League fell, as that institution was what had assured the Maddox family continued dynasty over their realm. With war in the offing, he was able to convince his government to agree to Resolution 288 on December 19, 2784, which would grant him supreme authority for the duration of the crisis, forestalling any talk of a reduction in Maddox power. The seized hegemony worlds were touted as bountiful prizes, made possible only through his actions, their sorry condition kept hidden from the public by his intelligence agency, SAFE. The voracious appetite of the other ruling lords led them to continue to absorb planets into their empires wherever they could, but before they came into conflict with Blake and his SLDF forces, they ran into each other. Town was one of the former hegemony worlds seized by the Federated Suns in 2783, and would be one of the ignition points of the Phony War. The occupation force on town came from two regions of Davian space. The Hazars redeployed from Collier in the Fairfax combat region, while the interceptors transferred across from Ulaanbaatar in the Chesterton ZR. Their place of origin seemed an insignificant fact to the Federated Sun's High Command, but they were about to discover how dysfunctional their military had become. Spending cuts on transportation, coupled with a lack of action over the past few decades, have resulted in the armed forces of the Federated Sons becoming increasingly provincial, with stronger ties to their home planet than their compatriots elsewhere in the AWFS. When the two deployed to town, they took up responsibility for one hemisphere each and had little to no communication or combat drills together. A military coincidence soon brought their lack of cooperation into sharp focus. Arriving in system near simultaneously in February 2785, were a battalion-sized raiding force each from the Capellan Confederation Armed Forces and the Draconis Combine Mustard Soldiery. Neither was working with the other, and both had their own individual targets. Majors Wilkins and Donner argued about how to respond to the incoming raiders, their inability to reach a consensus allowing the hostile forces time to make landfall on opposite ends of town virtually unopposed. They swept across the planet, ransacking what military equipment they could reach, or causing widespread destruction and loss of life. 4,000 died in the two weeks it took for the Hazars and Interceptors to come together and force the Capellan and Combine forces to withdraw. In the aftermath of the debacle, the First Prince passed the Town Charter, which gave the militia free reign to take what they needed from the AWFS warehouses, though this was of little comfort to the dead. Elsewhere in the Terran hegemony, the successor states continued to gobble up undefended worlds. The same was true for several jointly administered planets along the borders between other states. The Capellan seizure of Alexa the previous year had caused considerable concern among the field marshals of the Federated Sons, as they had fought a brief border war with the Confederation just two decades earlier. When they took Andro in 2785, Chief of MI2 Dana Bancroft advised the First Prince that the Capellans were about to launch a campaign against him, a warning that he took to heart. Across the Inner Sphere, the Lyran Commonwealth had the same concerns about the Free Worlds League's efforts to take full control of jointly administered worlds along their border, and they were right to think so. Kenya Maddock had been moving supplies to the Bolan Thumb in preparation of a major assault for some years now but Kerensky's exodus had diverted his attention, along with the additional regiments meant to take up positions within the region, to the softer, juicier targets of the Terran hegemony. Steiner had long chafed at the existence of the Bolan salient jutting into their territory. With Kerensky no longer on the map, Lyran High Command began making preparations for what would be known as Operation Elbow Joint. General of the Army's Paul Steiner was the mastermind behind the Bolan offensive with command of the task force given to Lieutenant General Baron Richard Johansson von Eilenberg, a veteran of Operation Ormelich. Participating in the attack would be three mech and six conventional regiments, 
as well as seven of the Navy's warships, a trio of Commonwealth-class cruisers and a quartet of Mako-class corvettes. The defence of the world was orchestrated from within the old SLDF base known as the Overwatch. Notionally in charge of the two mech regiments, three League-class destroyers and single Aegis-class cruiser deployed to Bolun was Colonel Salam Tut. The operation began on March 7th when the merchant transport Lucian Bell arrived at the system's zenith. Two squadrons of aerospace fighters exited the vessel and swiftly destroyed every non Leiden craft at the jump point, while a dropship ferried marines across to take control of the customs station. The LCS Furilo now appeared, transporting the Sky Rangers invasion troops. The station's occupants desperately tried to contact Bolan, but their message would take hours to arrive yet. Long before then, the remaining six warships and eight regiments of the LCAF arrived at a pirate point, in position to intercept the planet's solar orbit. The space battle began poorly for the over-eager Commonwealth Navy. Their corvettes raced ahead to engage the heavier League destroyers. Tiberium took the worst pounding, but was able at least to force the Nerva to withdraw. The ship was failing though, and in an act of desperation, plotted a collision course with the inbound Donegal. The Leiden crew was able to evade the ramming attack, and devastated the Tiberium with a broadside in the process, sending the League vessel tumbling into orbit. Meanwhile, the other two cruisers engaged each other with withering fire. Caledonia suffered heavy damage, but outperformed the much older Manaslu, which was blown apart by a pair of nuclear-armed missiles. The remaining League-class destroyers continued to fight for a time, bringing down a pair of Makos, but had to withdraw as the Furilo approached from the jump point. The Lyrans achieved naval supremacy by the 13th. The LCAF began landing the next day. Orbital guns located within the Overwatch made approaching the Sabari island chain all but impossible. This focused the action on the two continents of Kashmir and Saket, and the four major cities on world. The Arcturan guards made landfall at Peshawar, quickly eliminating all resistance in the area. While their aerospace fighters swept the surrounding townships for targets, Johansson threatened an imminent attack on Calcutta. Instead, the attack came two days later at Quetta, on the opposite side of the planet. Furilo arrived overhead to bombard the spaceport, while the Sky Rangers descended to lay siege to the city below. Meanwhile, the 11th Arcturan Guards were boosted across world to assault the capital city of Mumbai. A day-long bombardment left both cities in ruins. On March 18th, the Lyran's massed aerospace assets conducted a brutal firebombing campaign at Calcutta, obliterating all resistance within and claiming the lives of some 20,000 civilians. That number is only an estimate, as what happened next makes the true figure unknowable. Colonel Tut ordered all units to rush the Lyran positions and pin them in place, while he began launch procedures. As the fighting grew fierce, the first nuclear weapons began descending on the four major cities of Bolan, annihilating both Freeworlders and Lyrans alike. The Lieutenant General quickly raced his naval assets towards the Overwatch and unleashed his full arsenal on the base below to stop the launches. The Bolan defenders had enough dropships on hand to lift just one of their battalions off world, their remaining destroyers in orbit perishing in a rearguard action. The Lyran Commonwealth had achieved its first victory of the Succession Wars, but it had come at a heavy cost. Around 45% of their invasion force had been destroyed, and Bolan itself had been devastated. In the aftermath of Operation Elbow Joint, Kenya Manic officially declared a state of war between the Free Worlds League and Lyran Commonwealth. He also stated that the conduct of the fighting on Bolan made it clear that neither side had any intention of sticking to the mythical and long-defunct Ares Conventions. Henceforth, the FWLM had free reign to use their full strategic arsenal. He may have regretted that decision later that year, when a pair of Commonwealth-class cruisers arrived at the recently seized hegemony planet Denabola. Colonel DeWitt felt little compunction about ordering orbital strikes to devastate the forces sheltering in the old SLDF base below. Likewise, they quickly dispatched the pair of Vincent-class corvettes in orbit, clearing the path for their own ground troops to make landfall and claim Denebola as their own. On the Commonwealth Spinward border, the Draconis Combine was looking to make its own gains. 
they had illicitly hired 20 bandit groups to keep their neighbours off balance, while they prepared their offensive. Minoru Kirita was planning an all-out assault on one of his two rival successor lords as a means to demonstrate his own strength, and through it, Kirita's right to rule the Star League, though it was becoming increasingly unclear as to whether such a thing even existed anymore. He would make his decision based on a series of probing attacks, the first of which targeted Haus Steiner. In August 2785, Bone Norman was raided by a battalion of unmarked mechs whose primary concern seemed to be causing as much damage as possible. Subsequent attacks by aerospace fighters in the Barcelona and Somerset systems raised the spectre of a resurgent from Wales Republic among Lyran High Command. Some speculated that the attacks, which had in truth been carried out by the Combine's Azami people, were Curitan false flag operations, but Paul Steiner concluded that both aggressors would be just as likely to exploit a weakness along the periphery. As such, several regiments were redeployed to the Corwood border. The DCMS now struck, targeting the planets Gram and Trolloc Prime, overwhelming the planetary militia by December 2785. In the case of the latter, some 3,000 civilians caught in the crossfire found refuge within the local HPG station, an act of magnanimity that earned Blake's followers further acclaim. That same month, the Dieron regulars were making another assault on the planet Town, only this time their goal was to capture the planet. Their earlier raid had clued them in to how disorganised the planetary garrison was, and the mechs and seven supporting infantry and aerospace regiments made short work of them. Reinforcements only arrived in February, by which time it was too late. On Terra, Jerome Blake was busy reinforcing his own tenuous position. The rest of the inner sphere was closing in on all sides, and it wouldn't be long before they reached humanity's homeworld. In December 2785, one of Blake's close friends from the latter days of the Civil War, Conrad Toyama, became the chief administrator for the SL Comnet Prime Circuit Station on Dieron. The network had come back online just three days after Kerensky's exodus. There was little doubt that he would not be returning, and so in the months that followed, the decision was made to rename the unwieldy and misrepresentative Star League Department of Communications. At Toyama's urging, January 2786 saw the launch of the newly rebranded Comstar. The organisation began by introducing the Comstar Letter of Credit, later inheriting the colloquial name Seabill from the old Star League dollar. The recovery efforts also continued, with one of the largest projects being the Comstar Space Debris Command, which was tasked with clearing the wreckage of many hundreds of warships and jumpships scattered throughout the hegemony. Officially, these hulks were all scrapped, but Blake concealed the existence of a rare few serviceable vessels. Curiously, no effort was made to reconstruct the orbital mirror over Venus, destroyed in a foolhardy manoeuvre by Amaris' goons. Over the next two centuries, the atmosphere slowly reverted back to its inhospitable state, with barely a few thousand left today inhabiting the former home of 200 million. Elsewhere in the Terran hegemony, several systems were taking matters of defence into their own hands. They could see the old state collapsing, but wished to retain their independence from the larger nations around them. A fledgling alliance was formed in the Lone Star province, key among which were the systems of Dieron and Inglesmund, containing the Stellar Trek and LTV Aerospace warship facilities. The unification of these planets under Inglesmund came just in time to resist House Kirita's next thrust deep into the Lone Star province. The DCMS entered the region in early 2786, their objective to settle an old score dating back almost 500 years to before the Combine's founding, when Dieron split from the rest of the Alliance of Galadin, in protest of Shiro Kiritas' double dealing. The former hegemony worlds gave the Kiritans unexpected difficulties, however. The industrial output of these planets allowed them to field advanced battle mechs that at one time would have been exclusive to the SLDF Royal Regiments. Furthermore, they had at least two warships of their own, with several more under construction. In March, the First Prince and his Field Marshals concluded that they would soon be at war with the Capellan State, and decided that a preemptive strike was preferable. They were still monitoring what appeared to be significant DCMS activity within the Gallatin district on their Corwood flank, 
but the Department of Military Intelligence suggested that the Kiritans were more afraid of Kerensky returning than preparing to attack. Large chunks of the Davian armed forces relocated to the Liao border around the Chesterton Worlds. That same month, Kenyan Maddox set about evening the score for Bolan and Denebola, beginning with an attack against Altoona. Nuclear weapons were used to eradicate the surviving battalion of Sky Rangers from Operation Elbow Joint. He followed that up with the takeover of the undefended Horneer's Keep in July. It seemed to the rest of the inner sphere that Minoru Kirita had decided which of his immediate foes would become the focus of their own upcoming campaign. In June, the Lyran defences at Scondia were caught completely unawares when a merchant vessel appeared in system and undocked with a sextet of dropships. They burned hard for the planet, whereupon half of them made landfall outside the major northern cities. The LCAF moved to protect the high priority factories, but the attacking Curitans had a different target in mind. They began instead to open fire on the civilian structures, intent on causing as much death and destruction as possible. The Arcturan guards naturally rushed to their aid, but this left the factories undefended. The second half of the Benjamin regulars now touched down at their actual objectives and raided the facilities while the faster distraction force outpaced the heavier but slower Lyran machines to make it off-world with a minimum of casualties. The same could not be said for the Scondians, 20,000 of whom had been killed. By the midpoint of 2786, all of the border worlds formerly administered by the Star League had been taken over by one nation or another. Some of the Terran administrators were ushered out at gunpoint, others were wooed to lend their services to new masters. Remnants of the SLDF were either hired on or chased out, such as McKinnon's company on Kesai 4, who signed up with the Crucis Lancers after the Draconis Combine tried to eradicate them. The hegemony itself had continued to shrink. Two of the former provincial capitals were now under foreign occupation. Jerome Blake could see that the so-called phony war was about to descend into something much worse. If he had any hope of protecting the Core Worlds, he would have to act fast. He outlined his plan to the Comstar First Circuit, the HPG administrators for each of the Prime Circuit stations. Preparations began for Operation Silver Shield. Trusted mercenary groups formed from ex-SLDF soldiers began relocating to Earth while Blake himself departed to meet each of the successor lords. He sought recognition of Comstar's neutral status and assurances that the HPGs would not be targeted during any upcoming conflict. In a rimward direction, the Capellan Confederation moved to shore up their borders by sending the Zion Lancers to secure their homeworld after it had been taken by opportunistic Marek forces. They also cleared a path to the planet Northwind, home of the famous Northwind Highlanders, long-time mercenary auxiliaries for the Capellans. The Federated Sons likewise moved to take the home system of their Deneb-like cavalry. In December, the DCMS finally achieved their goal of reclaiming Dieron after its secession 475 years earlier. With the system under Draconis Combine rule, the Dieron regulars had at last secured a home for themselves, and a new military district was established. With this victory, Coordinator Minoru Kirita felt bold enough to make the announcement that each of the successor states were considering. He proclaimed himself First Lord of the Star League, and declared war on any who would challenge him. The succession wars had begun. When Minoru Kurita proclaimed himself First Lord in December 2786, it kicked off the largest conflict in human history. With so many players involved and such high stakes, it is worth dedicating a chapter of our story to covering the participants in detail. Much of this information remains relevant to the present day 3025, so laying out this foundational knowledge now will allow us to skip past it when covering later events. 
Chiefly, this will be an in-depth look at the political landscape of the Inner Sphere, focusing on the successor states in the year 2787, the size of their realm, their internal structure, industrial might, and the reputation of their intelligence agencies, as well as some comparisons between them. We'll also look in brief at some of the minor powers scattered across the Inner Sphere and Periphery, as well as the remnants of the once mighty Star League and Amaris Empire. The following chapter will delve into the size and composition of their armies and navies. As mentioned, Minoru Kirita was the first to declare himself First Lord from his chrysanthemum throne on Luthien, so it makes sense to begin our overview with the Draconis Combine. The Coordinator of Worlds exercised an unparalleled level of control over their nation, leading a stratocracy of military leaders. Minor noble houses held considerably less sway in the Combine than in their neighbouring states. The Kiritan family claimed dominion over the third largest territory within the Inner Sphere, containing 404 planets, fewer than all but one of the rival Great Houses. The realm was divided into five military districts, each ruled by a warlord and internally subdivided into several prefectures. Of particular note was the warlord of the Galadin district, the coordinator's son Jinjiro. Kiritan appointed governors often ran the day-to-day -day operations of the five government districts, but could be overruled on the whims of their warlord superiors. In the Draconis Combine, the military reigned supreme over all else. During the course of the war, the Combine would restructure itself as the Dieron military district was formed out of the captured hegemony worlds and the Benjamin prefectures closest to Terra. Chancellor Barbara Liao followed the coordinator's pronouncement by declaring later that December that it was in fact she who was the new First Lord. House Liao already wielded near complete autocratic control over the lives of every citizen within the Capellan Confederation. However, they were kept in check by a small council known as the Prefectorate, and also maintained the facade of consulting the nobility through the House of Scions. The Confederation was notable for its very high density of colonised systems. The Liao family may have held the smallest territory of any great house, but they had fully exploited the systems within that area to claim control over 432 planets. The Capellan Confederation was made up of seven commonalities, each a former nation that had banded together to fight off the predations of their larger neighbours back in the 24th century. The Jade Palace on Siam gave that province overall supremacy, but the Capella, Sarna, St. Ives and Tikhonov commonalities were all historic members. The Andurian and Chesterton commonalities were disputed systems with their neighbours, and would become some of the most heavily contested worlds of the war. On New Year's Eve, Archon Jennifer Steiner called Curita's bluff and declared herself First Lord. It was more out of mockery than a personal conviction, as Jennifer had long since accepted that the Star League was no more. Unlike the other realms, House Steiner had not ruled from the outset, instead taking power in the early years of the Age of War after moving the capital of the Lyran Commonwealth to their homeworld of Tharkad, constructing the Triad as the centre for all branches of government. Since then, they had consolidated power within the family as much as possible, but the Estates General still held a moderate degree of influence. The Steiner Realm was the largest single territory within the Inner Sphere, containing 476 colonised planets. The Lyran Commonwealth had an antagonistic relationship with their spinward neighbour going back centuries. It was the threat of Kiritan expansion that had actually drove the Protectors of Donegal, Federation of Sky and Tamar Pact to unify. Each of the former states is subdivided into four provinces or shires, with the three capitals located within the district of Donegal, Isle of Sky and Tamar domains. The noble houses of Kelswa and Lestrade rule the Spinwood regions from Tamar and Sky. Viola Steiner Dinesen's Day of Rage during the Reunification War would always cast a shadow over relations between the families, but the long years of prosperity had repaired most of the damage. Captain General Kenyon Manick followed his neighbour's example by declaring himself First Lord in January 2787. The Free Worlds League was a loose conglomeration of independent worlds, several among which had unified into one of many provinces. Representatives met within the Parliament on Atreus to elect a council to handle matters of state. 
While the ministers themselves were often unelected nobles within their own systems, this still gave the League a notable democratic bent in comparison to its rivals. However, all this was thrown into jeopardy with the passing of Resolution 288. The position of Captain General was envisioned as only being used in times of great crisis to ensure the nation could defend itself. But now, as long as House Marek continued to claim that said crisis existed, they could rule as a virtual dictator. Territorially, Kenyan's realm was larger only than the Capellan Confederation, but they were sparsely populated by comparison, controlling just 338 planets. The three major powers within the Free Worlds League were the Grand Duchy of Orient, the Principality of Regulus, and the Marek Commonwealth, within which was the nation's capital. They were ruled by the noble houses Allison, Cameron Jones, and Marek. Additionally, the Stuart commonality of House Stuart and Duchy of Andurian of House Humphreys also held a reasonable amount of power. Furthermore, many smaller provinces existed, including the Abbey District, Duchies of Graham Marek, Kalidasa, and Orloff, Principality of Gibson, Regulum Free States, and Rim Commonality. Lastly, there was the Bolan Thumb, a pseudo-province jutting into the Lyran Commonwealth. The salient was not a formally recognised province, despite raising a brigade from its own populace. In practice, the region was run by the League Central Coordination and Command Group. Last to throw his hat into the ring was First Prince John Davian. The others had made it abundantly clear that they would not support him as First Lord, despite his position as Regent. Only Minoru Kirita could have corroborated his appointment, as he had received a missive from Richard Cameron on the matter, though for obvious reasons he chose not to speak up. Of all the rulers, the First Prince held the least amount of power within their respective realm, at least as long as Resolution 288 held. Their actions in many areas could be impeded or even countermanded by the High Council, an authority which the Davians had continually chipped away at over the centuries. The Federated Sons, territorially second only to the Lyran Commonwealth and counting the greatest number of colonised planets within its borders at 538, relied heavily on the system of feudalism to exercise control over such a large state. Barons holding small regions of land paid homage to the Counts that ruled the planets, who in turn swore fealty to the Dukes who controlled whole regions of space, all of whom served the Fresh Prince. The Federated Sons was not an alliance of smaller nations. It grew from the Cruces Pact signed on New Avalon during the 24th century, slowly absorbing independent worlds and microstates as it went. Following the Davian Civil War, the internal borders were redrawn and the realms divided into three marches, the Draconis and Capellan facing their respective neighbours, and the Cruces March at the centre. The marches were split into two or three operational areas, and then subdivided into combat regions. Control of the Draconis March had rested with House Sandoval and Robinson for over two centuries, while the powerful Hassock family of New Certis had de facto command of the Capellan border. The Terran hegemony may have survived the Amaris Empire in body, but not in spirit. The remains of the Cameron realm were in poor shape, now amounting to just 72 systems. President of the Terran Congress and de facto Director General was Jens Penera. At well over a hundred years old, he struggled to lead a nation in ruins, lacking even the most basic support to get things done. Their authority was further undermined by the growing influence of Comstar on Earth. The provincial capitals of Terra Firma and Tirfing had been seized by the Capellan Confederation and Free Worlds League, forcing the administrative centres to relocate to Brownsville and New Dallas. Lone Star Province was theoretically run from its namesake system, but the planet was still reeling from the fallout of the Star League Civil War. Several worlds had broken off to form their own protostate around Inglesmond. Lockdale Province, like the other three outer regions, had lost half its territory to its expansionist neighbours. Even the hegemony core was being nibbled at by the Lyran Commonwealth. The military-industrial complex within the Inner Sphere had been steadily ramping up for decades, and soon each nation would be funneling all available resources into wartime production. While certain regions were particularly known for being heavily industrialized, such as the Federation of Sky and Tikhonov commonality, 
The major arms factories were often situated away from these vulnerable border regions, deeper into secure territory. This was just as well, as they would soon become primary objectives for raids once the war commenced. Many of these key installations were located at national or regional capitals, which were themselves priority targets for capture or destruction. The Draconis Combine had most of its major factory wells located within the Pest military district, accounting for almost as many as the others combined. Chief among these was the planet sometimes known as Black Luthien, so named for the polluted grey sky that permanently hangs above the capital's massive industrial complexes. The Combine was notably lagging behind their rivals, producing approximately 20% less than the standard of the day. Liao's industrial might was relatively decentralised. The five older Capellan commonalities maintained a rough balance between themselves, while the fractured Endurian had less to offer and the Chesterton worlds virtually nothing. The Confederation's industrial capital was the planet Tikhonov, the sole planet to have resisted Amaris's early aggression during the Starleague Civil War. Within the Lyran Commonwealth, the expansive protectorate of Donegal produced more than half of Steiner's weapons despite most of the province being undeveloped in comparison to their Spinwood compatriots. The key industrial site was located on Hesperus II, the largest manufacturer of battle mechs in existence. Overall production for the realm was more than 30% greater than their nearest rivals, making them a serious threat in a protracted war. In a realm known for bickering and political infighting, House Maddock was wise to keep most of their weapons production within their own commonwealth. A few notable League independents also made significant contributions, equivalent to some of the much larger provinces. The largest factories were on Irian. This planet generated so much wealth that in the modern era it now exists as a one-world province of its own, still matching even the Grand Duchy of Orient single-handedly. Within the Federated Suns, House Hasek could produce nearly three times House Sandoval, but could only manage half of what came out of the much larger Cruises March. New Avalon housed the largest factories, matching Luthien in terms of weapons manufacturing. Overall production for the realm was equal to the Capellans and Freewelders. Lastly, the battered Terran hegemony had surviving weapons plants on only New Earth and Terra itself. Despite the three-year battle that had raged across its surface, enough factories had survived the carnage at the end of the Starleague Civil War to match the Davian and Curita capitals for most heavily industrialised planets in human space. Just as critical to the war effort as these ground factories were the rare few naval yards capable of constructing and servicing warships. Historically, the Terran hegemony had been the centre of warship production in the Inner Sphere. Many designs in service with the successor state navies originated in the hegemony, making its capture essential to maintaining their fleets. Even in its fractured state, it still operated 14 military-grade shipyards, more than any great house. Eight of the Draconis Combine's ten facilities were in the Pest military district. The Capellans had one fewer in total, again spread across their realm. Sky and Donegal were nearly matched, with a 10th Lyran shipyard in the Tamar Pact, and the Free Worlds League had 11, with a notable concentration within the small principality of Gibson. The Federated Sons had just nine, again based mostly in the Crucis Pact. However, a third of their theoretical outputs came from the Galax Megaplex, a massive new naval yard constructed by Boeing International after the fall of the Star League. Problematically, they refused to begin production until they received orders from head office on Terra. This left House Davian with only six operating facilities. Throughout the succession wars, the success or failure of a plan often rested on the abilities of a nation's intelligence agency. The most ruthless and pervasive is surely the internal security force of the Traconis Combine. They answered directly to the coordinator, meaning even the most powerful warlord had to fear the ISF agents doubtless hidden within their staff or household. A second group within the Combine was the Order of the Five Pillars. Officially tasked with simply maintaining the honour of House Curita, they operated their own network of spies all the same. Perhaps only one was more feared than the ISF, and that was the Mashkarovka of the Capellan State. They had a history of using terror tactics to achieve their goals. 
the Lyran Intelligence Corps employed some of the best minds within the Commonwealth. In contrast to their military, the LIC was extremely well run and effective. In a realm not known for fanaticism, the Intelligence Corps nevertheless employed some of the most die-hard loyalists. The newest intelligence agency belonged to the Free Worlds League. SAFE was founded after its predecessor, the National Intelligence Agency, was disbanded in the wake of a financial scandal. Their involvement in the Maddox Civil War had tarnished their name, and often they struggled to achieve the same results as their neighbours. The Federated Sons was without a civilian agency, instead relying solely on the Armed Forces Department of Military Intelligence. Unfortunately, internal factionalism and elitism on the part of the military meant that crucial information often wasn't shared with others who might have benefited from it. The periphery states would barely participate in the First Succession War. They wisely distanced themselves from the conflagration, but were not without difficulties of their own. Their hard-won independence had come with a slew of problems that the battered realms still struggling to rebuild after their Freedom War had trouble dealing with. Protector Nicoletta Calderon had achieved her life ambition in gaining independence for the Torian Concordat. Her family's holdings had grown to include 77 planets, stretched along the Federated Sun's rimward border. The realm was divided into the Brinton, Damasus, Hades and Perdition Unions, but the nation's heart remained within the fortified Flanagan's Nebula and the planet Taurus within. Most of the Torians' manufacturing, both weapons factories and their three warship facilities, took place in the Hades and Perdition Unions. Equivalent to less than 30% of the Inner Sphere average, they nonetheless managed to outperform what was left of the Terran hegemony. Magistrix Janina Centrella still sat on the throne of Canopus, ruler of some 65 planets. The Magistracy had managed to escape the worst of the carnage during the reunification war that brought them into the Star League, but winning their independence had cost the realm dearly. First hit had been the Canopus district, but the Ballard and Luxon provinces had seen fierce fighting in the second year. House Centrella had only two major manufacturing worlds, a Canopus and Dunianshire. This accounted for not even a quarter of the Torian output. Those planets also maintained naval yards in orbit. The 137 planets of the Outworlds Alliance were notionally helmed by President David Avalar from Alpharats, but the naturally isolationist citizens of the Outworlds only paid lip service to their supposed ruler. Alongside the capital province were the Balagora, Blomstein, Cerberus, Omferwacht and Remora provinces, as well as the Trader's Domain. Just as the others were, the Outworlds were suffering from the fallout of the Periphery Uprising. The nation could just about match the magistracy for arms production, but had just a single major shipyard, dangerously close to their two aggressive neighbours. The Rimworld's Republic had been one of the casualties of Alexander Kerensky's inexorable advance during the Star League Civil War. The older Manus government had been removed at gunpoint, and the fragile democracy that replaced it was swept aside during Operation Ulmerich by the Lyran Commonwealth who went on to seize most of the key industrial worlds for themselves. Without that foundation, the realm had collapsed. Within this lawless region, various pirate groups and petty kings staked their claim to the ruins. The Barony of Strang and Belt Pirates of Star's End were two such groups, based around systems containing rare periphery naval yards. The Black Warriors, the mercenaries that had played an instrumental part in the liberation of the Terran hegemony through their training efforts at Camp Amber, had been abandoned by the SLDF. When some Lyran refugees arrived in 2785, together they formed the Circinus Federation. Outwardly they put on the appearances of a periphery independent, but in truth they were bandits for hire. Largest and oldest of these pirate realms were the Tortuga Dominions a loose collection of outlaw groups situated on the far side of the Inner Sphere. Out of the ashes of the Republic rose two realms that promised some better hope of unifying and rebuilding the region. First came the Oberon Confederation in 2775, and then the Finnmark Free Republic four years later, the latter even capable of warship production. In a rimward direction were two more periphery microstates, 
the Illyrian Palatinate and Lothian League. In the deep periphery was one other minor compact known as the Yarnfolk. They had very few dealings with the Star League and are so remote they have not been heard from in the 250 years since its fall. This was the state of the Inner Sphere in 2787. The successor states girding for war couldn't have known it, but this was to be the apex of their civilization. Would any of the successor lords have reconsidered if they knew how little they stood to gain and how much their own realms were about to suffer? When Alexander Kerensky departed for uncharted space in November 2784, he did so with a force of well over 2 million soldiers. Yet even this was just a fraction of the total number of individuals who had fought in the Star League Civil War. If one includes the Periphery Uprising, a total of around 5,500 regiments had participated across both sides. While no individual successor state could come close to matching the mighty Star League Defense Force, Together, they would far surpass it. The First Succession War would see more than 7,500 regiments do battle. The successor state militaries were at their peak, each commanding between 12 and 1,700 regiments apiece. Never again would they reach the heights that they did in 2787. More than two centuries of war have steadily reduced those numbers. The high watermark for warships had passed along with the Star League Navy, only a thousand such vessels were left in the Inner Sphere, compared to the more than 3,000 Amaris and Kerensky had hurled at each other. From the moment the Star League Accords were ratified in 2571, the Great Houses were constrained on how much of their resources could be funneled into the military. Directive 30, passed in 2650, further reduced the size of the standing armies. Unfortunately, the good years were already coming to a close by that point, and with the commencement of several hidden wars and civil unrest, each member state of the Star League sought ways to circumvent the restrictions. When the Council Edict of 2650 was revoked a century later following the assassination of Simon Cameron, the size of the House militaries grew rapidly. In truth, most of that early expansion was nothing more than officially acknowledging the reality that each had vast numbers of demobilized troops that could be called upon to fight. Between 2750 and the beginning of the Periphery Uprising 15 years later, the member state militaries saw an increase in size of between 55 and 120 percent. Throughout the Star League Civil War, every nation had made vast profits selling their military hardware to the desperate SLDF. Naturally, growth tapered off during this period, but the realms could see the growing importance of maintaining fleets of warships. The next 15 years saw them double the size of their navies by returning to service their many mothballed ships as well as launching dozens of new vessels. With Amaris defeated, they pumped up production again for their own armies, but the looming threat of an irate Kerensky kept any from being as aggressive as they had during the years of Richard Cameron, but almost 200 more warships entered service in the five years that followed. Even before the exodus, the Great Houses had made efforts to court surviving SLDF and Imperial forces in the hopes that they would switch sides. It was one of the leading reasons why Kerensky ultimately decided to lead his army into the deep periphery, to keep it out of the reach of the grasping successor lords. Around 78% of the defense force followed him, but that still left dozens of regiments lingering within the ruins of the Star League. Most of those left behind either entered service with their planetary militia or swore loyalty to Jerome Blake and Comstar, something which Blake did his best to cover up but many others were swayed by one of the lucrative offers made by the successor states. Several turned mercenary and hired themselves out to the highest bidder. Some sat idle but ready, waiting to see if their comrades would return from deep space. While the passing of the Star League Defense Force marked the end of such large formations as divisions, corps and armies, the successor states continued to use the same SLDF structure, where a lance was four battle mechs, a company three lances, a battalion three companies, and a regiment three battalions. Regiments of shared lineage or loyalty belong to less defined brigades. 
At the onset of the First Succession War, these units were at optimum readiness levels, fully equipped with all the supplies and material they could wish for. It would be the last time this was ever the case. House Curita's military was the Draconis Combine Mustard Soldiery. Like all of the warring parties, the DCMS in 2787 was at its apex, unmatched in size before or since. 146 battle mech regiments were available to Minori Kurita and his warlords, supported by almost 1400 conventional regiments of infantry, armour, artillery and aerospace fighters. At the top step of the DCMS were the five Sword of Light regiments, named for one of the five pillars of Kuritan society, those being ivory, steel, jade, gold and teak. They were the personal command of the coordinator and tasked only with the most crucial objectives. Unsurprisingly, they were the best equipped forces in the Combine, each regiment fielding four battalions of crack mech warriors, plus two wings of aerospace support. Beneath them were the military district units, representing Benjamin, Dieron, Galadin, Pesht and Rosalhaig. The Galadin regulars were the best equipped of these, chiefly because of Jinjiro Kirita, but also because the ancestral home of House Kirita at New Samarkand was within their borders. Smaller units included the Arkab Legion, founded and operated by the semi-autonomous Azami people, and the Proserpina Hazars, a well-trained and respected free-floating unit deployed across the realm as needed. The Sunzang Academy was the Combine's premier military school, supplying the mustard soldiery with a dozen regiments of its own graduates, green but fanatically loyal. DCMS organisational doctrine at the time grouped each mech regiment into brigades alongside varying amounts of conventional forces, with the exception of the Sword of Light and Sunzang Academy Kada. Barbara Liao intended to use the Capellan Confederation Armed Forces to press her claim to the First Lordship. The CCAF, as had been the case throughout their history, was the smallest of the five successor state militaries, operating 118 battle mech regiments and another 1,100 conventional units. Of particular note was the Confederation's doctrinal reliance on artillery, averaging around twice as many battalions compared to the other successor states. The Chancellor is the highest authority within the armed forces, advised by the Strategios. The CCAF is less homogeneous in its structure, with several of the brigades broken into smaller subcommands or grouping dissimilar regiments. The Capellan Hazars were the best the state could field, but the individual units had a diverse range of backgrounds, many dating back to the old proto-states. Cyan's Red Lancers are the Chancellor's personal bodyguard, while Capella's Prefectorate Guard do the same for the ruling prefects. The Ares Titans are Capella's other elite unit, the Chesterton Guardians belong to their namesake commonality, Griff's Hazars, St. Ives, and Blanford's Grenadiers, Tikhonov. Two of the Confederation's linchpin worlds also warrant a permanent garrison in the form of the Marshals of Tikhonov and Andurian Heavy Guard. To review the standardised brigades next, the Andurian Hussars, Capellan Chargers, Cyan Dragoons and Tikhonov Lancers were maintained by their respective commonalities. The former Sana Supremacy had a rebellious history, their old ignominious Sana Sabres since replaced by the Liao Lancers. The Liao Guards were the personal brigade of the ruling family, while the Confederation Reserve Cavalry acted as the last line of defence. The Chesterton Regulars were as fractured as their home province, the Chesterton Cavalry and Cuirassiers are the only survivors of the old Chesterton Trading League army. The Ariana Fusiliers are another unit dating to before the Age of War, while the Ariana Grenadiers are a more recent addition. Shadrachs, Shadowhawks and Tristam's Avengers complete the regulars. The St. Ives Armoured Cavalry is even more decentralised. The St. Ives Lancers are the lead unit, while the Chevaux Leger operate further across the Confederation. The Capellan Quirassiers are one of the commonality's elite regiments, but are recruited from across the realm. The Centauri Guards are an amalgamation of several older noble house units, while the Teng Hazars represent another, but have remained a separate entity. The Redfield Renegades and Sharp Rifles have been raised by the respective homeworlds to bolster their defence. The Lyran Commonwealth Armed Forces going into 2787 were the largest successor state military there has ever been. While the 120 battle mech regiments they fielded had them at a slight deficit compared to the DCMS, 
The number of armoured and infantry units in their ranks were vast, amounting to more than 1,550 additional regiments, totalling just under 1,700. Unlike the other realms where the successor lords had complete authority over the military, for the Lyrans, General of the Army's Paul Steiner, the Archon's younger brother, was in command. When the war commenced, he took personal control over the Cluritan Theatre and delegated the League border to General Amanda Lestrade. The four Royal Guard regiments were the best equipped and most loyal troops in the Commonwealth. Most of the LCAF belonged to one of five large brigades, the most massive of which was the Lyran Guards, maintaining 35 regiments split across five divisions. Despite their organisation, this grouping was purely for administrative reasons, as these units had no experience fighting at anything greater than regimental level. Other similarly large brigades included the Arcturan Guards, Donegal Guards and Sky Rangers. The former officially remains a federal unit, founded to celebrate the union of the three nations and being the first to draw on soldiers from across the realm. But over the years, it has become increasingly linked with the Tamar Pact. The size of the LCAF brigades makes it challenging to say which were best, with individual regiments varying massively in both experience and loyalty. The Lyran regulars were another large unit, notably less prestigious than their guards counterpart, but often performing better on the field. Several smaller brigades were founded by wealthy planets and nobility, recruiting heavily from those systems. These include the Donegal, Odessa, Sacklin and York regulars, the Hesperus Guards and the Tamar Hussars. While the Free Worlds League military was not the powerhouse that it had been at the formation of the Star League, it was still sufficiently strong to see off their neighbours. In total, they had 117 battle mech regiments, plus another 1400 assorted conventional ones. An ever-present hurdle for the Marinx when bringing their might to bear was to secure the support of the provincial forces. As shown during the Third Hidden War, if any duchy or principality withheld their troops, it could spell disaster for the Captain General. Of the federal forces, the Free World's Guards and Atrian Dragoons were the best supplied and most fanatical in their loyalty. The former had all been reinforced with a 4th Battalion. The largest brigade within the FWLM, and indeed the entire Inner Sphere, was the Marek Militia, numbering 40 regiments until the loss of the 34th during the Phony War. They varied significantly in experience, and were most often tasked with providing protection to the many independent worlds, or ensuring the supremacy of the Captain General over the smaller provinces by maintaining a garrison within their borders. Occupying a middle ground between the Federal and Provincial forces were the Boland defenders. At the top of the Provincial forces were the Fusiliers of Orient and their vassal states Orloff Grenadiers. The incredible wealth available to the Grand Duchy meant these two were better equipped than even the best federal units. The former were organised into four combined arms brigades along old Star League lines, plus a fifth Ducal Guard regiment. House Allison heaped all its love and attention on the Fusiliers, leaving the Orient Hazars to pick up the scraps. Their counterparts in the other two major provinces were the Marek Guard and Regulan Hazars. The Stuart Dragoons continued to operate as a de facto federal brigade, Earl David Stuart ceding control to the Captain General during the Third Hidden War. The primary offensive force of this small province was the Juggernaut Regiment, the defence left to the Home Guard. Other planets within the commonality raised their own units, the Helm Quirrasiers and Tania Dragoons. The defenders of Andurium were responsible for protecting what was left of the fractured Andurian duchy from Capellan aggression. Lastly, the Iron Guards were formed from the former hegemony worlds that had willingly sided with the Free Worlds League. The Armed Forces of the Federated Sons was one of the smaller militaries overall, but had a higher percentage of battle mechs, 132 mech regiments to more than 1,250 conventional. The AWFS had a well-organised structure on the surface, but suffered from factionalism and a provincial attitude that would cost them dearly during the war. Each march fielded an offensive brigade and a defensive march militia. A dozen smaller brigades assisted them where needed, at least in theory. Perhaps the most elite and loyal unit in existence, the Davian Brigade of Guards was the very best the ruling house could call upon. They trained extensively in combined arms operations, allowing them to make full use of their permanently assigned infantry, armour and aerospace assets. 
One step down, but still more than a match for most opponents on the field, were the Avalon Hazars. While they hailed from the Crucis March, it seemed extraordinarily unlikely that any aggressor would ever penetrate that far, and so in practice were scattered all across the realm. The entire brigade had been reinforced during the build-up, each regiment fielding four battalions apiece. The Robinson Chevaliers and Certes Fusiliers were each named for their respective march capitals, with at least 20 regiments each positioned along their border. Additionally, each march capital also raised a force purely from that one planet's population, known as the Robinson Rangers, Certes Hazars, and New Avalon Borderers. Two other welds that did the same formed the Argyle Lancers and Clovis Guards. The Arcadian Quirrasiers were raised from the Chesterton Welds that fell on the Davian side of the border. The Seti Hazars were a combined arms brigade modelled on Star League Light Horse regiments. The Dragon Lords came into existence during the Reunification War as a quick response force to combat any Taurian incursions. The Tank Ready Loyalists were built around the units who had abandoned Lord of Davian during the nation's civil war and sided with the future Fresh Prince. Many of the former Star League Defence Force personnel that had decided to remain in the Inner Sphere signed on with one of the successor states, but the AWFS alone organised most of its SLDF recruits into their own units, the first among which would use their expertise to train new regiments in Star League doctrine. The Crucis Lancers was an old disbanded brigade brought back into service after the Exodus, and has since become one of their most celebrated. Two regiments were still in training at the war's outset, but would enter service within the year. The Deneb Light Cavalry were the remains of a joint Star League Fed Sons venture known as the Rapid Deployment Mixed Armed Forces. Their regiments were primarily raised from the Davian member state, and those who didn't depart on the Exodus soon went over. The final element of the armed forces were the Capellan, Crucis, and Draconis March Militias. Devised by John Davian as a way to turn the best of his planetary garrisons into a more mobile force, these large combined arms units added considerable strength to the AWFS on paper, but it meant that each combat region had most of its strength focused in just a handful of systems. Most planets no longer fielded their own militias, leaving them vulnerable to a sudden incursion. In terms of sheer numbers, the five successor states were relatively even. Each had a realistic shot at coming out on top. Quantity is just one half of the equation, however. Looking at the quality of those troops allows us to note some important facts. The AWFS, DCMS and LCAF had the highest percentage of veterans and elites, whereas their counterparts in the CCAF and FWLM were slightly lacking. Less than a quarter of the Fed Sons and Lyran forces were green recruits, whereas around a third of the other realm's militaries were down on experience. On the surface then, House Davian and Steiner were looking strong, but there is another side to the coin. As previously noted, the Federated Sons forces were individually loyal to the First Prince, but struggled to cooperate with their immediate neighbours. The Lyrans had the fewest number of fanatics within their military. This in itself was not a problem, but both they and the Capellans had significant numbers of troops with questionable loyalties, around a third of their respective armed forces, compared to a quarter of the Draconis Combine and Free Worlds League, and just 15% of the AWFS. This had the potential to be disastrous if their soldiers started questioning the competency of their leaders, or if one of the regional blocs decided to break away. Fleet actions would play an integral part in the First Succession War. The monstrously powerful naval-grade weapons could obliterate entire regiments in mere minutes, but any orbital strike would rely first on securing the system, or at least the local space in orbit above a world. The enormous Star League Navy had passed into legend. Of the more than 2,000 warships that cleared a path through the hegemony, just 12 had remained behind. These were hidden by Comstar within the Terran system, their presence kept secret from the successor states. Many Age of War era Terran hegemony designs were in widespread use with the successor state navies. These include the Vincent class Corvette, Essex and Lola class destroyers, and Aegis class cruiser, as well as a few less common designs. A few Star League era designs were also dotted about, including later refits of those classes just mentioned, and a few dozen Cadet class transports, but also a rare few heavy cruisers. 
The Draconis Combine Admiralty began the conflict with eight fleets, two from each of the established military districts. This accounted for a total of 197 warships, plus a pair of corvettes permanently attached to the first Proserpina Hussars. The DCA crews were particularly skilled compared to their contemporaries, having conducted regular training exercises for the Star League Navy. As well as the older Terran-derived designs, the Combine fielded two of its own. The Narukami-class destroyer is on par with the best the Star League had to offer. A swift ship with a heavy weapons complement for its size, Narukamis can be found in every fleet. The Samarkand-class light carrier was primarily a support vessel, transporting three dozen aerospace fighters each. They were a powerful force multiplier, but performed poorly without support due to a lack of firepower and armour. The Capellan Confederation Navy, like their ground-based counterpart, was the smallest of the five successor states at just 157 warships. A significant percentage of those were also older designs, whether Terran or homegrown. Each of the five major commonalities maintains a fleet of their own, while a reserve fleet packs the heaviest punch, moving to whichever front is most in need of the additional firepower. Two designs of note have come out of the Capellan Confederation. The newest is the enormous Soil-class heavy cruiser, weighing in at 1.5 million tonnes. This vessel is built around a single party piece, the capital-grade mass driver. It is a challenging weapon to use, as it requires the entire ship to be aimed directly at their target, but if it lands a hit, the mass driver has the potential to obliterate another warship in a single blast. Before the conflict erupted, the Free Worlds League had purchased several soils from their rivals at exorbitant prices. The older design is the Dushi Wang class battlecruiser. This vessel actually originates within the long defunct Duchy of Liao, and was the very first constructed by the new confederation. Its all energy weapon loadout allows it to operate for extended periods without resupply. The largest fleet remaining within the Inner Sphere belonged to the Lyran Commonwealth, which possessed 217 warships. Each of the three states within the Commonwealth fields a pair of fleets and another squadron in orbit above their capital. The Lyrans employ a trio of distinctive designs throughout their navy. The newest and most numerous is the Mako-class corvette. One of the best ships in its class, matching any produced by the Star League, the Mako has both the speed of a corvette and the weapons and armour to match even a small destroyer. The Commonwealth-class light cruiser is an older design put back into production with new upgraded components. It has become a staple of the realm's naval defence. The largest ship employed by House Steiner is the Tharkad class. Despite being four and a half times the size, it can match the speed of the Mako, but carries a far larger weapons load. The Free Worlds League as a whole maintains a federal navy, but so too do three of the provinces, Andurian, Orient and Regulus. Altogether, they can field 159 warships. The FWLN is split into five fleets, the first through fifth based at Judone, Orient, Kanata, Tamarind and Gibraltar. The skills of the crews across the various federal and provincial forces are fairly standard, but the Andurian Squadron is notably reluctant to cooperate with the Captain General, much like their compatriots within the Defenders of Andurian. Two vessels define the Free World's Navy. The first is the League-class destroyer. The design originated way back in the 24th century, but all of these older vessels have since been decommissioned or destroyed, the last during the Third Hidden War. An updated League-class entered service much more recently, with several key improvements. Twice its size, weighing in at 1.1 million tonnes, is the Atreus-class battleship. When the class entered service shortly before the Reunification War, it outperformed anything fielded by the Terran Hegemony or nascent Star League. Centuries of development have made it lose some of its luster, but it's still an effective and deadly opponent. Last of all is the Federated Suns Navy, which operated 184 warships in 2787. These are divided into four fleets, the Corwood Fleet facing the Capellan Confederation, the Spinwood Fleet towards the Draconis Combine, the Rimwood Fleet dealing with the Torian Concordat and rest of the periphery border, and the Crucis Fleet acting as a mobile reserve. House Davian has four ship classes unique to its navy. The Robinson-class transport and Usurtis-class carrier 
were two vessels born in the turbulent times following the Davian Civil War. First Prince Alexander hoped these new classes would help bind the remnants of the old Federated Peacekeeping Forces from the fractured marches together, and give them regional pride within the then new AWFS. The Davian class destroyer went through two iterations. While the first was somewhat of a disappointment considering the name it bore, the evolution showed considerably more promise. The largest vessel in their navy was the ancient but still capable Defender-class battlecruiser. Among its number was the flagship of the entire navy, the FSS Golden Lion. Besides the successor states, a few other minor powers also participated in the First Succession War. The hegemony armed forces, such as they were, consisted of those SLDF units who had not followed Kerensky on his exodus. In total, 17 divisions and a further 16 independent regiments had stayed behind. Theoretically, this amounted to 85 battle mech and 84 infantry regiments, but all of those had suffered heavy losses during the Stalag Civil War, and so their actual strength was a mere fraction of that. The vast majority were located within the Hegemony Corps, but further afield were other remnants of the Star League, still camped at their final duty stations. The most notable of these was the Eredani Light Horse on Trondheim, who would hold vigil on the world as they waited to see if Kerensky would return. The former territorial states were cautious about becoming dragged into the looming succession war and remained on the defensive for the rest of the 28th century. The Taurian Defence Force, while remaining officially neutral in the so-called Freedom War, had nonetheless suffered significant losses during the uprising. The TDF in 2787 fielded just 7 mech regiments and 63 conventional. 1st, 2nd and 4th Corps had been completely wiped out participating in the Freedom War, and only the Pleiades Hussars had survived from the 3rd. Three new regiments had been raised which went some way to replacing those losses the Concordat Quirrises, Concordat Jaegers, and the Red Chasseurs. The Taurian Guard Corps, consisting of the Concordat Commandos, Taurian Guards, and Taurian Velites, had remained within the Hades Cluster and so had not been touched by the conflict. The Concordat Navy was the only periphery fleet to have surviving warships, TTS Padden and Vandenberg, both hidden deep inside Flanagan's Nebula. The Magistracy Armed Forces mirrored their counterparts on the TDF, 7 battle mech and 63 conventional regiments. Freedom War losses had cost the Magistracy Royal Guard the 2nd Canopian Quidditches, the Chasseurs à Cheval had lost the 3rd Canopian Light Horse, and the Canopian Fusiliers were down their 4th regiment. The People's Volunteers Brigade had been devastated, none had survived to see independence. Reventer's Iron Hand was the only new unit formed in the intervening years. The Alliance Military Corps was now a scant three battle mech regiments, plus another 25 of infantry, armour and artillery. Notably, AMC Doctrine called for a greater reliance on aerospace fighters, mostly because mechs were symbolically tied to the atrocities committed by Amos Forlo during the Reunification War, and the Alliance maintained around 10 regiments worth. All of the Alliance Military Corps had been involved in the Freedom War to some degree, the survivors organised into completely new units. The Alphanats Guards protected the capital and ruling Avalar family, the Alliance Grenadiers were stationed on the key industrial world of Lushan, and the Balagorda Defenders were formed out of what remained of the old Fusiliers Brigade. The only other periphery nation to have anything more than planetary militia was the new Finnmark Free Republic. Based around a one-time provincial capital of the Rimworld's Republic, they were able to field a standing army of two mech regiments and a dozen more conventional ones. The other microstates had never acquired a military of their own, but the increase in piracy, particularly from the neighbouring Circinus Federation, meant that small mercenary groups could find regular employment with them. The Star League Civil War had shown that mercenaries would be an essential part of any future conflict. Whereas before the successor states had been content for local governments or nobility to hire small bands as needed, now they sought out the ever-increasing number of regiments forming from both the SLDF remnants and the soldiers of the Amaris Empire as they were released from POW camps. An exhaustive list of every one of them would take too long, but a few of the larger groups are worth mentioning. The Northwind Highlanders had first entered into a long-term contract with the Capellan Confederation in 2365, 
and had at least one of their six regiments serving alongside the CCAF for over 400 years. They were the largest Merc units to have survived the fall of the Star League. The Stalingrad division had remained in the Inner Sphere, accepting a contract with the Federated Sons. The surviving five regiments formed the Screaming Eagles. The Elysian Lancers had at one time been the largest of all mercenary groups, but the Civil War had seen five of their regiments disbanded. Now they served the Lyran Commonwealth. The Always Faithful were a brand new unit in service to the Confederation, with an unusual story. The three regiments were formed from veterans of the Star League Civil War, but notably consisted of soldiers from both sides of the conflict. The Blue Star Regulars were another of similar background. Two of the three regiments were led by recipients of Kerensky's Blue Star Medal, while the other one once fought for Amaris. Now they fought for Davian. The Lexington Combat Group were once three SLDF independent regiments stationed within either the Outworlds Alliance or Magistracy of Canopus, miraculously surviving both the Uprising and Terran Campaign. They also signed on with the Federated Sons. The Gravewalkers were an ancient mercenary unit consisting of two regiments. Their history goes further back than any other, their origins lost to time. They had found a home for themselves in the Magistracy of Canopus, though they were not yet employed by House Centrella. The Twelve Star Guard were another demi-brigade of former SLDF regiments in service to Liao. Of the five successor states, the Federated Sons was the largest employer, positioning its 13 regiments and pair of battalions along the Capellan border. The Confederation had most of their 13 regiments deployed to face them. The Draconis Combine and Lyran Commonwealth had seven regiments each, plus another battalion-sized unit, all of which they deployed to just one of their borders. The Free Wells League was sorely lacking, having hired only Gladstone's gladiators. A handful of other mercenaries were scattered around the periphery, though none had yet found employment with those nations. The First Succession War would see a new type of brutality unleashed on the Inner Sphere. Throughout the Age of War, conflicts were governed by the Ares Conventions. Though not without their problems, they did help to reduce civilian casualties. When they were rescinded at the onset of the Reunification War, it became acceptable to slaughter tens of thousands as long as the military objective was accomplished. The Star League Civil War had seen the Amaris Empire use entire cities as human shields, or deliberate destruction of whole populations to create humanitarian disasters that would slow Kerensky's advance. Very quickly, the military leaders of the successor states determined that in the First Succession War, the extermination of cities would become the objective itself. The death toll would soon reach apocalyptic levels. The stage was set, troops were in place, intentions declared. Now everyone waited to see who would make the first move. At the dawn of 2787, the Doomsday Clock was at one minute to midnight. The successor states had declared war on each other. All travel and interstate commerce had ground to a halt. The people of the Inner Sphere were frozen in terror, waiting to see where the first strike would land. As yet, no one had made a move, but behind the scenes, each nation was scrambling to be the first to launch a knockout blow before they themselves were attacked. While the last of the successor lords were claiming rulership of the Star League, Jerome Blake arrived on Tharkad to meet with the Archon. He explained to her his desire to see Comstar recognized as a neutral party. In return, he would continue to operate the HPG network within the Commonwealth, allowing them to pass messages between themselves and to neighboring states. Seizing the facilities was always an option available to Jennifer Steiner. She, like each of her rivals, had in her navy a small number of individuals who were qualified to operate the exceedingly rare mobile HPGs, a technology that had now all but vanished along with the rest of the SLDF. 
but it would take time to train a whole new workforce to take over the hyperpulse generators, time which she could scarcely afford to lose at this crucial hour. Having experienced firsthand the disruption caused by the sudden loss of communications following the Amaris coup, Jennifer was amenable to Blake's suggestion, but was wary that she would be at a disadvantage if the other state lords refused. Blake happily informed her that she was the last to sign the agreement, after which Steiner gladly consented. Jerome Blake was lying, however. The Archon was the first he had met with. He was banking on the growing hostility preventing the states from conferring with each other on his activities. Each successor lord believed that they would soon be ruler over all, so the activities of the lowly Minister of Communications were of little interest to them. By the time he returned to Terra early the next year, Blake had managed to get all five to sign the Communications Protocol of 2787, formally recognising HPGs as sovereign territory, acknowledging their neutrality, and agreeing to make all further payments to Comstar using their own sea bills. The Draconis Combine was still slowly chipping away at the Terran hegemony, taking the planet's Denebal Jedi and Styx in the first weeks of January, cutting off the belligerent Inglesmond from its allies. They quickly seized the worlds of Nerasaki and Quinton soon after. Later in the year, they struck at the LTV aerospace facility orbiting Inglesmond's moon destroying the few warships the fledgling alliance had. The coordinator's main focus was elsewhere, however, as they continued to amass forces on their border, ready to strike at their more powerful neighbour. With the Combine seemingly focused elsewhere in the Terran hegemony and Lyran Commonwealth, the AFFS continued its preparations for a strike at the Chesterton Commonality. Over 50 regiments had been transferred to staging posts along the border, their initial list of targets including key Capellan industrial worlds. To ensure that Curita didn't launch any opportunistic land grabs once the campaign was underway, Davian ordered a strike of his own against the planet David. The raid was a great success for the AFFS. The Curitan commander only seemed able to mobilise half of the garrison, allowing the raiders time to seize significant quantities of munitions and spare parts before withdrawing. Going completely unnoticed were the five other regiments on world. The Free World League's intelligence agency, SAFE, was reporting to the Captain General that Curita was days away from launching a major invasion of the Lyran Commonwealth. Furthermore, the Archon seemed to have serious concerns about a new secret army emerging from the former Rimworld's Republic, leaving the nation besieged on all sides. With the LCAF ordered into defensive positions, Maddock felt comfortable turning his attention towards softer targets on their spinward flank. In late February, a quarter of the massive Maric Militia Brigade was moved to the border of the Sarna Commonality, as well as almost 40 conventional regiments and the FWLN 2nd Fleet. Their invasion would take aim at the Commonality capital, right in the heart of the Confederation. It would begin with a simultaneous assault on Harsfeld, Rahman, Second Chance, and Vanra. The first two were secured quickly, facing only minimal resistance from the planetary militia. The Rahman Lancers were not on well to defend their home planet, instead garrisoned on the neighbouring Second Chance, where they came face to face with a trio of FWLM regiments. The first shots were fired in the distant reaches of the system, as two patrolling vessels of the Sarna Commonality fleet moved to engage the escorting trio of Freewell's warships. First kill went to the CCS Solstice, her enormous mass driver gutting one of the lead destroyers in a single shot. The surviving Marek vessels had the advantage after they closed range and quickly overcame the defenders, destroying the larger Capellan battleship using nuclear missiles. Solstice attempted to retaliate with its own arsenal, but only destroyed a handful of dropships before exploding herself. The Confederation had now also learned that weapons of mass destruction were fair game in this new succession war. As the FWLS Saranda entered orbit, they saw heavy activity at the spaceports below. It wasn't clear if the vessels about to depart were military, but the threat that dropships and aerospace fighters carrying nuclear ordnance posed was too great a risk to wait to find out. They promptly unleashed devastating orbital fire on the facilities, obliterating the fleeing civilian government within. With their loss, and the realisation that the planetary governors were prepared to abandon them, the Raman Lancers began to fall apart. 
they begrudgingly accepted General Rosenkopf's call to surrender an hour later. The defenders on Vanna, despite being outnumbered 3 to 1, had the home field advantage as they had been stationed on world for almost 25 years. Their aerospace fighters were able to intercept and shoot down one of the approaching overlords which crashed into the deep wilderness, forcing the rest of the regiment to redeploy to assist their comrades. The Capellans got there first however, killing the few survivors and then ambushing the relief force. Only one battalion made it out of the forest. The battle for the capital city proved a costly affair. The charges would not give an inch and eventually the invaders used orbital fire to level their positions. Half of Utrecht was destroyed in the bombardment, as were the remaining CCAF. Opposition on second chance had been lighter than expected, as the Capellans had only just reassigned one of the regiments in garrison to seize the Terran hegemony system of Hall. To prevent Liao reinforcements from being dispatched to help the occupied systems, a raiding force was sent to Aldebaran, deep within the Tikhonov commonality. Nearby units hunkered down, anticipating other attacks. Kenyon Manik was an ambitious man and sound military strategist. He was never wasteful or reckless with his forces, earning the respect of his commanders. In due course, this talent would earn him the nickname The Eagle. Despite his main focus being the campaign against the Capellan Confederation, he never took his eye off his other neighbour. The League Central Coordination and Command Group saw a target of opportunity on their doorstep. The Bolson shipyards within the new Kyoto system were a major resupply and refit centre for the Lyran Navy. Destroying these facilities early would pay dividends in any future escalation between the two. On February 14th, they dispatched a trio of destroyer squadrons to the system, supported by two aerospace wings. Defending the facility was a squadron of corvettes, including two of the survivors from the Bolan campaign and an aerospace regiment of their own. The battle was fast and frenetic, the lighter Lyran warships were quickly overwhelmed, with almost a dozen destroyed in just 15 minutes. The engagement ended prematurely though, when Colonel Thompson piloted their damaged aerospace fighter into the Matic flagship's bridge, sending it on a collision trajectory of its own with the shipyards, after which both sides withdrew to lick their wounds. A second larger naval engagement followed just 10 days later on the Lyran's opposite border. The raid on Scondia the previous year had shown the LCAF to be incapable of stopping a determined assault. The Draconis Combine Admiralty formed a new 45 warship fleet, pairing them with six battle mech regiments and several more supporting units, tasked with the objective of pushing all the way to the provincial capital of Skye. The first step would be a return to Scondia, where this time they would conquer the world for the dragon. In the months leading up to the attack, the solitary mech regiment in garrison had been reinforced by two others, plus five warships and 20 escort dropships. While this meant it was one of the better defended worlds in the Commonwealth, it could not hope to match the approaching task force. Upon arrival at the system's nadir jump point, Pedersen quickly realised that things had gone horribly wrong. Since the attack on New Kyoto, the Lyran Navy had been pooling their warships in the region into a single fleet based out of Scondia now numbering some 50 Lyran warships and another 200 smaller vessels. Most of the fleet was in orbit over the planet itself, which gave the Taisho the opportunity to withdraw. Instead, he commanded all the ships under his command to form up into a cone and dove straight into the heart of the defences, punching a hole for the transports to reach Scondia. Van Hatten's warships were primarily anti-capital vessels, which meant despite their best efforts, they were only able to destroy around 20% of the smaller dropships before they entered orbit. Focusing on the transports also allowed the many carriers in the DCA fleet to launch their aerospace fighters, which inflicted huge losses on the Lyrans. By the end of March, two-thirds of the Commonwealth fleet had been destroyed, including the Admiral's flagship. The Curitans had lost half of their force by comparison. The ground campaign now swung even more in the Combine's favour as they were able to call down orbital fire on exposed Lyran positions. Nevertheless, they held out for two months before calling in the remaining naval support for extraction. 
Back in the Free World League, the Eagle was driving his force onwards. Hassad, Shea Pao and Singhai were taken from the Capellans by his advancing Marek militia, but the primary target lay within another region of space. New Dallas was one of the strongest planets left to the Terran hegemony, and had become a provincial capital after the loss of Tyrfing. The planetary militia had fought Amaris tooth and nail, and were expected to be equally belligerent towards any successor state that approached. Three FWLM regiments entered the system on March 20th, and ran face first into the reformed New Dallas Rangers, equipped with Royal Tier battle mechs piloted by veterans of the Star League Civil War. The Marek militia was completely wiped out, and the Atrian Dragoons were on the back foot until they resorted to using their nuclear arsenal. 300,000 within Caddo City were vaporised in order to eliminate the pair of militia battalions in defence, after which the survivors surrendered. New Dallas was in Marek hands, its worth now all but useless. Within a month of the Draconis Combine making landfall on Scondia, Jennifer Steiner ordered a series of reprisal raids. She did not want to commit her military to an offensive against the Dragon, but she hoped that keeping the Coordinator off balance would reduce the number of attacks coming her way. There was no better way to achieve this than a strike on the capital itself. This dangerous assignment was given to Duke Graham Kalswa and his Tamar Tigers. Their transport for the mission was one of the few remaining Potemkin-class troop cruisers, with a full complement of 25 dropships. They expected an enormous naval presence, but they found only two smaller warships. The location of the DCA fleet was a mystery, but they had no time to consider it. Taking full advantage of their weakness, the Nightwind made a beeline for the colossal shipyards, the largest within the Combine and destroyed the facility while the Tigers made their descent. The defending mech regiments huddled around Imperial City, allowing the attackers to ride roughshod over the Aichi continent. Several major factories were destroyed before the Duke withdrew three days later. Minoru Hirita had been humiliated by how powerless he was to respond. The famous Black Pearl at the heart of the Draconis Combine had been desecrated. Worse was to follow at Dieron in April. The DCA had a warship squadron in orbit over the world, part of their ongoing invasion of the Terran hegemony. They were tasked with the defence of the Stellar Trek naval yard, the main objective for the Lyran raid. A half dozen Steiner warships appeared in system, unleashing two squadrons of nuclear-armed assault dropships to clear a path for them. The aging Aegis-class Selene was blown apart by their missiles, forcing the Essex destroyers to break off giving the Tharkad and Commonwealth-class cruisers a clear shot at the shipyard. Radstad was undergoing service, and decoupled from the facility with most of her guns still offline and barely any crew aboard. She attempted to ram the largest battlecruiser, but was destroyed before making contact. Gallery and York now launched their nuclear payload at the facility, destroying another of the Draconis Combine's vital space docks. The four DCA destroyers regrouped, almost succeeding in destroying the Lyran flagship before they themselves were eliminated. Meanwhile, the raiding party was making landfall. They had their own objectives on the ground. This was the first outing for Colonel Raymond Hempstead's stealths. The Lyran Commonwealth had tremendous faith in his abilities, putting the mercenary commander in charge of the entire operation. The reason he had such a solid reputation was because his unit had acquitted themselves well during the Star League Civil War, fighting for Amaris as the 23rd Republican Light Lancers. After four hours on the ground, it became clear that something had gone wrong in space. They had not received a single message from the four surviving cruisers. Ground operations were quickly wrapped up and the dropships departed. A brief search of their last known location turned up only wreckage fragments forcing the raiders to withdraw to their jump ships. The fate of the warships remains a mystery, the answer perhaps lying somewhere in the debris field known as the Junkyard, the detritus left from the space battle during Operation Chieftain. It's possible that the Lyran ships fell victim to something lurking in the radioactive debris. In the neighbouring system, the Curitans were again picking at the remains of the Terran hegemony. When they arrived at Saffel, however, they found it was defended by elements of the Blue Star Irregulars. 
the former soldiers of the Amaris Empire Armed Forces knew the location of a hidden AEAF cache and had raced ahead to secure it for the Federated Sons. Rather than engage them, the Tysar purposely diluted his strength by spreading them across the planet, then withdrew shortly after. This was exactly as Warlord Jinjiro Kirita had ordered. Saffol was just one of a dozen minor skirmishes the AWFS had won against the Draconis Combine during 2787. Another came at Kaf, where a force sent to flank the Confederation and establish a link to Terra defeated a small force of CCAF and DCMS opponents, evening the score for the debacle on town. Several other hegemony systems were taken to broaden their control of that vital link. Fedson's military intelligence was receiving reports from one of their marshals that something big was going on just across the border, but the head of MI2 for the region had dismissed his concerns. John Davian was busy marshalling his forces for a strike at the Chesterton commonality and was not hearing anything that might worry him from the Draconis March. On May 1st, 2787, Jinjiro Kirita began the largest offensive campaign of the Succession Wars. Fifteen mech regiments and a further 55 conventional units stationed around Tanel moved simultaneously against the seven systems within the Kusser pocket. They struck so quickly that most worlds failed to alert the rest of the Federated Sons that they were under attack. The best AWFS units within the region had already been redeployed ahead of the planned Capellan Offensive leaving only second-line regiments in garrison. The mercenaries on Marduk fled at their approach, while others stood and fought, not realizing that they were at the epicenter of a Kuritan tsunami. The attack on the Paris Bulge was just the first of three DCMS task forces set to advance into Davian territory. Jinjiro had amassed over 50 battle mech regiments along the border, representing more than a third of the entire Draconis Combine mustered soldiery. Supporting them were 150 regiments of conventional forces. On May 4th, Jinjiro led a second attack into the Dahar combat region, spearheaded by the First Sword of Light. At the same time, a third wave crashed into the Clovis combat region. On point was the Third Sword of Light, and with them was none other than the coordinator Minoru Kirita himself. Their main goal was the regional headquarters on Clovis. The Fed Sun's navy had only a trio of warships on hand to defend the system, while the Draconis Combine Admiralty assigned a squadron from their third fleet to clear a path for Minoru. Things concluded in space predictably, but it gave the three Davian armor regiments and the planet's own Clovis guards some vital time to reinforce their position. They were outnumbered five to one, but were nonetheless able to hold their ground during the first week. ISF agents had reported an additional two mech regiments somewhat on weld, which caused the Kudetans to fight conservatively until they realized their mistake. Furthermore, the presence of the coordinator prevented them from doing anything as dishonorable as using weapons of mass destruction. The field marshal had been desperately calling for reinforcements throughout the attack, but the combine invasion was so absolute that near every other system in range was also under attack. Only a single vessel arrived from Kosa, but by this point, Simons could see the battle was lost. He ordered them to call off their landing while he would attempt to withdraw. While some of the survivors were able to escape, the field marshal was not among them, his dropship intercepted by Kuritan aerospace fighters and destroyed while leaving atmosphere. His death was a major blow to both coordination and morale in the region. It's often said that the decision not to attack the Lyran Commonwealth, as everyone had expected the Draconis Combine to do, was made by Minoru to comply with the tenets of Bushido, which he held in high esteem. Bushido says that a weak opponent, as how Steiner had proven themselves to be, should be given time to prepare themselves further, so that they might fight honorably. In truth, Jinjiro had long ago convinced his father to strike at the Federated Sons, and their actions along the Lyran border were simply part of an elaborate ruse, one that had successfully duped the rest of the inner sphere. Word of the invasion did not reach First Prince John Davian on Muskegon until the third week of May. He frantically dispatched orders to those units he could reach to withdraw from the Draconis March and establish a new defensive line at the edge of the Crucis March. Unfortunately, the provincial attitudes that plagued the AWFS were preventing any sort of coordinated response. 
Some regiments would not abandon their homes and foolishly tried to hunker down and weather the storm. Others, who had only recently been moved to the Draconis border, up and fled the moment they received their orders. Federated Sun's losses were horrific during this first month, and the defensive line that the First Prince had hoped to establish was full of holes. The DCMS employed an unusual strategy to great effect during their advance. They would arrive in system, quickly destroy all communications facilities, naval assets, and any Fed Sun's troops in the open, and then promptly depart. They spent as little time on ground as possible before jumping to their next target. This left large pockets of resistance in their wake, but those troops had no means of leaving the system or coordinating an effective defense. In the subsequent months, less experienced second-line Curitan units would arrive to mop up what was left. The advance was happening so quickly that tracking exactly where the front line was became almost impossible, both for the AWFS commanders trying to organize a defense and for us historians attempting to follow along. Centuries removed from the conflict, we can only make vague approximations as to how far Kirita had penetrated into the Federated Suns. By the end of the first month, the DCMS had made serious inroads into two of the Draconis March operational areas. Almost all of the Clovis combat region had been taken, most of Dahar and Robinson, and half a dozen systems within Fairfax. All this had been achieved with very few casualties. The only notable losses were the first and third Sword of Light, who had been at the forefront of several major battles. An elite corps of survivors would go on to form the new 6th and 8th Sword of Light regiments, adopting as their sigil the Pillars of Ivory and Jade. The success of Jinjiro's campaign was so shocking that three mortal enemies, the Capellan Confederation, Free Wills League and Lyran Commonwealth, briefly contemplated signing a mutual non-aggression pact with the powerful Draconis Combine. Ultimately, Steiner had already lost too many worlds to allow it, and there was too much ill will between Liao and Marek for an alliance there. By comparison to the Curitan onslaught, Kenya Marek's 50 regiment invasion of the Capellan Confederation was positively quaint. In May, they seized control of Old Kentucky without a fight after discovering the planetary garrison had fled before their approach. How Steiner was a constant irritant though, periodically probing the defenses of the Bolan Thumb. A raid on Roche turned into a full assault, one which cost the Bolan Defenders Brigade another of their units. Significant use of WMDs scarred the world to the point where the LCAF abandoned it soon after. The Rocher fell back into Maddox hands, but there was nothing of value left in the debris. The only other major action was when the Free Worlds League took Wyatt, a former Terran system that the Lyrans had seized a few years earlier. Despite being the first to declare war on each other, the Lyran League border remained one of the quietest during this early phase of the war. The Marek militia continued their advance in July, quickly seizing Shamdo and Fact. Wazen seemed as if it would fall just as easily. A pair of Marek militia regiments made landfall and took both the capital and spaceport without incident, but scouts then discovered the presence of the old Kentucky Lancers. They had dug in at one of the smaller cities, awaiting Holbright's approach. She instead ordered the firebombing of the city, wiping out half of the regiment and countless civilians within. Things played out in similar fashion on Kori. The unit sent to take the world were engaged by one of the CCAF's new regiments formed from SLDF remnants. They withdrew from the spaceport after a brief clash and set up positions within the capital city. An additional two companies of catapults bolstered their defense, straight from the planet's mech factories. This prompted Colonel Gaines to call in orbital strikes, again demolishing large parts of the city. The survivors withdrew into the hills. With the exception of picking at the Terran hegemony bones, the Capellan Confederation armed forces had so far barely played a part in the First Succession War. The Mashkarovka had kept Barbara Liao informed of the growing Davian task force near Chesterton, and it had blinded her to the Marek invasion that came from the opposite direction. Now she sought to regain some of the initiative. At the risk of coming into conflict with a third successor state, 
The Capellan Chancellor gathered together a trio of Liao and Tikhanov lancers and tasked them with seizing Davian Wells within the Clovis combat region before Kirita could organize an assault. She recognized that each realm would have Terra as one of its main targets for the war, and it was worth the risk to shut the Federated Sons out of any future battle for humanity's homeworld. By August, she had taken Angle, Rio, and Tybalt. While they prepared for their next jump, Barbara turned her attention towards dealing with the Eagle. The brutal tactics employed by the Marek militia colonels on Kori and Wazan had failed to eliminate the planetary garrisons, and now the survivors rose up in rebellion. Further back, the Grand Duchy of Orient had sent a pair of its regiments to garrison the New Worlds. The Hassad lancers struck at the newly arrived forces before they had settled into defensive positions. In September, the Marek militia assault force redeployed in an effort to stamp out the rebellion, but they proved particularly stubborn. The Seacalf launched their follow-on attacks against another trio of worlds within the Clovis combat region the following month. By the end of November, Keen, New Florence, and Ronald had all been added to the Tikhanov commonality. That same month proved to be the last for the few remaining defenders on Kori and Wazan. Orient dispatched more garrison forces in December to defend the Free World's latest conquests and free up the Marek militia to continue towards Sana. Or at least, that was their plan until the Capella Navy ambushed their waiting jump ships. The League warships in orbit above the worlds attempted to move to their aid, but the distance was far too great. The Liao vessels now moved to intercept. Their victory was a decisive one. All seven Free Worlds League Navy ships were destroyed at the cost of only two from the Confederation, plus a third that lost all drive. This left eight FWLM regiments stranded deep within the Sana commonality at the mercy of the hostile naval vessels overhead. As the Inner Sphere entered December 2787, the first year of the Succession Wars was coming to a close. The brutality on display had shocked all involved. They hoped for a decisive victory. 238 years later, we're still waiting. The first year of the Succession Wars had proven itself to be one of the most destructive in the history of the Inner Sphere. Every faction had already made use of weapons of mass destruction, and there was nothing to prevent their continued proliferation. Many invaders had shown zero regard for innocent lives by targeting population centers in an effort to drive out defenders, while other even more contemptible commanders made the killing of civilians an objective in itself. Despite being only a diversionary campaign, the largest battle of the war so far had taken place at Skondia between the Draconis Combine and Lyran Commonwealth. Archon Jennifer Steiner had launched raids deep into Kiritan territory to relieve the pressure on the besieged world. Though Skondia had fallen, the massive damage to the shipyards at the capitals of Dieron and Luthien had proven a humiliation for coordinator Minoru Kirita. Now, the survivors of the Scondia invasion fleet were gearing up for a deep raid of their own against the Commonwealth's largest industrial world, Hesperus. Operation Broken Blade was launched in December 2787. Taisho Pedersen again had command of the fleet, though combat losses had reduced its size almost by half. Furthermore, with the campaign against the Federated Sons now in full swing, he had far fewer supporting units to call on. The ground attack was to be led by two of the elite Sword of Light regiments, plus another regular and one mercenary command. They were evenly matched by four LCAF battle mech regiments and the largest naval flotilla hosted by any non-capital system within the Commonwealth. Confident that he had sufficient ground forces to counter any landing force, Admiral Weisskopf instead focused all his attention on the approaching Draconis Combined Admiralty bringing to bear the combined might of more than a dozen cruisers. Having expected the defenders to make at least some attempts to intercept the dropships, they did not. 
the lighter Curitan vessels found themselves dangerously positioned and outgunned. The initial engagement cost them dearly, and it was all they could do to harass the victorious Steiner fleet in an effort to stop them launching orbital strikes of their own. All four of the DCMS regiments had made landfall, but the mountainous terrain on Hesperus meant their landing sites were often far from their intended targets. As they entered orbit, they also discovered to their dismay that the Archon had commenced a massive relocation effort for the factories on Weld, moving many either underground or into caverns within the mountains. Focusing instead on the facilities that still remained on the surface, their approach led them into extensive fortifications and weapons emplacements that inflicted brutal losses on the attackers. Only the Sword of Light regiments escaped off Weld when Pedersen called for a withdrawal a month later. So ended the First Battle of Hesperus. Their raid had resulted in the destruction of the orbital facilities, but what little damage was inflicted to the factories on the surface was repaired within the year. The Draconis Combine would raise the battle mech factories on Sudeten and Yedposteria the following month, but wouldn't trouble Steiner again for some time. The Tamar Tigers launched their own reprisal raids against Pomme de Terre and Styx, after which the Combine Commonwealth Front went quiet for the next year. The Capellans made the last of their strikes against the Corwood Davian worlds around this time, taking Addix, Anchor, and Small World in January 2788. This minor campaign had won them several systems, but cost a pair of mech regiments. The Deneb Light Cavalry had fought hard against their approach, and on several occasions the Seacaf turned to nuclear weapons to clear out defences. They also secured the Terran system of Xien, but ousting the nobility resulted in the Loyal Planetary Guard establishing their own mercenary regiment and signing on with the Federated Sons as the Xien Hotheads. With the complete takeover of the Clovis Combat Region, a new border had been established between the Capellan Confederation and Draconis Combine. The former extended an olive branch and proposed a limited alliance, or at least a mutual non-aggression pact. Unfortunately, the Curitans smarted at the fact that several systems in their campaign path had been stolen from right under their noses. The Combine declared that they would only consider an alliance on the condition that Minoru Curita be acknowledged as First Lord of the Star League. They also demanded the Seacath launch an immediate attack along the Capellan March border. The Confederation was not prepared to acquiesce on either request. It would be decades before another offer of truce was made between the successor states. Barbara Liao's main focus remained the reversing of the Free World's invasion of her realm. For the past several months, a massive armada of warships and dropships had been gathering at Cyan, now consisting of over a hundred vessels, supported by a dozen aerospace regiments and twelve brigades of mixed ground forces. Commanding this new task force was Colonel Jason Devlin. In late February, the Chancellor gave the order to depart for the League border. Captain General Kenyon Malik remained unaware of the coming storm. His forces at the front were still pinned down after the loss of their naval escort. A trio of warships stationed at New Delos were the first to be moved forwards in preparation, something which Mashkarovka agents within the FWLM relayed back to Liao. While a rescue operation was organised, he turned his attention coreward. Throughout the first two months of 2788, Paul Steiner had dispatched the Stealth's mercenary regiment on raids against House Marek, eliminating several major industrial sites at Thermopylae and Wyatt. Later in the year, they were permanently reassigned to Amanda Lestrade's command. The Bolan Thumb allowed Kenyon to manoeuvre forces deep into the Commonwealth, and when they struck at Duantier in reprisal that march, they used nuclear weapons to obliterate the defenders before they had a chance to escape. These actions would soon be reversed on the civilians of the Free Worlds League tenfold. On the Draconis Fed Sons border, First Prince John Davian was taking stock of the calamity that had befallen his nation. The Combine had made massive inroads into the realm. Dozens of regiments were cut off behind the front line, and as the DCMS advanced, garrison forces moved in behind them to finish off the isolated defenders at their leisure. In a desperate attempt to raise new units to help defend the beleaguered state, the premier military academies formed new cadet cutters from their training mechs, 
and rushed them into service with the AFFS. Sakara at the front had mobilised its entire student body out of necessity, while Albion and New Avalon took to reserve roles that allowed more established forces to move forwards. The Curitans had paused their campaign while they geared up for a second wave. They appeared to be waiting for the coordinator to return to the front after he had disappeared to parts unknown earlier in the year. Davian did have a plan to blunt the invasion, however. He had gathered around him some of the most elite forces within his realm, originally with the intention of striking at the Capellan Confederation, but now this force was ready to redeploy against the Curitans. Unfortunately, with the Capellan seizing nine worlds of their own in recent months, he couldn't afford to leave the Chesterton region undefended. Instead, he siphoned off three of his best and paired them with six infantry and armour regiments from the Marlette combat region. Operation Solar Shield, as the counterattack would become known, departed for the front line in February. They were ill-prepared for what they were about to stumble into. There were just five warships in escort, and none of the new task forces had time to train together before they made their assault. The shortage of available warships was a major obstacle for the Federated Sons. That February, the Fresh Prince moved against Terran-aligned Boeing Interstellar to seize the new Megaplex at Galax. He could not afford to have this vital facility sitting idle any longer. Control of the new Federated Boeing was given to Euston McCorkendale, making the trusted noble house one of the wealthiest in the inner sphere. The pressure was clearly getting to the AFFS High Command, and nowhere is this more apparent than in their ill-conceived decision to launch Operation Brass Ring the following month. The Draconis Combine had tried and failed to destroy the facilities on Hesperus. It had cost them considerably, and achieved very little. In a baffling strategic blunder, the Federated Sons decided that they could do better, attacking unprovoked a realm with which they shared no bad blood since the Age of War centuries earlier. Perhaps the hope was to make the Dragonus Combine divert some attention against the weakened Lyran Commonwealth, but the reality was that it served only to divert forces that were desperately needed to hold back the Dragon. Only eight warships of the Federated Sun's navy could be found to escort the raiders to Hesperus. When they arrived in late March, they were confronted by the survivors of the prior naval battle, a little over 20 Lyran vessels. Rear Admiral Hayes attempted to use speed as his only advantage, and was able to open a brief window which allowed a battalion of troops to make landfall after a week of skirmishing in space. The alert had long since gone out though, giving the Hesperus guards more than enough time to muster and quickly dispatch the raiders. The AFFS called off the attack in April, having achieved nothing of note. They lingered in the dark space of the Terran hegemony for over a year, licking their wounds. Later that month, the CCAF's Task Force Devlin appeared in the New Delos system. They had moved through occupied space without drawing attention to themselves by using cracked codes retrieved by the Mashkarovka. New Delos had been the site where the Capellan Confederation and Free Worlds League had put their past grievances to bed at the end of the Second Andurian War. This time, the entire armada descended on the planet, which had only a single green regiment to defend it. They made landfall around the capital city, cutting off any escape routes, then gave those within just eight hours to surrender the world. They didn't bother to wait for a response, and launched mass bombing raids soon after. Approximately 20,000 were killed, and more than 200,000 were wounded. The Orloff Grenadiers tried to stop the killing, but were themselves wiped out by the overwhelming Capellan numbers. The orders Colonel Devlin had received from Barbara Liao left no doubt in his mind what the objective of this raid was. The killing of civilians took priority over the destruction of the various staging posts and supply depots supporting the Marek militia campaign. And yet, however brutal the attack on New Delos had been, the true horror of the First Succession War was about to be realised in the nearby Stuart Commonality. In early May 2788, a pair of warships appeared in the Helm system, escorting a mech regiment of the Draconis Combine Mustard Soldiery. With them was the missing coordinator, Minoru Kirita. Most of the Stuart Dragoons had long since been redeployed to the Capellan Front, 
leaving only a small militia force in garrison. They alerted the defenders to their presence when they launched a nuclear weapon at the forces camped at Fort Albert on the 11th of May. What followed was a brutal campaign against the survivors and civilian population, as the Draconis Combine searched frantically for the SLDF secret base within the Nagayan Mountains. Nothing was off limits if it resulted in the discovery of the hidden cache. Civilians were rounded up, interrogated and tortured in an effort to locate it. Eventually, their lack of success led them to detonate a nuclear weapon within the capital Freeport. By the 28th, the DTMS was pulling back, having determined that the weapons cache had either been emptied by the FWLM or the SLDF before them, or was simply a myth. As the Taisho departed for orbit, he contacted the coordinator to inform him that they had failed to locate the secret base. Minoru's response was to order his fleet to chastise the local population for their lack of assistance. Olav Nansen gave the order and began the Ghost Rain Protocol. Their full arsenal of nuclear ordnance and naval batteries was unleashed on Helm's major population centres. In less than an hour, approximately 10 million civilians were killed, the greatest loss of life since the New Vandenberg campaign during the Reunification War, a battle that had raged for many months. In the subsequent years, a further 60 million civilians perished in the nuclear winter, and another 20 million were displaced by the carnage. In May of 2788, it was unquestionably one of the greatest atrocities in human history. By year's end, those numbers would be almost insignificant. Back in the Federated Suns, Operation Solar Shield was getting underway. It began with the botched assault on Elbar that May. Upon arrival, they failed to locate any hostile naval presence, and so began their burn towards orbit, only for a Combine warship to suddenly appear behind them and destroy their jump ships. The stranded dropships transferred as much of their material into their escort as possible, before cruising straight past their target, abandoning their vessels, and jumping out in the days that followed. Shadar was an even greater disaster. While the two Vincent-class corvettes engaged each other, the DCA destroyers completely ignored the incoming fire from the remaining escort warship to focus on the approaching dropships. Yet another AWFS regiment was destroyed before even making landfall, as were the naval elements soon after. To help pull some of the attention away from the Terran end of the front, John Davian had ordered those forces who had retreated deeper into the Fairfax combat region to instead squeeze the Curate in advance from the other end. The final target in the ill-fated Operation Solar Shield was Cartago, where the strength of Alexander were making landfall in early June. With them was the First Prince himself. A pair of warships served as escort for the assault force, and were able at first to drive off their opposite number from the Draconis Combine Admiralty. The Davian guards descended to secure the capital's spaceport, but found it strangely deserted. The ships around them were civilian designs, not military as they had first appeared. They were also in serious disrepair. The mystery resolved itself when the Draconis Combine remote detonated a nuclear weapon hidden among the vessels. John Davian's saving grace was that the detonation was somewhat premature, and only a company of mechs were caught in the explosion. It had nonetheless shaken his composure, and he ordered his regiment back to their dropships when they detected a large aerospace fighter force on fast approach. At the same time, a trio of Curitan destroyers now moved around the planet to engage their escort and cut off their exit. Miraculously, the First Prince was able to escape the system alive, but only thanks to a holding action that lost him yet another warship. Operation Solar Shield was an unmitigated disaster for the Federated Sons. If there was any silver lining at all, it was that the Field Marshals at Fairfax had actually managed to liberate most of their combat region. Elsewhere, the best victory they could claim was the death of the Coordinator's cousin Vincent Curita, whose claim to the new Avalon throne had begun the War of Davian succession half a century earlier. The main Combine advance continued unabated, however, in less than two years, the Draconis March had been halved in size. 
By the end of 2788, more than 25 regiments had been destroyed by the Kiritan tidal wave, almost a quarter of their pre-war strength. A few battalion-sized units had formed behind enemy lines on Dobson, Franklin and New Roads, and miraculously Colonel Michael Barlow's battalion was still fighting on Cusser, as were some of the survivors on Galtor despite being two of the first worlds hit. The Dragon now sat directly on the border of the Crucis March. This region of space had not seen combat since the Davian Civil War two and a half centuries earlier. It had seemed unthinkable that another realm would ever push so far into their territory. Morale across the military was absolutely shot. And unfortunately for House Davian, Kirita was only just getting started. Earlier in the year, Jerome Blake had returned from his voyage with promises from each of the successor lords to respect Comstar's neutrality. The conditions of the Communications Protocol of 2787 were already being enforced across the Inner Sphere. Back on March 13th, he had outlined his plans for a revised Operation Silver Shield. The situation in the Terran hegemony was more dire than ever. Though it was only a suspicion at the time, documents recovered in the years since prove that both Minoru Kurita and Kenya Malik were already making plans for an assault on Terra. Blake had strengthened his forces by approaching mercenaries of SLDF Vintage and offering them spare parts stockpiles, but he now called for his full power. Operation Silver Shield began on June 25th at 0600 Terra Standard Time. Every hyperpulse generator within the Sol system suddenly went dark, and this soon spread to the entire network, cutting off all interworld communications. Without a means to contact their neighbours, nobody realised this was anything more than a local failure and not a deliberate act. This shutdown was timed to coincide with the arrival of former SLDF troops on Terra. Comstar had secretly organised its forces into eight expeditionary brigades under the command of General Lauren Hayes. Their first targets were the space defence system emplacements, securing the world against all but the largest hostile fleets. The small garrisons maintained by each successor state were promptly disarmed. Only the AWFS garrison at Berlin resisted for five hours. Elsewhere in the Sol system, the warships Comstar had hidden quickly brought the other planets and facilities under their control. With Comstar and Blake in particular viewed in such a favourable light by the Terrans, the government welcomed the takeover. The only stubborn resistance Hayes faced was a pair of former SLDF divisions that refused to go along with their orders. Operating out of the Manaus Castle Brian, they fought for three days until the 1st and 5th Comstar Expeditionary Division were able to overrun their position. The HPGs came back online on the 28th, carrying a message across the Inner Sphere informing them of the events on Earth. Terra had been claimed as a Comstar Protectorate, the successor lords reacted with indignation, claiming that Comstar had violated its own neutrality. Unfortunately for them, with the First Succession War in full swing, they would need the continued support of the HPG network in order to complete their own campaigns before they could divert sufficient forces to seize Terra as their own. The original plan for Operation Silver Shield had called for Comstar to take control of all of the Hegemony Core Worlds but Blake wisely saw that this would surely provoke a hostile reaction. Instead, the Comstar Expeditionary Divisions moved to New Earth on July 3rd and began to dismantle the former regular army headquarters there. By the time they left a week later, there was nothing of use left. This would be the last time Comstar took overt military action in the First Succession War. They spent the next few decades securing their position politically on Terra while trying to make themselves less of a target for the successor states by decommissioning their naval yards and secreting their many weapon stockpiles somewhere on Earth. Hunting for hidden Star League caches was becoming a popular pastime for every major house. The Draconis Combine had left Helm empty-handed, but they weren't the only ones searching within the Free Worlds League for one of Kerensky's abandoned stockpiles. In July, the armed forces of the Capellan Confederation and Lyran Commonwealth both dispatched a pair of regiments to the former provincial capital, Tierfing. The planet had been heavily scarred during the Civil War, 
and over the ensuing decade, over a billion civilians had emigrated off-world. Nevertheless, the ruined Castles Brian likely still housed valuable supplies and equipment, making it a priority target. Rumours suggested that Maddock was trying to bring the space defence system back into operation, which gave them additional urgency to strike sooner rather than later. The defending regiment excelled in ambush tactics, inflicting a heavy toll on the raiders. However, with 4 to 1 odds, there could be little hope of victory, even if the attackers were occasionally forced to fight each other. Colonel Sullivan sent out a call for reinforcements. To buy themselves time, the Marek militia turned to weapons of mass destruction, particularly favouring chemical weapons recovered from the ruins. This devastated the conventional forces deployed to Tirfing, turning the campaign into an all-battle mech affair. Orient Hazar reinforcements arrived in the following weeks, but the situation soon became even more convoluted. Desperate to find anything that might help them turn the tide against the Kiritan onslaught, a Davian raiding party touched down in August. Their sizeable infantry complement faced immediate disaster when they disembarked into a radioactive and poisoned hellscape. Task Force Devlin's attack on New Delos had threatened to severely weaken the strong ties between House Manic and House Allison. The Grand Duchy of Orient had been their strongest and most loyal supporter, but the Captain General's inability to defend one of his own systems from the Capellan attacks, coupled with his need for the Duchy to send its own units into occupied space, was a bad look for Kenyan Manic in Parliament. He now sought vengeance against Liao beginning with the orbital bombardment of Ingersoll in July. The primary target was the dropship assembly yards, but the destruction soon spread to the popular holiday and tourist beaches nearby. Worse followed at New Canton in August. The Maddock flotilla did not land any forces to take the planet, just simply bombarded the major military, industrial and residential districts from space. The following month, they went after the supply depots at Outreach, and then conducted another firebombing campaign against Hall in November. Civilian deaths were in the hundreds of thousands, but that was barely a drop in the ocean compared to what the Inner Sphere was about to bear witness to. Back in October, the chaotic battle raging on Tirfing reached another level. With the arrival of the Draconis Combine Mustard Soldiery, Tirfing became the only time in history that a five-way battle had been fought between each of the successor states. In a notable twist of fate, two former units of the Rimwell's Republic would battle against one another, the Black Sharks and the Stealths. In December, fighting intensified as the 11 regiments closed on the Great Crystal Valley, one of the greatest natural wonders of the Inner Sphere, site of towering phosphorescent crystals as large as glaciers, Whole battalions would vanish into underground warrens, caves and Star League bunkers scattered across the region, never to re-emerge. Alliances were formed and broken on an hourly basis. Two whole regiments were destroyed across the six-day battle, and the crystal formations that predated humanity itself were trampled into dust. What little of value was found barely compensated for the material lost in its acquisition. The fighting continued into February 2789, at which point the survivors all pulled back. Another of the Terran hegemony's jewels had been thoroughly despoiled. The profligate use of nuclear and particularly chemical weapons had left it virtually uninhabitable. Tirfing had suffered at the hands of Amaris during the Civil War, but the SLDF campaign had kept the use of WMDs to military targets primarily. The same was not true of the First Succession War. Less than 8 million civilians had survived to see the Great Houses depart. The final death toll, 1.6 billion. The blockade of Inglesmond had been going on for almost two years. It remained one of the most economically viable systems within the Terran hegemony but the situation on the ground was dire. The Combine hoped to starve the government into submission and claim the industrious planet for themselves. The inhabitants did not want to give up their freedoms to the Draconian House Curita, but things were getting desperate. 
a request for aid went out to both the Federated Sons and Lyran Commonwealth, promising to join their realm in exchange for assistance in repulsing the dragon. Neither was in any position to help, but saw an opportunity to deny the Curitans another valuable system. When they arrived, their objective was simply asset denial. Inglesmond watched in horror as the troops that they believed had come to save them instead unleashed an array of nuclear weapons against them and any DTMS targets of opportunity. The enraged Combine responded in kind, leading to a cataclysmic fallout on the ground. When the dust settled and the Kiritans looked at what the battle had won them, they found nothing but ash. Of the once four and a quarter billion people that had called Inglesmond home, barely 10,000 anguished souls were left. Twenty-seven eighty-eight is the year where the First Succession War passes beyond easy comprehension. The Star League Civil War, which just a decade earlier was the bloodiest conflict ever fought, was now nothing but a prologue to the apocalypse which had been unleashed by the successor states. In two years, or on just one planet in the case of Inglesmund, more people had been killed in combat than in the entire 100,000 years of human history. And in the eyes of House Davian and Steiner High Command, that was a successful raid. The carnage being wrought all along their borders had so desensitized them to the use of weapons of mass destruction that the extermination of billions was now nothing but an unfortunate but necessary act to deny their true rival a valuable asset. Twenty-seven eighty-eight also marked the end for the Terran hegemony. When Comstar took over control of Terra and made no provision for the governance of other neighboring systems, the former Cameron Worlds found themselves without a home nation. The effects were similar to the demarcation declaration that followed the Outer Reaches Rebellion half a millennia earlier. It would take a few more years for all of them to be subsumed into one of the successor states, but for all intents and purposes, the Terran hegemony was dead. In the opening weeks of 2789, Kiritan troops began pouring into the Kestrel and Marlet combat regions within the Crucis March. Warlord Jinjiro's invasion had already taken 60 worlds from the Federated Sons, making it the most successful campaign of the First Succession War so far. To assist in their continued advance, a handful of major supply depots were established in recently occupied systems to reduce travel times. The armed forces of the Federated Sons, who had suffered more losses than all the other successor states combined, were powerless to stop them at this phase of the war. In the neighbouring Capellan Confederation, Colonel Devlin was preparing to depart from Propus for another brutal strike against the Grand Duchy of Orient, this time at Calloway. His task force had been restructured and now included the vaunted Ares Titans and Red Lancers within which served the Chancellor's sons, Balthazar and Barnabas. In a move that greatly worried the Capellan nobility, Barbara herself would also accompany her sons. Unfortunately for House Liao, SAFE had many agents operating within the Propus system, and they kept the Free Worlds well informed of the developing situation. They didn't yet know where they would strike, but they divided the Navy's third fleet accordingly, and reserve units were moved forwards. When Task Force Devlin began moving in February, they awaited the call to reinforce whatever system they appeared in. As it happened, their target Callaway was garrisoned by a quartet of provincial regiments and the 1st Orient Provincial Squadron. The following month, the Free Worlds League launched what they hoped would be a decisive blow against the industrial capacity of House Steiner. Kenyan Merrick's younger son Thaddeus had recently been promoted to Fleet Admiral 
and given command of the entire Lydon front. He was looking to make a name for himself and believed he had an opportunity in Hesperus. Approximately one third of the Commonwealth's mech production took place within the massive factories on planet. Their continued operation allowed Steiner to expand the 2nd Lyran Guards Division to full strength, with one of the new regiments given to the Archon's son, Richard. Reviewing the prior battles, he concluded that Kirita and Davian had tried to have their cake and eat it by landing ground forces tasked with both the destruction of the facilities and with seizing spare parts. The third battle of Hesperus would instead be an all-naval affair. Thaddeus' fleet would engage the defenders and break off a pair of mass driver equipped cruisers to strike at the factories from orbit. His battle plan also called for his navy to materialize at a pirate point near the system's first planet, limiting the time Hesperus had to organize a defense. The strategy appeared to pay off when the Free Wells League navy successfully arrived at the dangerous pirate point without incident, but fate was about to throw a spanner into the works. Arriving just days after Marek, Fleet Admiral Dewey of the Commonwealth Navy had come to relieve Weisskopf of Hesperus's defense. When he discovered the raid in progress, an immediate in-system jump took the pair of Lyran cruisers directly into orbit, just as the battle commenced. They were perfectly positioned to intercept the Soil-class vessels assigned to ground assault. After a broadside nearly destroyed his flagship, Dewey ordered his cruiser to ram the nearest vessel, dragging both down into the atmosphere. The other hostile soil was destroyed soon after. With the attack faltering, Thaddeus Malik was forced to call for a retreat or risk losing the remainder of his fleet. Hesperus had been an embarrassing defeat for Kenyan son, but he would go some way to repairing his reputation with the successful strike against the Dassault Shimon shipyards at New Earth later in the year destroying the orbital facility just months after it had fallen into Lyran hands. While this third battle would mark the last major raid against Hesperus during the First Succession War, it wasn't the end of the troubles for those on World. A guerrilla force known as Macredum's Devils had formed in the mountains from survivors of the 52nd Heavy Assault Regiment, the ex-SLDF mercenaries who had participated in the Kiritan assault. They had been disrupting operations on World for the past year, and it would take two more before the last of them were finally hunted down by the Hesperus guards. Not to be outdone by the Free Worlds League, the Draconis Combines staged their own raid against Steiner's Port Mosby, savaging the defenders and forcing the Lyran guards to have to rebuild their regiment from scratch. Thankfully, with Hesperus still operating at capacity, they were able to do this in short order. Within the newly conquered territory of the Draconis Combine, Warren's charges found themselves behind enemy lines. They hatched a daring plan to destroy one of the staging posts Jinjiro was using to support his advance. They launched their raid on March 23rd, timed to coincide with a parade the Kiritans were performing in front of the media and news crews of half a dozen realms. When the attack began, cameras from across the Inner Sphere were there to see it. The charges drew the combine mechs into the morass of stockpiled weapons a place where any stray shot risked a massive chain reaction. Captain Warrant perished in the attack, but half his unit escaped. By then, more than a thousand tons of munitions had gone up in smoke, and two companies of the DCMS forces had been caught in the raging inferno. It was the first real blow the Federated Sons had dealt House Kirita. The material damage, though great, was insignificant compared to the effect on troop morale. In the aftermath, the Combine relocated that supply depot to Kintari 4. In March 2789, Task Force Devlin materialized at Callaway's Zenith jump point. The Orient Provincial Squadron immediately engaged them with a suicidal charge. While the majority of the fleet was still appearing around them, the half dozen House Allison warships dove into the quagmire and targeted as many transport vessels as possible, destroying a full regiment of aerospace fighters and battle mechs before their inevitable demise. On approach to the planet, the transports were again intercepted by large numbers of enemy fighters and dropships, which eliminated a further two regiments. The CCAF still had a slight numbers advantage as the ground campaign commenced, but they were hampered by an overzealous Barbara Liao who insisted on taking to the field personally 
despite her lack of combat experience. This forced Devlin to deploy more conservatively than he would have liked, and things soon turned against him. By the 10th day, the Red Lancers had lost two battalions, and the rest of the task force were in a similarly sorry state. Barbara reluctantly called for a withdrawal, and the survivors headed to their dropships. It was at this point they discovered that their entire jumpship detachment had been wiped out by the arriving Maddock fleet out at the Zenith. Devlin ordered a half dozen warships to break off and escort the Chancellor to safety, while he led the remainder of the fleet to engage the Free Wills League Navy head on. Of the 24 vessels that battled the Maddock ships, just six made it out the other side, while the Free Wills Admiral lost a dozen of their own in the exchange. Jason Devlin himself was killed when his flagship was struck by a number of nuclear missiles. The Callaway debacle resulted in serious ramifications for Barbara Leal, both professional and personal. She had lost the support of both her government and the Stratagios, the armed forces high command. Furthermore, she had lost both her sons. The Confederation transitioned into a defensive posture in the months that followed. Crucially, they were forced to abandon their blockade of the Marek militia on Kori and Wazan, but not quickly enough to prevent the destruction of several more warships, in turn allowing the Eagle to resume his drive towards Sana. Kenyon's primary goal was to strengthen one of his closest supporters, House Orloff. The Duke of Carbonis had been living in exile within the Grand Duchy of Orient since the Age of War. They now prepared for a homecoming. Taking first the planet Orenson, destroying a Tikhonov regiment in the process, a trio of FWLM units next descended on Carbonus itself. The Seacap and Merksing garrison were eliminated, and the Duke restored to his position. The Duchy of Orloff had expanded to include four new systems since the war began, helping them to raise an additional two regiments. Two months after Calloway, Kenyon Maddock sent the Chancellor a mocking letter, claiming that he was coming for Andurian next. The Stratagios was not fooled by the ruse and continued to fortify those worlds along his path to Sana. The Free Worlds League military was just as active on the Lyran front, targeting first the system of Murden off the Bolan Thumb. Both sides used nuclear and chemical weapons extensively during the five month campaign meaning it was somewhat of a hollow victory for Maddock. To strengthen their control of the region, they hired on the mysterious Dark Spirits. This mercenary outfit had suddenly appeared within the Free Worlds and kept quiet about their history. We know now that they were actually the survivors of Darabont's Damned, a mercenary regiment that had fled the Amaris Empire in the final days of the Star League Civil War. Elsewhere on the front, the Free Worlds seized Alula Australis in July. The Lyrans launched a retaliatory raid straight away against the Bolan defenders on Kamens. Unbeknownst to them, stationed on World was Kenya Manic's oldest son, Carl. The heir to the Free Worlds League would become an unintentional casualty of the raid, leaving his own son Jason Manic as Kenyan's successor. In September, the Lyran Commonwealth again came under attack from the Federated Sons. The remnants of the Second Battle of Hesperus, led by Admiral Hayes, first appeared within the Thorin system, where they caused as much damage to infrastructure as they could from orbit before departing. The stealths were known to be operating in the region, which prevented the AFFS from landing any forces. They next struck at Rocky, where upon arrival they discovered that the LCAF on world were in the midst of a manhunt for a rebel group of Amaris Empire armed forces. While Davian and Steiner engaged each other, the Amaris loyalists struck at the Lyran headquarters, prompting a nuclear response. Hayes in orbit responded in kind, and soon the planet was plunged into a nuclear winter. The exact death toll on Rocky isn't known. The last census, taken in 2765 before the fall of the Star League, reported a population of two and a quarter billion. Despite the mass exodus that followed the Civil War, it's probable that Rocky's population still numbered well over a billion, most of whom would perish in the crossfire. On the final leg of their return to the Federated Suns, the last of the task force destroyed the Dytron Heavy Industrials orbital shipyards within the new Earth system, rendering useless the second of the two facilities Steiner had been so pleased to acquire. 
these minor victories were of little consolation to the collapsing Federated Sons. Throughout 2789, Jinjiro's advance had proven completely unstoppable. They abandoned early the defense of the Kestrel and the Marlette combat regions, and instead spent the year frantically fortifying the systems around their national capital. Those forces at the front tried in vain to hold their ground, but another two regiments were destroyed, and by year's end, the mustered soldiery were preparing to move into the new Avalon combat region. In their desperation, the Federated Sons launched a special operation that would become known as the Church Expedition. Departing from Pitkin in September, Church led his quintet of jumpships through the Outworlds Alliance and out into distant space. Their goal was to pick up the trail of Alexander Kerensky and somehow convince him to return so that he might aid the beleaguered Davian worlds. For months, they traced the path of jettisoned refuse, along the way discovering several distant colonies who had sighted the commanding general on his pilgrimage, including one of the former staging sites for the Rimworld secret army on Gutara. 130 light years further on, the trail finally turned cold. They had been searching for two years by this point, and their supplies were near exhausted. Defeated, the Commodore led his flotilla back home, unsure if the Federated Sons even still existed. In 2789, the first cracks appeared in the logistic and transport departments of the Inosphere militaries. Unlike today, where they are strictly off-limits, jumpships during the First Succession War were priority targets. The numbers available to the frontline commanders were swiftly depleting. To help maintain their offensives, civilian and commercial vessels were commandeered. The Lyran Commonwealth led the way in this practice. By the end of the year, approximately 50% of their merchant fleet was now operated by the LCAF. Other states soon followed their example. This had terrible knock-on effects. Many colonies that were relying on trade and supply runs to survive found themselves starving and without a means to escape the system. Perhaps the most infamous example of this occurred in the system then known as Dunkelwälder Dunkelflusser Schattenfeld. A decision to redesignate the unwieldy planetary name came at a time when systems were being struck off star maps as various cataclysms befell their worlds. Despite being far removed from the worst of the fighting, the people of Bob inadvertently caused their own downfall, as vital food shipments were no longer dispatched in their direction. The population of 346 million were sentenced to an excruciatingly slow death by starvation, with over a quarter billion succumbing by war's end. In the modern era, less than a million people eke out a living on the surface of this inhospitable planet. One minor battle of Jinjiro's campaign that would have a lasting impact on the Inner Sphere took place on Embryol 3. Fighting for the planet had turned especially ugly, and facing the brunt of it were the Longhorns Mercenary Regiment. They felt their employer, the Draconis Combine, was using them as cannon fodder, sending them on ever more dangerous assignments so that they wouldn't be alive to draw pay at the end of the campaign. This prompted the Longhorns to switch sides, bringing the Department of Military Intelligence a wealth of information on the Curitan battle plans. Quick to see an opportunity in the fallout was Comstar. In 2789, they founded the Mercenary Review Board. Employers and mercs could use them as a neutral arbitrator in an effort to ensure fair treatment. They only requested a modest 5% of the payment in exchange. In the centuries since its creation, Reputable mercenaries have insisted on involving Comstar in any contract negotiations, giving the Terran organization significant insights and influence on where mercenaries are deployed. With the successor states effectively forced to use sea bills to pay for both their communications and military spending, the soft power of Jerome Blake and Comstar continued to grow. This did not go unnoticed by the successor lords, and by late 2789, Kenya Malik had almost completed preparing for a strike on Terra. Throughout the year, the Free World's guards had been building up a massive stockpile of munitions on Procyon ahead of the attack. At this crucial moment, an unknown raiding force arrived on World and launched a precision strike against the depot, 
destroying thousands of tons of supplies, then departed as swiftly as they had arrived. The loss of those vital supplies in the region made continuing with the invasion of Terra and assault on Comstar a foolhardy manoeuvre. Nobody has ever claimed responsibility for the raid. Throughout 2789, Davian had been gathering their naval strength in preparation of a major counter-offensive against Curita. Making up their numbers was half of New Avalon's own defence fleet. By year's end, over a hundred warships pulled from the Capellan and Torian borders had assembled at Arcadia, including the flagship of their entire navy, FSS Golden Lion. The purpose of this armada was not to liberate the captured systems, but to destroy as much of the Kirita navy as possible. Without jump ships and warships to move the troops around, Jinjiro's advance would surely peter out. The fleet began by dividing itself between Admiral Kenneth Jones and Vice Admiral Marjorie Stone. Each would cut a path deep into occupied territory, cause what destruction they could inside of a week or two, drop supplies for any resistance movements they encountered, and then move on to their next target before Kirita could mount an effective response. After hitting their initial objectives, they would regroup at deserted Sholan, before heading for resupply at Rosamond. To coordinate their actions, each flagship was equipped with an extremely rare mobile HPG, two of just a handful still in operation post-Exodus. The counter-attack began in the first week of 2790 and met with early success. Six Curitan warships were destroyed in the first two months at the cost of four Davian vessels. Better, they had captured one of the now rare Savetsky Soyuz class heavy cruisers. Furthermore, 22 jump ships and 25 dropships were destroyed, to only four and eight of their own. Curiously, they had yet to encounter any significant concentrations of the Draconis Combine Admiralty, but their massive fleets would no doubt make short work of any squadrons they stumbled upon, especially once they regrouped at Shalam. Admiral Jones was the first to arrive at the meeting point on March 9th. When he appeared at the system zenith, he quickly realised that something was amiss. The Department of Military Intelligence had reported no Combine targets at Shalam, but the information had been fabricated by an ISF double agent, who was obscuring the system's actual purpose as a staging ground for the DCA fleet. Awaiting them at Shalam was a Kiritan armada of more than a hundred warships. While Jones's fleet was only arriving in dribs and drabs, Taisho Isaru Kalfani had his crews at battle stations as they prepared to depart for the neighbouring worlds the Fed Sons had just attacked. When the DCA realised it wasn't them being ambushed, but rather the other way around, they broke off a third of their fleet to intercept the vulnerable FSN. Already closing range were their full complement of aerospace fighters. Kenneth now frantically dispatched a message to his counterpart aboard the Black Bear urging her to divert their jump ships to the Nadir while she arrived in force to assist. His own jump ships were ordered to scuttle their vessels and abandon ship. Vice Admiral Stones's fleet materialised along the flank of the attacking vessels, catching them off guard. From there, the battle descended into a melee as the rest of the warships engaged one another. The conflagration drew on for six weeks by which time it became apparent that both sides had lost the Battle of Sholam. When the last shot was fired on April 17th, 175 warships had been destroyed, gutting both the Draconis Combine Admiralty and Federated Sun's navy. The carnage wrought by the First Succession War guaranteed they would never recover from that. A further 35 jump ships and 220 dropships were lost. Sadly, without the supplies the FSN fleet hoped to bring, some of the resistance groups withered on the vine. Fighting continued on Dobson, Galtor and Kintari, but the Gorgons on Franklin were wiped out, and the last mechs of Barlow's battalion were destroyed at Cusser later that year. The stubborn commander would continue to lead a small band of guerrillas for over a decade. Controlling the populace became almost impossible for the DCMS garrison, and by the end of the war, both sides had taken to calling the Cusser system Barlow's Folly. While the losses at Sholam were slightly worse for House Davian, 
a full 75% of their navy had been destroyed, they were actually the greatest beneficiary. Despite the extraordinary cost, they had succeeded in taking out virtually the entire Kiritan invasion fleet, putting an instant halt on all further advances. For his accomplishment, Admiral Kenneth Jones was posthumously awarded the Medal Excalibur. For his shame, Taisho Isaru Kalfani took his own life on April 30th. Of all the worlds in the Inner Sphere, perhaps the system over which the most blood has been spilled is Andurian. Marek and Liao had fought three separate wars over control of the region, and a fragile truce was only ever possible through the existence of the Star League. In 2790, the Free Wells League came to reclaim the planet which two centuries earlier they had voluntarily handed over. Nine warships, four regiments of mercenaries and two of regulars descended on the planet, completely overwhelming the defenders in less than a week, at the cost of only their soil-class heavy cruiser. The shocking seizure of one of their commonality capitals had the Capellan Strategios pointing fingers in every direction. The Eagle had humiliated them by seizing Andurian just as he had promised. Ingunish and Ryerson followed soon after, confirming that Manic was opening a second front against the Capellan Confederation. Reclaiming the ancestral home of House Humphreys allowed the defenders of Andurian to form a sixth regiment for the Free Wells League military. Maddox saw similar success on their Corwood border. The Free Wells guards and regular hussars had been largely idle so far during the war. They now embarked on a massive raiding campaign against ten Lyran worlds. When they encountered little resistance, these raids transitioned into full invasions. Alhena, Dixie and Shiloh all changed hands in 2790. The Archon was hard pressed on our Spinwood border too. The Draconis Combine launched eight opportunistic land grabs. While well, LCAF reinforcements arrived to drive them off five of the captured systems, a trio fell under the banner of House Curita. Furthermore, another five systems were raided by the DCMS that year. The Commonwealth responded by launching an enormous raiding campaign of its own that July. Paul Steiner and Amanda Lestrade worked together to relieve the pressure on the beleaguered Federation of Sky by assigning their best units to targets in that region but other attacks were also underway. With Lestrade's focus on Sky, command of any operations in the Bolan Thumb was given to Commandant General Arik Hasseldorf, whose strategy was to mimic the heavy raiding going on elsewhere in preparation for a larger campaign. By August, the Freewelders had taken another world in the region, Radostov, but Hasseldorf would soon even the score. In September, he selected Valwar, the system protruding deepest into Lyran space, as his first target. When the Draconis Combine raided the Tamar Pact capital and destroyed the Bolson Tamar shipyards, it became clear that the Commonwealth's defensive stance was not working to keep them out of the war. Their heavy raiding campaign was insufficient, and so for the first time in three years, they would go on the offensive. Each theatre commander selected a trio of worlds for the first wave, and in November, a pair of mech regiments were dispatched to each. To show her commitment to this change in policy, Archon Jennifer Steiner herself would participate in the attack on Styx. Meanwhile, Commandant General Hasseldorf timed the first phase of his campaign to reclaim the Bowen Thumb to coincide with the attacks elsewhere on the border. As they had before, the Bolan defenders on Valois refused to surrender and fought a vicious guerrilla campaign out of the planet's jungles before the last of them were hunted down on the 23rd of December. Crucially, the LCAF were under strict orders not to use weapons of mass destruction. While this may have resulted in greater casualties among their own forces, keeping civilian losses to a minimum was going to be essential if the fanatical worlds of the Bolan Thumb were ever to be successfully repatriated into the Lyran Commonwealth. Jennifer Steiner and her escort arrived at Styx on December 12th, making landfall 10 days later. After quickly securing the major spaceports and eliminating most of the garrison, the government surrendered to the Lyran Commonwealth. 
on January 4th, 2791, the Archon turned her attention to the last holdouts clustered within a chemical weapons plant. Detonating the site from orbit risked spreading contaminants across the planet, and so instead, she led a ground assault against the facility. As she approached the main gates, booby traps exploded directly in front of her mech, setting off an unintended chain reaction which collapsed most of the facility. Jennifer, in her command seat, was killed instantaneously. Her body never recovered from the blast. The death of Archon Jennifer Steiner threw the fledgling Lyran offensive and indeed the entire realm into complete disarray. No orders were received by the advancing regiments within the first month of her passing, allowing the Draconis Combine and Free Worlds League time to mount a counter-attack, reclaiming all but Judone. Three days before her passing, another assault force had arrived to reclaim Wyatt, but those two worlds would become the sum total of the Lyran offensive. The Estates General promptly moved to have her son Richard confirmed as the Commonwealth's new Archon. He immediately set about reorganising the Lyran High Command. His uncle Paul Steiner remained the General of the Armies, but he was functionally removed from command. Control of the Curitan Theatre was given over to the Duke of Kars, Graham Kelswa. This shake-up took time, and throughout 2791, the Combine was able to seize another six worlds. The only Lyran commander who managed to maintain some momentum was Commandant General Hasseldorf. His raiding campaign had to be scaled back as Richard reassigned his jumpships and warships to other locations on the front, but he was nevertheless able to force the Boland defenders off Dan Shan and liberate the recently conquered Radostov. The Draconis Combine campaign against the Federated Sons had also completely ground to a halt as they struggled to move reserve jump ships to the front in the wake of the Battle of Shalam. Throughout 2791, they made no further advances there. John Davian was glad of the reprieve and took the opportunity to rebuild his battered military using industrial assets seized in the name of the state. The only person making significant moves in 2791 was Kenyon Marek. On his push towards Sana, he took Elnath, Ibstock and Park Place. Orient claimed Sappho, and the Duchy of Andurian expanded by a full 11 systems. Two more Seacaf regiments were destroyed in the bargain. The Eagle's progress may not have been as bombastic as that of Jinjiro Kirita, but his campaign showed no signs of slowing. The only great loss for Marek came when his 12-year-old grandson Ward was shockingly assassinated. The culprit was never determined, but there was now one fewer in the line of succession between Fleet Admiral Thaddeus and his father, the Captain General. As the number of displaced citizens and refugees continued to soar, an enormous effort was undertaken by Comstar, who created the Archives branch to help trace their movement and families across the Inner Sphere. In time, this became a repository for not just genetic history, but also many lost technologies and records. Access to the Comstar archives is strictly controlled. Only the highest officials in the Order are aware of the full breadth of secrets contained within. With the Lyran Commonwealth Armed Forces still restructuring in 2792, the Free Worlds League military went on the offensive again around the Bolan Thumb region. However, these attacks showed the LCAF was becoming a much stronger foe than they had previously contended with. On Gypsum, the invaders were driven back, and worse, the assault force sent to Zaditsa were wiped out by the Lyran guards in garrison. Only on Alula Borealis did they successfully wrestle away a planet from Haus Steiner's iron fist. With Marek's primary focus on the Capellan Confederation, they did little more than launch raids against the Lyran border for the next few years. 
In the Federated Suns, House Davian was finally trying to recapture some of the initiative over the stalled Kiritan advance. From the Capellan end of the front, they squeezed the Kirita bulge, primarily focusing on systems within the Marlet combat region, but also taking a couple from as far away as the Robinson operational area. Their victory was short-lived, as later that year, the Draconis Combine finally resumed its crushing conquest of the Davian state. They began by retaking the Lost Marlette systems, and then immediately followed up by moving towards the capital, New Avalon. Faced with both reinforced defences in every system, and a shortage of jumpships to manoeuvre his forces, Jinjiro abandoned the planet-hopping strategy that had served him so well earlier in the war. Instead, he focused on completely subjugating or destroying each new world he reached before moving on. Progress was much slower, but the occupation forces had to contend with far fewer insurrections. The Commonwealth Navy in 2792 was busy redeploying from the former Rimworld's border to more active fronts. By this point, the Lyran Intelligence Corps was reporting that only one credible threat remained within the periphery, the Finnmark Free Republic. It was here that Richard Steiner next turned his gaze. A squadron of corvettes was broken off and tasked with the destruction of the Row Weapon Systems warship yard at Finnmark. General of the Army's Paul Steiner advocated for a ground campaign that would allow them to take possession of the former Amaris capital system, but Richard was only interested in extermination. Operation Haifisch Flossenzuper began that December. The assault squadron moved first to Dijon, claiming the world for the Commonwealth. They then appeared at the capital's zenith. The Lyran Commodore in charge of the operation demanded their surrender as they approached the shipyards, refusing any calls for a diplomatic solution. As the Marine boarding party landed on the orbital station, the former Rimwelders detonated a nuclear device on board. Several more launched from the planet itself, destroying a pair of the Lyran warships before they were able to withdraw. An hour later, the Lyran squadron returned and unleashed their full strategic arsenal on Finnmark, and didn't relent in their bombardment until the following day, by which point the entire population had been exterminated. Another two worlds of the now defunct Republic were absorbed into the Commonwealth, but the rest were left to rot. The shortage of transports available to Commandant General Hasseldorf meant his Bowl and Thumb campaign progressed only at a very slow pace following Richard's rise to power. Fewer and fewer raids were taking place, and only a single planet changed hands in 2793, where once more the Bolan defenders fought until the last mech fell. Kenya Maddox's assault on the Capellan Confederation, by contrast, was much more successful, destroying a regiment of Andurian Hazars and taking a further eight worlds from House Liao, half of which went to their allies in House Allison and Humphreys. Because of its strategic location right in the middle of the front, an important staging post was established on Anagasaki to support any future advance, but it was here that the campaign began to come undone. Later in the year, a small fleet of Capellan warships arrived in system, making landfall with the Centauri Guards and three supporting regiments who quickly moved against the Marek supply depots. The 21st Centauri Lancers Battalion distinguished themselves by rooting out the defenders with a minimum of destruction to the munitions and equipment in storage. It was the first major loss that the Capellan Confederation had given the Free Wells League since the New Delos Massacre. Suspecting that it was the first phase of a much larger counter-offensive, the FWLM quickly changed to the defensive. This hunkering down led to the creation of a new province within the League, the Syrian Concordance. These former hegemony worlds quickly raised a trio of regiments for their provincial brigade, the Syrian Lancers. In reality, there was no follow-up attack planned, but the captured supplies allowed House Liao to fortify the worlds in the Eagle's path. As 2794 began, the League found itself under pressure from both sides. Hiring a new mercenary regiment went some way to offsetting their recent losses, but their campaign against Liao had completely stalled. They were now being subjected to raiding parties, many of them suicidal in nature, 
slipping across the border and striking with small tactical nukes at targets of opportunity. The most severe of these was the attack on the Magna Fusion Products factory on Orient. A pair of detonations raised both the facility and the nearby Cadet Academy. Killed at the base was the heir to the Captain Generalcy, Jason Marek. Kenyon's firstborn and two of his grandchildren through Carl had now been killed during the First Succession War. The only attack the Capellan Confederation came under at this time came from a highly irregular source. The Lyran Commonwealth, perhaps suspecting that the facility would soon fall to the Free Worlds League once they resumed their advance, struck the Callan Industries facility on Asuncion within the Tikhonov Commonality in May 2794. Other, more conventional raids were launched from the Aladian province against the Bowen Thumb between April and July, culminating in the successful invasion of Elijay. One of the darker chapters to come out of the First Succession War occurred on the planet's throne within the Federated Suns. With the dreaded Draconis Combine fast approaching, the local Prime Minister issued laws that stripped any individual of Asian heritage of their personal property, with the paper-thin justification being that they had a higher probability of spying for Liao or Kurita. This was indicative of a growing wave of racism born primarily from fear that was permeating throughout the Davian realm. The new laws led to a widespread and long-lasting purge in which countless innocents were killed because of their ethnicity. Only the intervention of the First Prince and the post-schism New Avalon Catholic Church restored a nervous peace. The deaths were all the more senseless as Thrawn lay in the warpath and was taken by the dragon within the year. Even to this day, an anti-Asian sentiment lingers under the surface in some areas of the Federated Sons, though to discuss it openly is often met with derision. After a few years of rebuilding, the Lyran Commonwealth was finally ready to resume operations against the Draconis Combine. In the years since he came to power, the Battlemech factories on Hesperus and elsewhere in the Commonwealth had been working flat out to try and match the demand. Like everyone, the LCAF was in decline, but their prodigious industrial output allowed them to found several new regiments during the war, including three for the Arcturan Guards, three for the Donegal Guards, seven new Lyran Regulars, and a second regiment each for the Donegal and Sakhalin Regulars. The exact date that they entered into the roles is lost to history, but the first of them would see action within the year. Duke Kelswar's first offensive in charge of the Kiritan Front would also prove to be his last. It began promisingly enough with raids on Dieron and Styx and a successful liberation of Skondia, but things took a turn when Kelswar accompanied his Tamar Tigers on a deep raid against Benjamin. As the capital of a powerful military district, it would most likely host a large garrison, but spies reported that the system had actually been stripped bare so that those troops might be better used against the Federated Sons. Unfortunately for Steiner, those spies were actually members of the Combine's internal security force and were feeding them false information. They waited until the Tigers were entering the atmosphere before they sprang their trap. A trio of destroyers overwhelmed the Lyran warships and then destroyed the jump ships too, stranding Kelspar on planet. There, he discovered that far from being deserted, Benjamin was still home to three mech and twelve conventional regiments. His own battle mechs leapt from the dropships before touching down and dispersed into the countryside, evading capture for the time being. However, those same spies now reported back to the Commonwealth that there had been no survivors of the ambush. The Duke of Kars was on his own. Begrudgingly, Richard was forced to reinstate his uncle Paul as commander of the Kiritan Theatre. Over the next two years, the Draconis Combine was able to take advantage of the rivalry between the Archon and the General of the Armies, allowing them to seize another four systems from Haus Steiner and destroy one of their mercenary regiments, even as they closed in on New Avalon. 2795 saw the rise of one of the Capellan Confederation's great wartime leaders, Duke of Sirius and Prefect of the Tikhonov Commonality, Sandal Quinn. As the Draconis Combine drew nearer to their ultimate goal, they passed by the Chesterton worlds that bordered the Liao state. Such planets were of little interest to them, but far more historically significant to the Confederation. 
The AFFS had little in the region to repel them as they continued to fortify their capital. The only new unit to appear in that corner of the front was Belinda's Irregulars a couple of years prior. Another mercenary brigade entering service with the Federated Sons in 2795 was the Fighting Urukai, but they were desperately needed elsewhere. Quinn didn't have the authority to bypass the Stratahios, but instead called upon the mercenaries of the region to conduct his private war. He also raised a new brigade from scratch, the Chesterton Voltigeurs. In April, his assault began with landings on Castleton and Mirag. After securing those systems in the name of Tikhonov, the Duke next took aim at Farwell and Demeter that August. The Ariana Grenadiers aided him in his attack on the home of the Arcadian Cuirassiers. Their first outing since the disastrous campaign on Tirfing had almost destroyed the regiment. Farwell fell after just a few weeks, while the garrison on Demeter held out for four months. Losing the Tamar Tigers on Benjamin halted whatever plans the Lyran Commonwealth Armed Forces had made for 2795. Once again, the only commander making moves that year was Ada Kasseldorf. Beginning in September, he launched raids against Kamenz and Tilarska and drove the Marek militia off Lohburg by the end of November. The Free Wells League, meanwhile, was still anticipating a counter-attack from the Capellan Confederation, fortifying the world seized from Liao. The Callaway Lancer's Planetary Guard, who had seen action during the ill-fated Second Strike by Task Force Devlin, pulled together to form a new mercenary regiment in service to House Marek. The Chancellor and her Stratahios were indeed drawing up plans for a liberation campaign, aimed at both the Duchy of Andurian and the Cori Salient. They began by taking Berenson, the first league planet to fall to the Capellans since Zion at the war's outset. Any further ambitions the Confederation had went up in smoke, however, as on November 18th, Barbara Liao passed away from a rare blood disorder. Her 12-year-old granddaughter, Ilsa Liao, was next in line to the throne. At the dawn of 2796, Jinjiro Kirita's campaign against the Federated Sons was reaching a crescendo. In the last three years, they had taken a further 19 worlds from the Crucis March, destroying three more AFFS regiments, and were now only a single jump from their ultimate objective, New Avalon. As the homeworld of House Davian and the centre of what at one time was considered the strongest of the successor states, the planet was heavily defended. A series of reconnaissance missions early in the year revealed the scale of the challenge that lay ahead. Nevertheless, the Draconis Combine was poised and ready to strike. When Coordinator Minoru Kirita called for a three-month halt to the campaign, he did so over the express wishes of his son Jinjiro. Any delay at this stage only gave Davian more time to prepare, the Warlord of Galadin argued. Historians have proposed many fanciful ideas as to why Minoru paused the advance such as giving Davian a final chance to ready themselves being in line with his personal code of Bushido, to the suggestion that the 91-year-old coordinator had simply grown tired of the killing. The reality is likely less romantic. The battle for New Avalon would almost certainly become the longest and bloodiest of the succession wars so far. Minoru believed that it was vital that his troops were adequately rested before commencing the operation, and that the Combine supply lines were secure. Several insurrections still raged within occupied territory, and an opportunistic strike at New Roads in January had caused further disruption. In Kiritan society, each aspect of the state is reflected by one of five pillars – gold, ivory, steel, teak and jade. Ivory, for example, represented both religion and philosophy, and through them, purity and harmony. For decades, it had been the tradition of the elite Sword of Light Brigade to adopt one of these pillars as their moniker. The 6th Sword Regiment was known as the Ivory Dragon, and together with their coordinator, they were headed towards the embattled world of Kintari IV, arriving in June. The AFFS Regiment on planet had spent years operating behind enemy lines, defeating every attempt the garrison forces made to catch them. The arrival of Minoru's elites looked as if it would turn the tables, 
and by early August, the Crucis Lancers had been cornered within the Carmelite Mountains. The Coordinator found the natural beauty of the region captivating, and so while the majority of his force closed on their suspected location, Minoru dismounted to contemplate the stunning vistas before him. From a vantage point above the town, the successor lord was being watched by Sergeant Latha Pistel of the AFFS. He had no idea who his target was, other than someone important based off his personal bodyguard and the presence of a Buddhist monk. Not knowing the consequences of his actions, the sniper took the shot, and on August 9th, 2786, Minoru Kirita was killed on Kintari 4. The Draconis Combine mustard soldiery exploded into activity. When the Fedsun's Department of Military Intelligence deciphered some of these communications, they were shocked to learn what had happened. They understood full well that the death of Minoru meant his son would take up his mantle. They feared what sort of retribution an enraged Jinjiro would unleash. Acting to prevent the extermination of so loyal a unit, jump ships were dispatched from Sonya to collect the cruiser's lances, evacuating most of the survivors of a years-long resistance campaign on August 28th. When word reached Jinjiro's headquarters that his father had been killed, his aide dispatched a lowly talon sergeant to tell him the terrible news, certain that the first man who approached would be cut to pieces. Instead, Jinjiro thanked him for his honesty, and commanded his deputy to commit seppuku for his cowardice. He departed for Kintari at once, flanked by the second Sword of Light, the Steel Dragon, representing the military might of the Draconis Combine. When he arrived on September 11th, 2796, he gathered the assembled officers on World, and gave what is perhaps the most infamous order of the Succession Wars. Kill them all. Any who refused were summarily executed themselves. The DCMS began by rounding up the entire population of Karinda City over two days, herding them into the Central Park, and then opening fire on the mass of civilians. A hundred thousand were gunned down in just a few minutes. From there, they spread out across the planet's surface, bringing death and destruction to every major city and town on Kintari. At first, the Combine soldiers went about the slaughter dispassionately, waiting for word from Jinjiro that enough blood had been spilled. They reasoned with themselves that because the killer of the Coordinator had fled, they had left the civilians to take their place on the Executioner's block. When days turned to weeks turned to months, and still the carnage had not ended, those same soldiers took on a different mindset. Some began to waver in their duty, a few even risking their lives to hide survivors. Any who were discovered to be concealing prisoners were killed by the new coordinator's personal guard, the Otomo. But many others took to treating the locals as vermin to be exterminated, and grew ever more brutal in their methods. By year's end, supplies and munitions had been virtually exhausted. Morale was in tatters, soldiers were committing all sorts of atrocities on any Kintarans they stumbled upon, and yet still Jinjiro did not relent. The officers took to killing civilians by hand, using their once ceremonial swords to behead innocents by the hundreds if not thousands. The deaths also spread to the roles of the Draconis Combine as many were so shamed by their own actions, they could no longer live with themselves. The once proud ivory dragon, which had represented the spirituality and ethics of House Kirita, had been permanently and irreparably tarred by the events unfolding. In the new year, the unit was disbanded, and those who didn't abandon the Combine altogether were folded into the reformed First Sword of Light. Jinjiro seemed to revel in the carnage, attending many of the executions in person, and forbidding those present to use any means but the sword to dispatch their victims. Even the pleading of the Buddhist monk who had been witness to his father's death did not move him, except to reach for his own sword so that he could cut the man down. Eventually, it proved too much for some of his enraged staff to bear. The Comstar administrator had been under house arrest at their HBG station since the genocide began cut off from events beyond his walls. In early 2797, the defecting crew of one of Kurita's mobile HQs leaked footage of the massacre to them. 
Comstar then spread news of events on Kentari across the network. The citizens of the Inner Sphere, who were mostly kept in the dark about the brutality of the raging conflict, were utterly appalled at the barbarity of House Curita, none more so than those within the Federated Sons. More than any other event in the past ten years of fighting, Kintari galvanized the populace. They could not tolerate even one more world falling to the dragon, and unrest within the occupied system skyrocketed. Remember Kintari became the watchword of a thousand resistance movements. The Draconis Combine mustered soldiery were as shocked as everyone else. The involvement of the Ivory and Steel Dragon seemed a personal affront to their honour. Morale within the DCMS crumbled at what should have been their finest hour, the anticipated capture of New Avalon. The question, of course, is why the Kintari Massacre caused such outrage. By this point in the First Succession War, tens of billions had already died either as a result of nuclear, biological or chemical weapons, or from the collapse of the planetary environment that followed. As mentioned, the intelligence agencies and propaganda divisions within each realm were careful to restrict how much information was out there, but rumours of dead or abandoned worlds were fairly common by this point. The answer lies in how the actual killing was carried out. Not once during the Kintari massacre were weapons of mass destruction used to eradicate the populace. Jinjiro flat out forbade their use. It's this last point that makes the Kintari massacre such an infamous event in human history. The fact that the brutal slaughter was carried out by thousands of individuals and not at the press of a button elevated it above other war crimes. Having video evidence of the atrocity made it all the more real for those watching and further fueled the indignation. The coordinator Jinjiro Kirita left Kintari on February 15th, 2797 to resume command at the front. In the five months of carnage that unfolded under his watchful eye, approximately 90% of the planet's population was wiped out, either by gunshot, sword, or under the mechanical foot of an unfeeling battle mech. 52 million were dead. Barbara Liao's sudden and unexpected death left a gaping void in the Capellan Confederation government. Both of her sons had been killed during the Callaway debacle, leaving only her granddaughter Ilsa in the direct line of succession. Normally after the death of a chancellor, the commonality prefects would meet on Cyan to confirm the heir as their new head of state. There was no talk of usurping House Liao, but Ilsa, not even yet a teenager, was clearly too young to rule. The decision was made to elect the Duke of Sirius, Sandor Quinn, as Chancellor Regent until Ilsa reached her majority. While Quinn's campaign against the Chesterton Worlds had won him popular support, as the prefect of the Tikhonov commonality, his interests lay solely in that region of space. The counter-offensives Barbara and the Stratahios had been planning against the Free Worlds League fell by the wayside, as the Chancellor Regent focused on his ongoing battle against Taos Davian. With Seacaf reinforcements arriving in April to secure the captured systems, the Liao Lancers were dispatched to conquer the last Fed Suns holdouts on the path to Terra, the former hegemony planets of Kaf and Den of Katos. The Spinwood attack group moved on to Sanilac, taking the world two months later. Quinn's mercenaries then seized Sonya in October, further expanding the Chesterton commonality after a one-month battle. Sporadic fighting continued within the Bolan Thumb, with the Lyrans launching raids against Ilion, Marsal, and Talarska. They also moved against Kamens, the fanatic defenders again fighting to the bitter end. The planet was finally secure come January, by which point news was filtering in from across the Inner Sphere. For starters, the Oberon Confederation, one of the remnants of the old Rimwell's Republic, had collapsed. The Lyran Intelligence Corps had been working to destabilize various warlords operating out of the ruins of the Republic, 
and the breakup of the Oberon worlds was their greatest coup, giving Steiner one less thing to worry about on their periphery border. Reports that other remnants of the older Mattis Empire had come together to form Edom's bandits entering service with the Free Worlds League also reached Steiner's desk. Furthermore, word of Minoru Kulita's death reached the Archon. This was both a blessing and a curse. The coordinator had been despised within the Commonwealth, but his son Jinjiro was by all accounts even worse. The only saving grace was that he appeared to be fully committed to exterminating House Davian, and barely spared a thought for his Lyran neighbour. Throughout the latter half of 2796 and into the next year, the reserve units within the Draconis Combine Mustard Soldiery were busy carrying out the final orders of their deceased coordinator, Minoru. Several new commands had been raised in preparation for the assault on New Avalon, and some of these would soon see action for the first time there. To prevent any sort of encirclement from Davian troops within what was left of the Draconis March, they pushed out in a spinward direction, taking more territory in the Fairfax and Kestrel combat regions, and even moved into the Woodbine operational area adjacent to the Outworlds Alliance. No one knew it at the time, but this would be the high watermark for the entire campaign. As word of the Kintari massacre began to reach the troops on the front line, they were shocked into immobility. The news from the Capellan front was equally disastrous for House Davian. Sandal Quinn continued his mercenary first regular second strategy to take Taos in June. That same year, the Chancellor Regent launched an audacious new offensive out of the St. Ives commonality, establishing two salients deep into the Federated Suns, even reaching as far as the New Avalon combat region. The Certis Fusiliers attempted to counterattack at Ogilvy, but were beaten back by the Chevaux Leger. By October, accounts of the Cantari massacre had spread across the Inner Sphere. The reaction among the soldiers of the AFFS was the same as it was for civilians of their realm – disgust and fury. Not waiting for orders from the First Prince or High Command, those units stationed on Godrich lashed out at the neighbouring Logandale and Marlette. Davian had not successfully liberated a single world from the dragon up to this point in the war, but whipped into a frenzy by the awful news coming from Cantari IV, they successfully pushed the demoralised DCMS off well that November. The same unsanctioned attacks occurred at Bristol soon after, and then Delavan and Odell in December. John Davian and his son Joshua were on nearby Ipava, making their own plans for a coordinated counter-offensive in early December. They were pleased to hear of the destruction of a pair of Draconis Combine Admiralty destroyers at Delavan, their initial target, from the spontaneous assaults of loose cannons within their armed forces. Giving tacit approval to the initiative shown by their commanders, the two hoped to support the attack and reclaim the worlds for the Federated Sons. Their fleeting hope of victory turned to ash when the First Prince and his heir were assassinated at their field base on December 9th, 2797. Who hired the assassin remains a mystery to this day. The most obvious culprits are Jinjiro Kirita or Sandal Quinn, but other fringe possibilities include members of the Federated Sons military or government, Comstar, or even relatives within House Davian who hope to gain power themselves. Ultimately, whatever destabilizing effect their death might have been predicted to have did not come to be, as the 19-year-old Paul Davian ascended to the throne and would prove in time to be one of the realm's greatest leaders. As an aside, John's death also left Kenyon the Eagle as the last of the Star League era successor lords. 2798 got underway with the capture of Ulaanbaatar in January by Blanford's Grenadiers, the premier unit of the Tikhonov commonality. Sandal Quinn himself visited the front the following month to award his troops with medals for their excellent performance and conduct during the campaign. Sandal was adamant that to have any hope of winning the support of the lost Chesterton worlds, his troops mustn't use weapons of mass destruction. Later that year, his army would capture the planets Everett and Goshen, and even dared to seize Shadar from the Draconis Combine. The Chancellor Regent's reserved, even gentlemanly conduct was very out of character for the First Succession War, 
perhaps only mirrored by Hasseldorf's Boland campaign. On that front, Lyran troops landed on Talarska in March, reclaiming the world after a three-month battle. Elsewhere on the front, Paul Steiner continued his ineffectual raiding campaign along the rest of the Commonwealth's borders. After becoming First Prince, Paul Davian immediately went about strengthening his position at home. Over the course of a three-year period known as the Reformation, he would transform the way the Federated Sons was governed. In the era of the Star League, whenever the First Lord had visited the Davian capital, he had been granted several honorary powers under the title of Duke of New Avalon. When Paul's grandfather John had proclaimed himself the new First Lord at the onset of the Succession Wars, he had also unwittingly assumed that same ducal position. Paul was the first to see just how significant that could be in the governance of his realm. The first power it gave him was the right to call or dismiss any meeting of the High Council, as well as speak first at those meetings. While these abilities were largely meaningless to a Cameron ruler who might only make a couple of visits in their lifetime, it was an enormous boon to the Davian First Prince. He had effectively gained the ability to completely circumvent his own government and rule as an absolute monarch should he choose. House Cameron had also been given dominion over 30 backwater systems. In exchange for lending the funds to develop the fledgling colonies, they would become his personal holdings for a short period, until they were self-sufficient and exchanged for a new batch. When the relationship between the two families cooled after the Second Hidden War, the practice largely died off, during which time some of these planets became economic powerhouses. They were now part of Paul Davian's personal fief. Coupled with his right as First Prince to grant knighthoods and landholds, he could partition out or sell off these wealthy provinces to secure whatever funding or support he needed. Meanwhile, the impromptu raids continued along the front. Between February and October, the AFFS succeeded in driving the Curitans off Arcadia, Coloma, Saginaw and Strawn. With their loss, the Draconis Combine could no longer reach New Avalon in just a single jump. Paul was quick to congratulate his military on their success, winning support among their ranks. He urged them to treat any POWs with respect, a move that coupled with the collapsing morale among the ranks of the mustard soldiery, led many units to surrender without a fight. Disappointed in the performance of the Department of Military Intelligence, Paul Davian demanded that any information gathered from defecting Curitans be sent back to him personally. He used this wealth of intel to establish a new civilian intelligence agency, the Ministry of Information, Intelligence and Operations. With Paul offering generous rewards and even land grants, the MIIO quickly established itself as one of the most efficient spy networks within the Inner Sphere, returning Davian's investment tenfold. Within the Draconis Combine, one of the Star League's most famous units was having a crisis of conscience. The Eridani Light Horse had remained behind when Alexander Kerensky led the SLDF into exile, maintaining a watchful vigil from their home base on Trondheim. When word of the Kintari massacre reached them, Ezra Bradley and his other colonels could no longer sit idle as the inner sphere collapsed into chaos around them. On June 5th, Bradley declared that they would be leaving the Combine and taking up service as mercenaries within the Free Worlds League. The coordinator had been courting the Eridani Light Horse for years, even before Kerensky's exodus. To lose them now would have been a major blow. Col de Giro, the planetary administrator for Sendai, home of the 151st Light Horse, suspected that Jinjiro Kirita would see him killed if he allowed them to depart and so took drastic action to prevent that from happening. On the 13th of June, he took the families of the 50th Heavy Cavalry and 8th Recon Battalions hostage, just as they were preparing to lift off. He gave the unit 72 hours to return, or else he would execute his prisoners. On the 16th, with the Eridani Light Horse still heading for the jump point, he went through with his threat. In a fit of rage, the battalion commanders went against orders and returned to Sendai. 
Over the course of a week, they devastated any and all Combine soldiers they came across and ruined several cities in the bargain. Those responsible were either killed outright or captured, only to face a firing squad soon after, including Col de Giro. Comstar further cemented their reputation as saviours among the common people by helping to evacuate 12,000 civilians during the battle. With vengeance extracted, the Eridani Lightors resumed their journey towards the Free Worlds League. The unbridled attacks undertaken by Davian troops in the immediate aftermath of the Kintari massacre tapered off in 2799 as supplies began to run out. Increasingly, the raiders were returning after a defeat, though Paul was sure to prioritise his most successful units for resupply first. In the last two months of 2798, AWFS units acting on their own initiative made landfall on Bremond and Tancredi, driving the Combine off early in the new year, just as others moved to reclaim Fairfax in March. The regional capital was successfully liberated after a gruelling six-month battle. Meanwhile, the garrison on Chesterton were busy preparing for the worst, fortifying their positions and building up stores to outlast a siege. They were quite surprised when the first Liao ships appeared in the system, carrying not an invasion force, but emissaries from the Chancellor Regent. Sandal Quinn had them effectively surrounded. Though he had the necessary forces to take the planet, it would be an enormously costly battle for both sides, not to mention the planet itself. Sandal was prepared to accept their surrender on generous terms. The Davian commander, uncowed by the threat of his imminent destruction, made his position clear. If the Seacath landed on Chesterton, he would unleash his full arsenal of WMDs in mutually assured destruction. Not willing to render such a symbolic prize inhospitable, Quinn instead ordered his forces to maintain a blockade. Taking little interest in events around Chesterton, or any military affairs for that matter, was Ilsa Liao. The only brief action she saw was a two-month service with the Red Lancers on Mirak. Privately, this suited Quinn just fine. While a loyal supporter of House Liao, he was quite content to be a wartime leader, commanding his forces from the front while his teenage wards built up a power base of her own among the nobility back on Cyan. The Duke of Sirius had become, and would likely remain, the de facto head of the Capellan Confederation Armed Forces long after Ilsa had taken over as head of state. Throughout his term in office, the Chancellor Regent had used his commonality's enormous industrial output to expand the armed forces considerably. The number of units under his command peaked in 2799, with the creation of nine new regiments, split between several brigades. Additionally, the Confederation hired the services of Narhal's raiders, veterans of the Starleaf Civil War from both sides of the conflict. Unfortunately for Quinn, the AWFS scuppered his plan to starve Chesterton of support when an unsanctioned attack on Sanilac became the first battle to liberate one of the Capellan Games during the First Succession War. 2799 was the year when Commandant General Hasseldorf's Bolan campaign finally ran out of steam. After taking Marsal earlier in the year, the conquest of Ilion could only go ahead with additional support from mercenaries. Even still, it bogged down so badly that his commanders were forced to use tactical warheads to win the day, at the cost of both his marks and the viability of the planet. In the last few years, the Lyrans had also taken a pair of systems closer to Terra. Thaddeus Maddox set about reconquering the first of these in 2799. His attack on Alula Australis was so swift that the defending mercenaries did not have a chance to escape off-world when the Madakair arrived with overwhelming force. To protect the region from further Steiner aggression, another new province was formed, the Border Protectorate. They adopted the stranded mercenaries as their provincial forces, the Steel Guards, and later incorporated the existing Iron Guards as their own too. The Draconis Combine had continued to chip away at the Lyran Commonwealth in what had become a secondary front for both parties. The most significant event to occur happened in November 2799, when the field command post on Lamar, the General of the Army's Paul Steiner, was hit by a nuclear strike. 
Publicly, the Archon was greatly angered by the death of his uncle, but privately he might have thanked the Kiritans responsible. Unfortunately, Richard didn't have many better officers to replace him, turning to the underwhelming Amanda Lestrade to take over command of the LCAF. She was able to win back three of the worlds the dragon had taken in the last few years, but otherwise scaled back her predecessor's raiding campaign. Her only notable achievement in the following years was a raid on the industrial New Oslo, which destroyed the Razalhaeg regulars in garrison. Things started to turn against the Capellan Confederation at the turn of the century. As the Draconis Combine had advanced, and the two nations had seized large chunks of the Terran hegemony, they developed a shared border. Minoru Kirita had rejected Barbara Liao's proposal for an alliance, but the two had not directly engaged each other beyond light probing raids until Sandal Quinn moved on Shadar. The DCMS now hit back at Ronald, securing the planet for the dragon after a short one-month campaign. For the second time in the war, the Ariana Grenadiers were virtually wiped out. Another wild AFFS strike landed on Tawas in July, liberating the planet in September, just as the Dieron regulars made another strike at Rio. This time, at least, the Capellans were able to push them back a month later. After taking over as General of the Armies, Amanda Lestrade set about making her mark on the Lyran Commonwealth Armed Forces. To take some of the initiative back, she brought the stealths over to the Curitan Front, and also hired another mercenary regiment for deep strikes. One of her first changes was to broaden the list of viable targets for raids to include civilian life support structures, such as water purifiers, weather stabilizers, and atmospheric processors. The LIC was quick to create propaganda that included examples of enemy strikes at similar infrastructure within the Commonwealth to whitewash the extreme tactic. In November, word reached the Archon of a shocking revelation. Duke Graham Kelswar and his Tamar Tigers had survived the botch raid on Benjamin and had spent the last six years conducting a guerrilla campaign out of the mountains. An investigation revealed that early unsubstantiated reports had been covered up by Paul Steiner, possibly as a means to prevent his rival's return to the Commonwealth. Unfortunately, the Archon could not in good reason order a rescue operation that stood such little chance of success. The news reached them just two months before the Tamar Hazars made their final stand. Infiltrating the capital city and partnering with several criminal elements within, the last company of the Tigers were able to hold off repeated attempts to root them out for almost a week. By the battle's end, the city was in ruins, and a full regiment of the DCMS had been destroyed. Ilse Liao's 18th birthday was fast approaching as 2801 began. Some have suggested that the Chancellor Regent considered fighting to retain his office, but such a move would never have had the support of the Capellan government. Instead, he made preparations for the handover. The troops within the two salients pushing out of St. Ives were recalled and the worlds given back to Davian. Elsewhere, the CCAF was ordered to hunker down while the transition occurred. On April 19th, Sandal Quinn stepped down to become strategic military advisor, while Ilse Liao took up the reins as Chancellor, leading the Capellan Confederation into a new era. First Prince Paul Davian had spent the initial three years of his reign overhauling his government, his military, and his intelligence networks. The Reformation, as this turbulent time had become known, came to an end in February 2801, after which Davian began making preparations for a serious counter-offensive against the rampaging Draconis Combine. The resurgent armed forces of the Federated Sons had already won a number of minor victories through random strikes along the front, but Paul developed a more cohesive strategy for them to follow. While he would take to the field to inspire his soldiers to greater heroism, command of the actual ground operations mostly fell to his uncle, Thomas Holder Davian. 
That February, the AWFS left Logandale and headed for their first target, Kintari 4. With them were the 7th Crucis Lancers, who sought to avenge the massacre that had happened on their watch. When they arrived, they found the DCMS garrison in disarray. For the past four years, a small guerrilla force left behind during the initial evacuation had been making their lives hell. The arrival of several Davian regiments promptly ended the fighting that April. Reclaiming such a symbolic world did wonders for Paul's reputation within the Fed Sons. To reward his efforts, the First Prince elevated Colonel Alexander Dressari to the position of Duke of Kintari. On the opposite side of the Inner Sphere, the LCAF were again intensifying their raids within the Bolan Thumb and seized the relatively undefended Hertzberg system in July. The mood along the Kiritan Theatre was decidedly less hopeful, as the Dragon had claimed another four systems and destroyed one of their regiments in the process. The Combine could not celebrate these victories, as the AFFS continued to roll forward throughout the year. Even before Kantari fell, Davian forces moved on to secondary targets in March. The last was secured in November, but by this point another wave had been launched the previous month. Another six of their conquests were liberated by year's end. 2802 followed more or less the same pattern. Each victory boosted the morale of the AFFS and damaged that of the DCMS. Jinjiro Kirita resorted to ever more brutal disciplinary actions on his failing commands, but this only cemented their unwillingness to fight. Many officers were so ashamed by how easily they were defeated that they chose to commit seppuku. Those that didn't were interrogated by their captors. Reports from the front were now flowing smoothly back to the Davian intelligence agencies providing them with further information on Kiritan deployments. This allowed their scarce naval assets to isolate the worlds with the heaviest garrisons and strike where the line was weakest. Another six worlds were liberated in 2802, and they were making landfall on four more by year's end. The Woodbine operational area was now totally back under their control. The Draconis Combine was also suffering attacks from the Capellan Confederation. Ronald was apprised that Liao did not wish to give up so easily and made several attempts to reclaim it during the first five years of the 29th century. They were somewhat troubled to find that elements of the Ariana Grenadiers left behind after their initial loss had come together to form a mercenary battalion fighting for Kirita. The Combine struck back by launching an attack on Lincoln. Elements of the Northwind Highlanders on Weld were still recuperating from repelling a Marrick assault on Zion, a battle that saw them destroy rival mercenary regiment Gladstone's Gladiators. Seeing off Damien's destroyers and their regular support proved a greater challenge, one that continued into the new year. In 2802, the Lyrans reclaimed two of the systems lost to House Marrick during the first years of the war. Both had been heavily scarred by the use of WMDs during the initial invasion. With their loss, the Free World's foothold within the Ilarian province became extremely tenuous. 2802 was also a landmark year for Comstar. In March, they announced that for the first time, the organization was no longer in the red. Jerome Blake's decision to chase profits had come at the expense of several systems, however. Comstar had prioritised whatever worlds were most likely to bring in revenue, either through their population or their strategic position. Several systems within the former hegemony had been largely abandoned, unable to call in aid or supplies. The periphery especially, whom Blake held personally responsible for the Star League Civil War, was particularly hard hit. Nevertheless, approximately 40% of the Inner Sphere was now serviced by a Comstar HBG, and the number of hyperpulse generators would continue to grow even as the succession wars raged around them. The Federated Sons and Lyran Commonwealth were once again the only factions making moves in 2803. The AFFS was still riding the wave, securing their winter conquests and then taking four more systems in the summer before launching yet another pair of invasions by year's end. The Leiden conquests within the Bolan Thumb that year would prove to be the last of Hasseldorf's private campaign. 
Significant use of weapons of mass destruction on Malazan meant very few of the FWLM forces on World escaped to reinforce their compatriots on a crux. Like Roche before it, the devastation was so great that Steiner ultimately decided the colony was a lost cause, ceding the wasteland back to the League. The defenders on Finsterwalde were quick to resort to the same tactics, only this time the results were far more costly for the LCAF. When the Lyran Guards touched down, they were hit by successive WMD strikes, obliterating the regiment. Worse, the last of the corvettes the Commandant General had access to were hit by aerospace fighter-launched nuclear missiles. With no means to escort his units to their next destination, the Archon ordered Hasseldorf to call off his offensive. For his successes, he was made a Baron of Kaumberg and promoted to General. How Steiner formally declared a victory over the Free Worlds League and considered the Bolan Thumb to be reclaimed by the Lyran Commonwealth. The last few Matic holdouts were in an untenable position and would surely wither on the vine. Elsewhere in the realm, the pirates known as Cameron's Curse, once Amaris regulars who had deserted their emperor as Kerensky closed on Terra, accepted a contract with Haus Steiner as the rebranded Raymond's Redcoats. Turning his attention towards his other opponent, Steiner ordered a raid against the former Terran hegemony provincial capital of Lone Star. Their primary targets were the atmospheric processors that allowed the planet to maintain a breathable atmosphere, themselves only a necessity after an earlier Kiritan bioweapon was unleashed in an effort to make the population capitulate. This led to a terminal environmental collapse, and with civilian jumpships now a rarity, eventually the starvation and death of tens or perhaps even hundreds of millions on world. Elsewhere in the ruins of the hegemony, a Draconis Combine salvage team arrived at the dead world of Inglesmond, tombed to more than 4 billion individuals. Despite Comstar reports that there were no survivors, they were shocked to find that one of the continents housed a large group of survivors, numbering around 1 million. Initial efforts to steal anything of value met with resistance from a battalion of mechs taken from an SLDF supply cache. As if in rejection of the native population's incredible determination to survive, the Combine again unleashed their strategic arsenal and finished what their predecessors started. One final tragedy in the planet's sad legacy. On January 19th, 2804, Captain General Kenyon Maddock suffered a fatal heart attack. The Free World's Parliament called a session to discuss who would become the next Captain General. While the Eagles campaign against the Capellan Confederation had been fantastically successful, in the last decade of his life, the exhausted military had been unable to make much progress, taking only Christiansen from the Tikhonov lances in the previous three years. His sole surviving descendant, Thaddeus, had proven himself unable to score many victories against the Lyran Commonwealth. At the time of his father's death, he was busy launching another attack on Alhina, Resolution 288 had given Kenyon supreme authority within the League, but his death meant the Marek family was no longer in control. Thaddeus's campaign on Alhina concluded just three days later, at which point he immediately departed for Atreus to stake his claim. Unfortunately, his flagship suffered a jump drive malfunction en route, stranding the Marek air at Rasalus until alternate transportation could be found. When he finally made it back to the capital in July, he found Parliament was ready to remove him from power. Thaddeus argued that because his father had never renounced Resolution 288, and since the First Succession War was still raging, the law was clearly still in effect. As his heir, he was entitled to all the powers Kenyon had wielded. The ministers were unconvinced, and two-thirds of them decided to walk out in protest only to come face to face with a company of loyal Marek battlemechs. With a gun pointed to their head, most returned to their seats in order to affirm Thaddeus as Captain General. The following month, the Grand Duke of Orient Carter Allison and his allies from the Duchy of Orloff arrived on Atreus to have their say. They were vehemently opposed to the blatant political bullying and would not give Thaddeus their support. Maddock had nevertheless achieved sufficient backing to become the new head of state. 
his first act was to withdraw the Free Wells League military from House Allison's territory. The strong alliance that had existed between the two families since the nation's founding more than five centuries ago was broken. The Capellan Stratahios immediately moved to take advantage of the political infighting within the League. Their shared border had been more or less static for over a decade by this point, but as soon as the FWLM departed, the CCAF swept in to retake three of their lost worlds in September. They now prepared for an assault on the provincial capital. Davian's counteroffensive was still going strong in 2804, though progress had somewhat slowed. Between February and December, they liberated only two more systems, moving on another pair towards the end of the year. On the other fronts, exhaustion coupled with a lack of transports meant there was very little movement. In late December, a Capellan task force appeared within the Orient system and began moving towards the capital. Their objective was to spend a month on the ground, causing as much damage to the planet as they could, then withdraw before the Captain General could send in reinforcements. What little space defences Carter Allison had left were sent into action, alongside hastily conscripted civilian dropships. Their near-suicidal actions, as well as fire from the anti-capital ship emplacements on the surface, did succeed in destroying a third of the raiders, but enough had made landfall to set ablaze several industrial sites and cities before Colonel Moretta called for a retreat off-world. At the time, the survivors of the raid believed that they had only just escaped before Marek could extract retribution, but the Mashkarovka soon realised that the only League redeployments that were taking place in the region were provincial forces moving within the Grand Duchy. The Captain General was far more interested in the Lyran Theatre, which he had been commanding since 2789. In March, he launched an attack on Bella, pushing the Donegal Guards back two months later. This was a key part of his strategy to draw the LCAF away from a crux as the FWLM prepared for a breakout. Ilsa Liao was shocked at how Thaddeus had left his ally out on a limb. With seemingly no help coming to House Allison, she moved to take Fujidera in April and liberated a pair of systems within the salient jutting into the Sana commonality, after which they prepared for a full invasion of Orient. Moretta returned to the enemy capital in June, leading many of the same units into battle. This time, they stayed well out of range of the surface emplacements, instead dispatching commando teams to bring them down so that their warships might move into firing positions overhead. Their plan quickly went awry when a blizzard developed over their intended targets, forcing the Liao colonel to rush all of his attacks. Most of the nuclear missile silos were eliminated, but it came at the cost of more than half of his aerospace fighters. With barely any air cover and visibility failing fast, any hope of victory the Capellans had deserted them when an artillery strike hit their command compound, killing Moretta. Through pure luck, Orient was given a reprieve when the invasion's second-in-command called for a withdrawal. In their anger at having failed to take the planet, the Liao Corvettes made an attack run on the major cities, bombarding the world before departing back to Confederation space. Millions of Orient citizens had been killed, and Carter Allison was forced to concede defeat. The capture of Fletcher in July made it clear that the Capellans would be returning to finish the job. He departed for Atreus to humbly beg for Thaddeus' help before a third attack on his homeworld could be launched. Davian's counteroffensive maintained their momentum throughout 2805, liberating two worlds between April and December, moving on to another three by the end of the year. Among their new targets were Elbar and Cartago, two planets that Minoru Kirita had hit in the opening month of the invasion. This next batch of systems was secured early in the following year. Word of Carter Allison's flight from his Grand Duchy reached Ilsa Liao and Thaddeus Marek at the same time. Both began hurried preparations to move forces onto Orient. Predicting that the Duke surely intended to request aid, the Captain General sent a strike force from the Principality of Regulus, including units from the recently expanded Regulan Hussars, towards Fletcher and Fujidera, but diverted them when he received the news that a Capellan fleet had already arrived at Orient. 
After dispatching the meagre defences at the Zenith on September 18th, the Capellans made landfall on October 6th and promptly set about securing their priority targets. The battle for the capital city began in mid-November, just as the FWLM reinforcements were arriving. The three largest Matic warships jumped to a pilot point in orbit above the planet, directly on top of the Liao squadron. Despite their numbers advantage, the Confederation warships were short on tonnage and still bearing scars from the prior battles over Orient. All but one was destroyed at the cost of just a single League cruiser. With complete orbital supremacy established, the League task force began landing on December 18th. Four mech and 12 conventional regiments spread out across the planet's surface to secure industrial and military targets, then gathered together for the attack on the capital. The CCAF had dug in and were not above using tactical nukes to hold off an advance. Most of the city was ruined by the time the last survivors finally surrendered on January 7th. The victory at Orient revitalised the weary Free Wells League military. In March, they moved to reclaim four of the worlds Ilsa had taken in her path towards Orient, driving them off by year's end. Thaddeus's main focus remained the Lyran front, however, and so even before his counterattack against Liao began, he advanced on Radostov in February. The goal was to find the path of least resistance to connect the regiments stranded on Okrux with the rest of the realm. With only militia to defend it, Radostov belonged to Marek by May. But the League didn't have much cause to celebrate, as Haussteiner had already launched a counterattack on Bella one month earlier. This had been one of the Captain General's main objectives in the region, so to take it from him in just two months, only a year after his initial victory at Bella, was a major embarrassment. But the Lyran Commonwealth too could not celebrate. The Draconis Combine had been picking at the Commonwealth with frequent low-level raids, identifying targets for swift invasions. In the past five years, they had taken Al Nazal, Orbison, Buckminster and Vega, the latter two of which would become prefecture capitals in later decades. The cycle of disappointment continued around the Inner Sphere, though. They had failed to take Rio from the Capellans and continued to lose ground on their rimward flank. In the same February to May period that Marek took Radostov, the Federated Sons liberated Sholam and Corridon. With these victories, the Federated Sons finally took a five-month break to move up reinforcements and supplies before moving again in November-December time. 2807 saw the final moves of the Davian counteroffensive before they at long last ran out of energy. In January, they launched an assault on the Curitan forces stationed at Evansville, Roe and Sun Prairie, as well as against the CCAF occupiers at Castleton. They also set about crushing the pockets of DCMS resistance in their reclaimed territory. Both sides were heavily fatigued and the ever-decreasing number of jump ships made maintaining an offensive almost impossible. Paul Davian went so far as to issue specific orders to his naval forces not to destroy enemy jump ships unless unavoidable, a state of affairs that remains in place even today, centuries later. With the completion of these campaigns in June, a quiet settled over the Inner Sphere for the rest of the year. After a brief lull in the fighting, the First Succession War once again flared up in December of 2807, when the Free Wells League made their next step in their plan to rebuild the Bolan Thumb. Descending on Marsal were the two lead units of the Bolan defenders, who made short work of the Lyran garrison, claiming the world as their own by February. Realising that they could not ignore the threat still lurking within the Commonwealth, Lyran High Command redeployed to deal with the Bolan remnants. In May, they countered with an assault on Radostov, liberating the planet once again after a two-month campaign. 2808 is the point that some historians cite as the year when the First Succession War entered its second phase. By this stage, every successor state had exhausted their strategic reserves. 
Most of the shipyards and many of the battle mech factories lay in ruins. Warships and jump ships were extremely scarce. Even ammunition was becoming hard to come by. Conscription was in widespread use in every realm to try and maintain operational numbers. Wave after wave of new recruits were rushed through training, and the cadets being put onto the front lines were younger and younger. One realm that was feeling the hurt from three sides was the Capellan Confederation. The Federated Sons were riding the wave of momentum that swept a path forward, but also threatened to break and turn towards the Confederation. Since the disaster at Orient, the Free Worlds League had reclaimed all of the worlds the Seacaf had only just liberated, and then dispatched their Merrick militia alongside Smithson's Chinese bandits to grab Mozero. The best they could muster in retaliation was a raid on Nova Roma by the Chevaux Leger, and the two would battle on and off over the next five years for control of the planet Ibstock. Their only saving grace was that Thaddeus Merrick remained much more interested in the Lyran Commonwealth than following through on his father's desire to crush House Liao. For the Chancellor, the most pressing concern was the sharp increase in action towards Terra. Their last attempt to retake Ronal in 2805 had failed. Since then, the Draconis Combine had been conducting a side campaign within the former hegemony. In time, they would take another six worlds from the Tikhanov commonality. It was with this threat looming that Chancellor Ilse Liao made one of the most shocking decisions of the Succession Wars. In April 2808, Ilse Liao renounced her claim to the First Lordship. Furthermore, she sent a messenger to First Prince Paul Davian and offered to back his candidacy. The condition for her support was simple, recognize Confederation ownership of the Chesterton Worlds. To the ruling class of the Federated Sons, this incredible offer seemed almost too good to be true. First of all, a cessation of hostilities on the Capellan front would allow them to focus all their energies against the Draconis Combine in the upcoming second offensive Paul was planning. It came at the cost of Chesterton and its subsidiaries, but the truth of the matter was that they were almost all in Confederation hands already, and would take considerable effort to win back. But perhaps even more significant, with Davian and Liao aligned behind the First Prince, all it would take is to win the support of a party neutral to both of them, i.e. the Lyran Commonwealth, to have a voting majority among the former members of the Star League High Council. In June, the Chancellor received Paul's response. The First Prince dispatched the Crucis Lancers to take Ulaanbaatar and then Farwell two months later. His rejection shocked the nobility of both realms and threatened to undermine his newfound popularity at home. Pundits at the time lambasted his arrogance, but the Davian Lord might have realized something that his contemporaries did not, save perhaps Ilse Liao herself. The succession wars were and are a farce. The Star League, if it even still existed at the commencement of the hostilities, had long since faded into memory. The Terran hegemony was gone too. There were only the successor states left, and there was no higher authority that any of the House Lords would recognize anymore. Ilsa's offer to name him First Lord was hollow, an appeal only to vanity and the price was to sacrifice systems that had belonged to the Federated Sons for over 400 years. As 2808 drew to a close, the AFFS was getting ready to launch their second counter-offensive. The goal was twofold. The primary objective was to drive the DCMS out of the Crucis March altogether, while secondary assaults took aim at the extreme flanks of the Draconis March. Troops were assembled on Castleton and Rowe, launching their attack in the first three months of 2809. Nearby, the Crucis Lancers succeeded in capturing Farwell and Ulaanbaatar that march. The Castleton Task Force showed early success, taking the planets Johnsondale and Olancha by mid-year. Included on the list of targets for Davian's campaign were the worlds of Cassius and Udibi, two systems that lay within the pre-war borders of the Draconis Combine. It was the first time a concentrated effort had been made to seize Kiritan territory since the war began. Understandably, this side of the front saw much fiercer resistance compared to the liberation campaigns of the past decade, 
where the locals were only too happy to assist the arriving AFFS. Nevertheless, the planets were secure by year's end. Between October and December, both flanking groups were moving on to secondary targets, while a third task force advanced up the centre, hoping to retake the capital of the Kestrel combat region. In an effort to finally push the Free World's military out of the Eladian province, an assault was made on the fortified stronghold of Akrux in November. Going in at a numbers disadvantage was always going to be a risky gamble, and the Lyrans ultimately had to concede defeat in January. They had more success closer to the border, when they took back Alula Borealis in May 2810. The previous December, the Federated Sons had moved to reclaim Demeter from the Chesterton Commonality, completing the liberation a few months later. The retreating Zurich Lancers were pursued across Algot, Halloran and Uaragon in the early part of 2810, before the AFFS focused instead on Teddybear. Their effort to take the planet turned especially nasty when both sides deployed nuclear weapons. The major settlements on the world were caught in the blast, after which the viability of the planet collapsed. Fighting ended in June, when both the Capellans and Davian Liberators abandoned the system. The Liao Lancers had their chance at payback later that year, with a raid of their own against Jaipur. The Davian counteroffensive maintained its momentum into 2810, the three task groups landing on nine different worlds altogether between February and April. Word of the pincer attack the Fed Sons were attempting had made it to those infantry regiments guarding the centre of the line. Fear of an impending encirclement and potentially harsh retributions for their actions earlier in the war caused many to desert their posts. This left the battle mech units unsupported and exposed. McKinnon's raiders undertook deep raids against the Combine throughout the year to keep them off balance. A lack of available transports further hampered Kirita's efforts to blunt the Davian advance. The second, much shorter counteroffensive concluded in December. Paul Davian had planned to take a pause here to regroup, but reports from the front suggested that the Draconis Combine mustard soldiery were finally forming a defensive line ahead. The longer he waited, the better prepared Kirita would be once the fighting resumed. He therefore hurried to move up reinforcements and supplies to begin the third counteroffensive ahead of schedule, early in the new year. Archon Richard Steiner had run out of patience with his ineffectual military leadership. One of the few units to achieve success for the Commonwealth had been the Stealth's Mercenary Regiment. In recent years, they had helped make possible, either through direct assault or supporting raids, the capture of two planets within the Dieron military district. For that reason, the Archon made the decision to nationalise the unit in 2810. At great cost, he bought out the entire regiment. Colonel Hempstead was paid a handsome fee to sign on with the LCAF, and given greater authority to command operations on the ground. As part of the deal, the stealths were granted a period of rest and recreation, far away from the Curitan front. In December, the Lyran Commonwealth made another attempt to retake Marsal. Despite a relative parity in the numbers, the Bolan defenders were able to hold their ground and force the LCAF to withdraw in the new year, handing the Archon his second defeat in successive years. In an effort to relieve the pressure on those stranded units, the Captain General decided to launch a diversionary campaign on the extreme end of the border at Poulsbo. If the attack here proved successful, Thaddeus Maddock hoped to link up with the Crux from both sides, cutting off a large chunk of the Eladium province. They made landfall in early 2811, expecting minimal resistance, but they found the fully recuperated stealths and a strong aerospace presence. A detachment of fighters swept in on the recharging jump ships and destroyed them in seconds, stranding the Atrian Dragoons on world. The Lyrans now use their complete air superiority to hunt down and wipe out the entire regiment. With his campaign on Paul's bow brought to a sudden and ignominious end in March, the Captain General reluctantly accepted the fact that the Bolan Thumb was lost. He dispatched messages to the last of the defenders, informing them of his decision. The subtext of his missive was clear. He expected them to fight to the last. 
While the decision to move the stealths over to Paul's bow proved extremely fortuitous, some even speculate the LIC was aware of Thaddeus' plans and the Archon's offer of r r was a ruse, it unfortunately came at the cost of further losses on the Curitan front. In the past few years, the Draconis Combine had taken four systems from the Tamar Pact, getting dangerously close to their capital. If the Federated Sons had learned anything from their near destruction, it was that the division of their perimeter marches into combat regions had contributed significantly to the way in which the DCMS had rolled over them earlier in the war. Because they were cross-sections of the march, if the Curitans could capture the capital and eliminate the leadership, they had effectively cleared a path straight through to the Crucis March. It was very challenging for the neighbouring combat regions to support them, or manoeuvre forces around in front of the advance. For that reason, Paul Davian came up with the concept of polymorphous defence zones. The Capellan and Draconis marches would be redistricted into irregular but interlinked areas that would hopefully prevent a similar collapse in the future. At the conclusion of the second Davian counteroffensive, the First Prince dispatched a small force to Mirak in December. This would be the final strike Paul planned to make against the Capellan Confederation, as most of his energy went into preparing for the next wave of attacks against the Draconis Combine. In March, the planet was his, and he began the third and final counteroffensive of the war. The goal was to push the Draconis Combine all the way back to their pre-war borders and establish a new defensive line. Once again, the AWFS approached from two directions, skirting along the edge of their old border from the Spinward End, while the main advance pushed deep into the former Clovis combat region. As anticipated, the DCMS had fortified the region substantially. They no longer displayed the same shell-shocked behaviour as they had in the aftermath of the Kintari massacre. They faced particularly stubborn resistance on Harrow's son, Regiments from the Combine interior had also been redeployed to the front. This was made possible in part through the actions of Amphigy and Agriculture Incorporated, who in 2811 formed a security group to protect their assets and any supporting industries, thus freeing up the mustard soldiery and garrison to move elsewhere. Early in 2811, Ilsa Liao and Amrashkarovka began an audacious operation that they hoped would give them an edge over their competitors. They began to approach Comstar technicians in the hope of winning them over to the Confederation. With their expertise, they could train their own loyal workforce and move to take control of the HPGs within their realm. If successful, they could avoid paying Comstar the substantial fees they charged on all military communiques. Things escalated around March-April time, when Mashkarovka agents posing as a terrorist group attempted to seize the Hyperpulse station on Nanking. But remarkably, the attack was thwarted by the chief administrator and their staff, who ambushed them inside the facility. Comstar uncovered the identity of the terrorists soon after, and in May, the First Circuit agreed to form a covert security force in response, ROM. Training was to take place at the reactivated Sandhurst Military Academy, site of some of the most intense fighting during the Battle for Terra. At the Terran end of the Capellan Confederation lay the former hegemony world of Brownsville. As a system of die-hard Amaris loyalists, they had received precious little in way of support from Alexander Kerensky after his liberation, and the world had fallen on hard times. This was a hardship partly of their own making, as their fervent commitments to the Emperor had led them to detonate nuclear warheads among their own industrial centres in order to prevent them from falling into SLDF hands. They had at least evacuated the complexes ahead of time, a courtesy rarely afforded by retreating AEAF forces. In one of the very few exceptions to the purge that followed the collapse of the Empire, the planetary government had retained its power, much to the consternation of people like Kerensky and had tried for a time to maintain their independence. Witnessing the fate of Inglesmund led them to finally submit before House Liao when they threatened a similar scouring in 2789. The decades-long process of rebuilding was finally coming to a conclusion in the early 29th century. What perhaps was not understood was that their reduced industrial output had allowed them to skirt under the radar in the earlier phase of the war. But now, with a functioning and relatively advanced industrial base, 
covetous neighbours were starting to look their way. In 2811, the Free Wells League decided that the people of Brownsville would be better off under the protection of the Captain General. A force was dispatched to take control of what appeared to be a relatively undefended world. But the Brownsville militia were all veterans of the Civil War, their inexperienced younger generation siphoned off into the ranks of the CCAF. They put up unexpected resistance that the Marrick forces could not contend with. It was a humiliation that the invaders were not prepared to leave unanswered. As they departed, a civilian freighter approached the system, going unnoticed by those on planet. As it moved into orbit, it unleashed a cargo of strategic weapons that obliterated the cities of Brownsville, killing more than a hundred million civilians. The nuclear winter that followed was so severe that the death toll would reach a quarter billion within the next two years almost half of the planet's population, and that number had doubled by war's end. The few million survivors would all succumb to the planet's poisoned atmosphere within the next few decades. 2811 saw the final battles for what was once the Bolan Thumb. Earlier in the year, four LCAF regiments descended on a crux for the second time. The defenders were still heavily damaged from the prior attack, and the Captain General had not been willing to resupply them. The Marrick Militia lifted off early on, leaving the Bolan defenders to hold out as long as they could. The final holdouts were destroyed in May. Another four regiments landed on Marsal in November. Here, they faced off with the very last of the Bolan defenders. Fanaticized by Marrick propaganda, they gave their lives for a hopeless cause, dragging the battle out for four months before they fell. Over the winter, the Federated Suns succeeded in taking three more worlds from House Kirita. One of their targets was the planet Megihi, part of the Draconis Combine since the colony was first founded, where they destroyed the Galadin regulars in garrison. With the capture of Tishomingo, the pre-war Fairfax combat region was completely liberated. The next wave began in April, securing another three systems over the next seven months, but only after fierce fighting on New Iverson. This was somewhat offset by the complete absence of the DCMS on Dobson. By this point, it was clear to coordinator Jinjiro that Paul Davian was trying to isolate the capitals of Dahar 4 and Robinson, the command and control hubs for the mustard soldiery deployed within the occupied territory. 2812 was a rough year for the Lyran Commonwealth. At the same time as they were hunting down the last of the Boland defenders in February, the Draconis Combine attacked Caldria and Dove with an overwhelming force of light battle mechs. Moving too quickly for conventional weapons, the garrison commanders attempted to use nuclear warheads to stop them. The DCMS retaliated with chemical weapons on Dove, rendering the world inhospitable. The last of the civilian population would either evacuate off-world or die within the next three years. Around this time, the newly formed ROM were beginning their first operations within the Capellan Confederation. Relations between the two were frayed by the attempt at seizing an HPG the previous year. Both were looking to get retribution. ROM discovered that the Mashkarovka were plotting to assassinate the chief administrator of the Bryant HPG, a member of Comstar's First Circuit. After foiling their plans, the first major victory for the nascent covert ops group, Ilsa Liao ordered the Mashkarovka to cease any attempts at subverting Comstar control. The Chancellor had far greater ambitions at this time. Early in the year, a diversionary attack was launched by Blanford's Grenadiers on the planet Sirius. Though they succeeded in destroying the mercenaries in garrison, they did not try to hold on to the planet. Their objective was simply to misdirect the Federated Sons into thinking that Liao was focused on the Free World's border. A Capellan task force appeared above Chesterton in May. They faced only minimal resistance as they entered atmosphere. The four regiments touched down near various objectives that they hoped would finally bring the long-contested world under their control. Unfortunately for Liao, days before they departed the Confederation, an MWIO operative embedded within the Mashkarovka alerted Davian to their intended target giving the AWFS just enough time to relocate a few regiments of their own to the planet ahead of the invasion. They laid low until the CCAF made landfall, 
striking only as they began to emerge from their dropships. Unable to form a defensive line, the Capellans took heavy damage in these opening moments. Just three days into the campaign, the Capellan charges had been destroyed, and seven other battalions had been ravaged by the defending garrison. The Liao commander had no choice but to call a retreat, leaving with their tail tucked between their legs. Within the Lyran Commonwealth, the declining numbers of available jump ships were causing ever greater suffering on worlds that relied on those vital food shipments to survive. Several systems were in the midst of terrible famines, contributing to the abhorrent death toll of the First Succession War as much as the use of WMDs on the front lines. In June, the Speaker of the Assembly officially disbanded the Estates General on account of how few of the planetary rulers were able to make it to Tharkad. On August 3rd, the Archon was holding court when he was approached by Landgrave Richard Perkins of Hegel. His planet was in the midst of a plague epidemic, and the vital medical supplies were not reaching the system on account of the military requisitioning all available jump ships. Among the many dead were Perkins's family. As the noble approached within four meters of Steiner, he drew a laser pistol and went to shoot the Archon when one of the Griffin battle mechs standing guard slammed his fist down between the two. Perkins was taken captive, and the LIC quickly discovered that he had been paid handsomely by their rivals in safe to kill Richard Steiner. Thankfully, the attempt on his life had failed. Though the Lyran noble was sentenced to death, the Archon commuted his sentence to life imprisonment, understanding how the tragedy on Hegel had forced Perkins's hand. The final actions of 2812 came in November, when a Freewell's force landed on Alula Borealis, taking control of the system by year's end. The Lyran Intelligence Corps reported that this was likely the last move the Captain General would make for some time now, having thoroughly exhausted his forces in the region. With a brief reprieve, the Archon made the decision to disband his newly acquired elite regiment, the Stealths and spread their experienced mech warriors across the Commonwealth's military academies. He hoped that they would inspire a new wave of more capable commanders to enter service within the LCAF, and hopefully rejuvenate his stagnant and uninspired officer corps. In late 2812, the AFFS landed on another trio of planets in their continued campaign to reclaim the entirety of the Federated Suns. Two were captured in short order, but they faced a determined defense from the garrison on Nouveau Toulouse. Supporting the Federated Sons in their advance was Duke in exile Lawrence Nelson. Forced to leave his homeworld, he took five battalions of his planetary guard with him, offering their services to Davian as pseudo mercenaries. The planet was secured early in the new year, and the Combine Regiment destroyed. In March, Troops were dispatched to the next wave of targets, capturing the remaining six systems by year's end. Those sent to Fairfield were particularly fortunate, as they discovered the DCMS had packed up and left long before their arrival. The Curita Bulge had now been compressed down to its narrowest since the first week of Jinjiro's invasion. Next up were the primary targets of the counteroffensive, Dahar and Robinson. The Lyran Intelligence Corps had reported that the Free World's border was likely to be quiet for the foreseeable future, as House Maddock was dealing with the same supply and transport problems as the Commonwealth. What they failed to account for was that House Cameron Jones had several well-rested provincial regiments deep within the Principality of Regulus that could be moved up to the front line. Bella I was a world that had already changed hands twice during the First Succession War. But even still, it came as a shock when the FWLM arrived in April. The defenders were alerted to their presence as soon as they appeared at the zenith. Unsecured radio chatter revealed they faced four enemy regiments, a force they could not hope to hold off. Faced with the loss of his garrison, Colonel Hamlin decided to call for an immediate retreat off-world. The Lyran aerospace fighters were ordered not to engage the incoming dropships so that they would be at maximum strength to escort the Lyran regulars out to their jumpships. The Regulan hussars were the first down and immediately moved to prevent the withdrawal. A frenzied battle took place at the spaceport, but Hamlin was able to lift off with most of his forces. It was only when they were halfway to the system's nadir that they realized that the Freewell's guards hadn't even arrived in system yet. 
Colonel McGain's reckless attack had been a ruse to make them think that he was outnumbered. The Lyran commander did not remain a colonel for much longer once High Command discovered he'd surrendered Bella so easily. Not everything was going the League's way in 2813, however. In the spring, Comstar technician Emma Gomez at the Carver 5 base was discovered to be a safe operative feeding information back to the Captain General on Blake's activities. Their scheme was quickly foiled by Rom, and in the aftermath, Blake decided to expand the organization's internal security force to prevent any further leaks. The only other activity in 2813 occurred within the Tikhonov commonality. Paul Davian had hoped the loss at Chesterton would have dissuaded the Chancellor from making any other moves in the region, but the opportunistic Ilsa Liao knew that the First Prince was too busy with his counter-offensive to maintain much of a garrison in the region. Landing on Mirak in July, they took the world for the Confederation two months later. They also repulsed combine assaults on Bryant, Epsilon Indy and Ingress. Throughout the First Succession War, Comstar under Jerome Blake was content to sit back and play a largely pacifist role in maintaining the Innisfere's HBG network. Ensuring their continued monopoly over all interstellar communications was their sole aim at this point in their history. They did what they could to avoid becoming targets for the rampaging successor states by decommissioning their battle mech factories and naval yards and secretly mothballing their hidden warship fleet. Operation Silver Shield was the last overt military action that they took back at the beginning of the conflict, and there are very few other incidents in which their involvement is only suspected. Lauren Hayes, who had led her SLDF forces to victory on Terra, both alongside Kerensky and under the orders of the First Circuit, would retire within the next two years. The Comstar Expeditionary Divisions would themselves be disbanded, and their assets put into long-term storage beneath their headquarters at the Hilton Head HPG on Terra. But this was not the end of Comstar's involvement in the Succession Wars. The past few years had seen the emergence and fast growth of a new power within their ranks, ROM. This shadowy internal security force, answerable solely to the Prime Administrator, would soon become a secret intelligence agency to rival any belonging to the Great Houses. The First Succession War would soon enter its final phase. Little did humanity know that one of the greatest opponents of peace had come into being and was now spreading like a virus across the inner sphere. Throughout the first two and a half decades of the Succession Wars, the periphery realms looked on in mute horror as the great houses of the Inner Sphere obliterated one another with weapons of mass destruction. No doubt some among the former territorial states considered this just deserts for those who had spent centuries exploiting them, but the cataclysm unleashed on the Inner Sphere so far surpassed the misery of the reunification and freedom wars that most felt deeply uncomfortable celebrating the news. It's important to realise that the periphery only had a fragmentary understanding of what was transpiring in the Inner Sphere. Comstar was making little to no effort to maintain their HPG network that far from Terra, nor replace those damaged in the uprising. From the perspective of the average citizen, they would have first heard of the growing tensions between the member states and likely the pronouncements of the successor lords that they intended to rule the Star League. From that point on, the Concordat, Magistracy and Outworlds would surely have transitioned to a war footing if they weren't already. Invasion seemed imminent. Reports of an outbreak of hostilities along all borders would have had them preparing for the worst, and rumours of planetary extinctions, if they could be believed, would no doubt have heightened the feeling of growing terror. But over the next few years, the merchant jump ships they relied upon both for essential supplies and for accounts of the war steadily reduced in number. As the successor states commandeered ever more civilian vessels, and likely any foreign ones that entered their territory, less and less information was able to filter out to the periphery states. 
it would have been as if a supermassive black hole had appeared at the heart of the old Star League and gradually expanded to engulf the inner sphere, swallowing everything in its reach. The news blackout likely created a feeling of deep uncertainty and paranoia. Perhaps some even wondered if they were all that was left. The complete breakdown of interstellar travel had immediate and disastrous outcomes for the distant periphery. While they had craved freedom from the Star League, they still expected inner sphere traders to do business with them. Many colonies were entirely dependent on food shipments to survive, but with civilian transports regularly pressed into service with the Navy, what few independent merchants still existed had their hands full trying to keep their own nations hungry fed. None could risk travelling through open war zones to reach the periphery. This problem was exacerbated by a lack of diversification on many of the periphery worlds. As former territories of the League, the planetary economies were often hyper-focused on just one or two industries, or sometimes even a single product. When those closely interdependent worlds could no longer export their products or trade with their partners, economic collapse followed, hastening the rapid decline of many systems. Each passing year only worsened the issue until the outermost colonies began to starve. Despite being removed from the worst of the fighting, the periphery worlds suffered even greater numbers of abandonment than their warring counterparts. The fiercely isolationist systems of the Outworlds Alliance were the worst affected. Many of the newest and most distant were reliant on the continual flow of money and resources from the Terran hegemony, a nation-state that no longer existed. Those former hegemony citizens that fled in a mass exodus following the fall of the Star League often ended up out in these backwaters, only to suffer the same miseries they had hoped to flee. As the situation grew desperate, the Outworlds Alliance created a provisional relief force to assist in decolonizing non-viable worlds. The scarcity of food led to a sharp uptick in theft and piracy, necessitating a military presence to maintain law and order. Some Outworlds planets even went as far as hiring small mercenary bands to conduct raids on their supposed allies. Despite their best efforts, many starved long before help arrived. There is a certain sad irony to the fact that the Outworlds Alliance, who were not attacked by Davian or Kirita even once during the First Succession War, lost more worlds to famine or abandonment than any of the Great Houses. The barren systems of the Outworlds Wastes live on in interstellar maps as a monument to so many millions of dead. In the wake of the Star League's collapse, banditry was on the rise across all known space. At the forefront of these new pirate kingdoms was the distant Tortuga Dominion, and several former Amaris holdings unsurprisingly became pirate enclaves too. The rump states of the former Rimworld's Republic had died out, the Oberon Confederation in 2796 and the Finnmark Free Republic a few years after that, both succumbing to the constant bandit raids and no small amount of meddling by the Lyrans. But the major periphery realms themselves were one of the biggest contributors to the growing epidemic. In the build-up towards the Freedom War, the territorial states had clandestinely funded several rebel or even terrorist groups in an effort to cause maximum unrest within the Star League. When Kerensky granted them their independence, they were left with a number of heavily armed bands who refused to swear fealty to the ruling houses. Instead, they preyed upon the fringe systems while the government was busy trying to rebuild. The remnants of the secret army inadvertently left these rebels with enormous weapon stockpiles that meant they were far beyond the ability of local police to deal with. It was a problem that would continue for years or even decades before peace was finally restored. The rare shipyards still operating in the periphery could not avoid becoming targets for pirates, or perhaps even covert attacks from the Inosphere intelligence agencies. The facilities at both Canopus and Taurus were destroyed, and the Outworlds decommissioned their sole naval base, both due to a lack of parts and to avoid becoming a target. To help bring an end to the fighting, several new regiments cropped up across the periphery. The Hades Light Infantry and Cassandra's volunteers were reformed, the Pleiades Hussars were expanded, and the Outworlds created the Remora Guards. 
when the periphery militaries weren't hunting bandits, they were busy preparing for what still felt like an inevitable invasion. Even after 25 years, they were still vastly outnumbered by their old oppressors, and it seemed as if at any moment they could turn outwards and unleash hell upon them. While the successor states had enough raw manpower to weather the devastation, if the same tactics were employed against the periphery, it risked a sudden and terminal collapse. But the Sword of Damocles never fell, and instead, the decades-long standoff led to a line of strategic reasoning that we now refer to as the Purana Principle. In nature, individual Puranas will violently and relentlessly attack any prey or potential rival, including other Puranas. However, shoals of Puranas can grow to as many as a thousand fish without them turning on one another in a bloodbath. This is because to attack any of the Puranas around them risks opening themselves to an attack from another, meaning such behaviour inevitably leads to their own death. Likewise, the succession wars as a whole exhibit this same behaviour. Individually, any single successor state could take on and annihilate one of their smaller periphery neighbours. However, to do so would require redeploying the forces along their other borders to face their new target and doing that would expose themselves to an attack. The stalemate that had developed by this point in the war, and continues on to this day, ensures that no one can ever land a knockout blow. It is because of the Purana principle that the smaller periphery states can continue to exist in such close proximity to far larger and more dangerous hostile neighbours. In the roughly 240 years that the succession wars have raged, only one major campaign has ever involved the periphery states. By 2813, control of the Taurian Concordat had passed to protector Semyon Kolberon. An imminent Davian invasion had been threatened for some 25 years by this point, but the lack of activity along their border had Kolberon and the Taurian Defence Force looking elsewhere for opportunities to strengthen their realm. Lying just beyond their borders were the systems of Detroit and Herotitis, Nominally under the protection of the Magistracy of Canopus, but kept demilitarized by the SLDF, their proximity and sparse garrison made them attractive prizes. In June 2813, the TDF began moving. Strategic command was given to Marshal Blake Andrews, who led the Red Chasseurs towards Detroit, but the first task force to reach their destination were the Pleiades Hazars. Appearing at the zenith of Herotitis, they made little effort to conceal their arrival, allowing a jump ship time to depart and bring word back to the Magistracy. A relaxed burn towards their target gave the planetary militia ample time to launch their aerospace fighters, an asset which the Taurians failed to identify in any significant numbers. Numbers they had though, and the damage they inflicted as the enemy dropships entered atmosphere was extreme. More than two battalions of mechs and over a regiment of conventional forces were wiped out. The Taurian Comptroller paid for his arrogance, as he was one of the first to be shot out of the sky. What few survivors made landfall promptly surrendered. When Magistrix Shrawana Centrella got wind of the so-called Herotitis Crisis, she immediately set about organising a military response. Unaware that the invaders had long since surrendered, she dispatched a pair of her own regiments to seize neutral Spencer on the way towards a strike on the Concordat itself. Meanwhile, Blake Andrews arrived at Detroit. Five regiments under the command of the Taurian Guards General Natal Chaudhary touched down in good order and set about chasing down the militia forces. Despite their numbers advantage, unfamiliarity with the terrain meant they struggled to catch their quarry even after several months had transpired. Spencer was to be the first outing for the reformed Cassandra's volunteers. Though the planet was officially neutral, the Star League had declared it within the Concordat's sphere of influence, despite its proximity to the Magistracy. What might at first appear as an administrative error was intentional on the part of the League, as they sought to keep the two territories vying against each other instead of uniting against the High Council. The Taurian-leaning militia, far from being caught by surprise, were able to prepare an ambush for the approaching regiment, after identifying their primary objective through signal eavesdropping. They allowed the MAF units to enter the capital unmolested, only springing their trap once they were deep within the urban jungle. At the same time, fighters launched an attack on their dropships, 
cutting them off from a possible retreat. Cassandra's volunteers surrendered after the first battle, but had already suffered casualties of around 50%. The attack on Portland, the only significant battle to take place within the territory of one of the periphery nations during the First Succession War, was as unsuccessful as all prior engagements during the Magistracy Concordat conflict. The Canopian Light Horse was at least able to swiftly take control of the capital, but after a few failed attempts to halt guerrilla activity, they instead pillaged the city for anything of value and withdrew to their dropships, just in time to receive word that the two realms were already in peace talks. Quickly realising the futility of the conflict, a ceasefire between the two states was ratified in February 2814. The campaign had been a disaster for the Torians, and particularly House Calderon. Both parties blamed Protector Semyon for inciting conflict where before there had been none. He tried to deflect blame by removing Marshal Blake Andrews and appointing Chaudhry as the new head of the TDF, but the legacy of defeat would follow him for the next two years, until he was eventually forced to resign. Protector Reina Arantino was chosen by the Privy Council as his successor. The MAF had acquitted itself poorly as well, but their response had at least come quickly, their failures proving less consequential to the magistracy and House Centrella. Events in the periphery went largely unnoticed by those back in the Inner Sphere. They were far too preoccupied with their own conflict to spare a thought for the distant colonies dropping off the map. The responsibility for logging the gradual abandonment of deep space fell to Comstar, the only sufficiently large entity not currently engaged in destruction. But with so little interest in the periphery, they had little incentive to actively search for evidence of a colony's continued survival. In more than a few cases, planets that might have been viable withered and died because Comstar had prematurely removed them from the same astro-navigation charts that the few remaining merchant vessels were using to plot a course through the region. Some have even speculated that this was intentional on Blake's part, some petty retribution against those who he believed had brought down the Star League. The question is, how many of those supposedly dead worlds still survive today, hidden from the rest of humanity's view? The time had come for the armed forces of the Federated Sons to launch their attack on the heavily defended DCMS command bases on Dahar and Robinson. In March 2814, a warship squadron was dispatched to each system to clear the path for the ground invasions. Only a single ancient vessel moved to oppose them at Dahar, no match for the trio of Davian ships arriving but the nuclear arsenal it carried meant that it would drag two of them down into the abyss along with it. After that, the surface battle proved to be a complete anti-climax. Despite fearing a large fortified garrison, the Combine had actually withdrawn most of its forces before they could be cut off. A brief skirmish outside the capital city was enough to reclaim Dahar. The same was not true for Robinson, capital of the entire Draconis March. As before, the Federated Sun's Navy dispatched a trio of vessels to take control of the space lanes, facing off with two of the Draconis Combine Admiralty's few remaining warships, including what was once the flagship of the DCA's now extinct Second Fleet. The two command ships engaged each other while the destroyers paired off and the aerospace fighters entered into a melee of their own. Hanging back until all others are committed were three squadrons of land air mechs, when an opportunity presented itself, they rushed the new Samarkand and boarded the carrier after transitioning into battle mech form. The experienced crew on board was one of the finest remaining in service to Kirita, but were powerless to stop such a heavy assault force. The warship detonated minutes later, taking many of the boarding team with it. Soon after, the last of the Combine's naval defense was destroyed, at which point, Marshal Holder Davian ordered his task force to begin landing procedures. At least two DCMS regiments were reported on planet, split between the major cities. 
an overwhelming AWFS task force swept through the Battlemech defences within a week, but the infantry had gone to ground inside the residential districts, forcing a protracted struggle to root out the last of them, during which time several chemical weapons were used, poisoning the waterways. By sheer coincidence, the attack on Robinson coincided with a prison break staged by the cadets of the planet's military academy. The Draconis March capital had fallen so long ago that the survivors were now in their 40s. They took control of the prison facility's anti-air emplacements just as Haldadavian was coming under fire from the Curitan fighters outside the complex, helping to sway the battle in the AWFS's favour. By May, both Dahar and Robinson were securely under Federated Sun's control. Paul Davian had to decide how much further he wanted to push his luck. His troops, still buoyed by the successive victories they had achieved, were nevertheless reaching a point of exhaustion. They could not maintain the speed of their earlier advance. With that in mind, he stretched out his time plan and withdrew what he could for recuperation in safer regions. He also moved troops to the Capellan border, who were once again nibbling at the Chesterton Welds, taking Farwell after a brief one-month battle in June. The counter-offensive began again towards the end of the year. In the last two months of 2814, the AWFS made landfall on Glenmora, Clathandu and Sakara. Like the cadets on Robinson, those Sakara Academy students who had taken up arms had to wait almost three decades to see their home liberated. At Clathandu, Curitan warships unleashed a devastating orbital barrage on the ground forces below, prompting a nuclear exchange between the two commanders. The planet would survive, but it was one of the lowest points of the campaign for Davian. The year had gone poorly for the Free Worlds League. A raid on Holt by the Chevaux Leger had resulted in the complete destruction of the Green Orloff Grenadiers in Garrison but worse was to follow in 2815. An extremely virulent bioweapon was unleashed on the planet Jardine by unknown forces. The world was home to some 40 or 50 million, but Thaddeus Maddock was forced to enact a complete quarantine or risk having the bioagent spread beyond the system, leaving the inhabitants to their sad fate. Nearby, the Lyran High Command began what would be only their second major offensive of the Succession Wars, Operation Spiderweb. The brainchild of Hauptmann General Ranier Hogarth, the goal was to push the Free Worlds League out of the Solaris Bulge and take for themselves the economic powerhouses of Kalidasa and the game world Solaris itself. Two task groups were organized on either side of the region each comprising a trio of regulars and one of the Elysian Lancers regiments. The operation commenced in February, with the dual assaults on Uhuru and Wing. Hogarth's campaign was slow and deliberate, about the only strategy the LCAF was capable of at that point in the war, but it was nonetheless successful. The massively outnumbered FWLM garrisons could not hope to match them, with victory achieved, they waited for conventional reinforcements to arrive before departing to their next targets. 2815 saw only limited action along the Federated Suns border. Between March and October, the Federated Suns took back Breed, Royal and Talmadge. To help reinforce their struggling defensive line, Kirita hired on the Paul Bunyan Regiment of mixed AEAF and SLDF vintage. The collapse of the Combine's invasion was having a distinct impact on the Curitan officer corps. The veterans were dropping like flies. Many were so ashamed by their inability to hold the AWFS that they decided to commit seppuku. It became an endemic problem for the DCMS, to the point where Jinjiro Kirita was forced to step in and outlaw the practice completely. He also had to reel in his own brutalistic treatment of those who failed him as the number of qualified commanders continued to dwindle. This was both a blessing and a curse for the Fed Sons. The replacement officers were young green cadets straight out of school. While they lacked experience, they did not feel the same shame their predecessors did regarding the Kintari massacre, and so fought with renewed vigor. One of the strangest curiosities to come out of 2815 occurred within the Capellan Confederation, Bordering the Chesterton commonality was the planet Westphalia, 
garrisoned by a regiment of their voltigeurs. It was close enough to the front that they could expect trouble, but otherwise of little strategic importance. When a raiding party did arrive, it did so from an entirely unexpected source. Freeman's fanatics were mercenaries employed by Haus Steiner. The exact reason for such a deep strike is lost to history, with some speculating it was either an attempt to recover information found by a Lyran agent, or perhaps the fallout of a failed alliance between the Commonwealth and Confederation. In early 2816, the Bella system once again became the site of a battle between Marek and Steiner. The Lyran regulars, who had retreated so ingloriously, were now returning. They had spent the last two years training under Raymond Hempstead, the former colonel of the Stealths Regiment. He was given command of the operation, seconded by Lieutenant Colonel Marcus Steiner, the Archon's son and heir. Political squabbling within the Free Worlds League gave them the opportunity they had been waiting for, as the Regulan Hazars returned back to their principality, leaving the defence of Bella open. The new garrison had only just arrived on Weld when the attack commenced. Hempstead's signature manoeuvring tactics brought the battle to a swift end in March. In the wake of the battle at Bella, the grizzled stealth veteran was recalled to Tharkad, leaving command to the now brevet colonel Marcus Steiner. Hempstead had impressed the Archon with how he had improved the abilities of the Lyran regulars under his command. Richard Steiner now paired him with a few of the retired mech warriors of the Stealths and Tamar Tigers, and tasked them with doing the same for the 54th Lyran Guards. Back in February, the AWFS took aim at four more worlds belonging to House Kirita, including the Bene system, a pre-war holding of theirs. The slow but steady campaign succeeded in driving them off by November. Meanwhile, the Capellans launched another invasion of Castleton in July. Two months later, the planet was once again flying the banner of House Liao. Paul Davian was tiring of these constant attacks in the region, and so had authorised a new front to be opened within the Cyan and St. Ives commonalities, two regions that had barely seen any fighting during the war. The Certis Fusiliers took point, and by the end of the year had secured six new worlds for the Capellan March. This came at the cost of two regiments, and so further advances were called off. It had done the job though, as Liao would not strike at the Federated Sons again for years. The Commonwealth borders were particularly active throughout 2816. Bella was just one of the systems taken from Marek, as Operation Spiderweb pressed deeper into the Solaris Bulge. Their objective was to attack the Duchy of Kalidasa from two sides, and cut off any defenders on the capital. Over the next year or two, each of the task forces would take a trio of planets. Marek was trying to organise a response, but Capellan raids on his spinward flank kept him off balance. On the Curitan front, the Draconis Combine had taken seven worlds from the Commonwealth over the last few years, and destroyed another regiment while they were at it. However, Richard Steiner's decision to break up the stealths and send them to the academies was starting to pay dividends. The commanders within the Tamar Pact launched a successful campaign along the border between the Benjamin and Raselhaig military districts, taking seven more systems back in that same period. 2817 would be the penultimate year of the Davian counteroffensive, beginning in March with attacks on Allerton, Courtney, Emporia, and Sauk City. As they drew ever closer to what was considered firm House Kudita territory, the First Prince became more cautious of increased civilian resistance and attacks staged from deeper within the Combine. By September, the four planets had returned to the Federated Suns, and a couple of months later, they made their last moves of the year against Bettendorf, Crossing, and Franklin. Also targeted was Lima across their Starly Gera border, where another of the Galadan Regulars regiments was destroyed. In April, the Free Wells League launched the final offensive of what had once been the Bolan Thumb. The invasion of Kavanagh and Ilion were of secondary note compared to what would be the fifth battle for Bella, not counting the many raids against the planet. Coinciding with the attacks was another raid launched against the capital of Rancher within the Federation of Sky. Two months earlier, Marcus Steiner had received a shipment of tactical nukes on Bella, 
assigning them primarily to his aerospace assets. Additional reinforcements came from one of the last Essex-class destroyers in the Navy. Despite his privileged birth, Marcus was not merely in command because of his name. He had learned well from Colonel Hempstead and was prepared to resist the FWLM. Escorting the three Maddock Battle Mech regiments to Bella were a pair of Caddocks. Originally envisioned as an armed transport and not a mainline warship, they stood little hope of overcoming the hostile destroyer, something which became readily apparent when the lead vessel disintegrated under the Edelweiss's cannon fire within just two minutes. Recognizing that she was outgunned, Captain Monica Talassi ordered her crew to abandon ship. As they made for the lifeboats, she took the controls and piloted it on a collision course with the Lyran destroyer. Edelweiss evaded too late, and the entire starboard side of the warship was ripped off before a magazine explosion detonated both vessels. With both sides losing their naval support early, the remaining forces were closely matched. The FWLM had strength in numbers, both battle mechs and aerospace fighters, but Steiner's fighters were equipped with tactical warheads which even the playing field. The Lyran regulars proved to be highly evasive, picking and choosing when to engage in battle only at favourable moments. But the League troops proved equally skilled, and by December it had become clear that the LCAF would need to withdraw. Casting aside what equipment they couldn't take with them, Marcus and his regulars departed for their jump ships. When the Marrick units moved in to seize their prize, booby traps among the abandoned mechs detonated the remaining nuclear weapons, inflicting another two companies of casualties on the victorious Freewells League. This would prove to be the last battle on this part of the front, both sides now turning their attention towards the Solaris Bulge. The Capellan war machine was grinding to a halt at this point in the war. Another of the Capellan charges had succumbed to their losses in 2817, and battlefield attrition meant less than 10% of their regiments could field even two battalions. The planets themselves were suffering from the damage too, as vital environmental systems were either destroyed or broke down due to the lack of replacement parts. To help maintain some of the equipment that was quickly becoming branded as Lost Tech, Liao established the Capellan Science Foundation in 2818. Other similar institutions would appear across the inner sphere in the years and decades to come, but the rampant destruction meant that preserving advanced technology was becoming an ever greater challenge. In April, Paul Davian launched the final three planetary liberations of the counter-offensive. Two months later, Marduk, Sheet, and Tripoli were restored to the Federated Suns. With the Draconis Combine pushed more or less back to their pre-war borders, plus a handful of their own worlds taken by Davian for good measure, the First Prince called a halt to the campaign. Pushing the Mustard Soldiery back became more difficult with each passing year. Continuing the assault risked having nothing left with which to hold on to their reclaimed territory. The war had cost House Kirita 20 battle mech regiments on this front alone. The exact date of their destruction is lost to the chaos of the First Succession War, but the vast majority either fell or surrendered post Kintari massacre, making the atrocity the most costly mistake of Jinjiro's reign of terror. By the end of 2818, the Lyran Commonwealth's Operation Spiderweb completed the first phase of their efforts to secure the valuable Solaris system when the two task forces regrouped within the Duchy of Kaladasa on Alks and New Hope, less than three light years away. The Free Worlds League had not laid down and surrendered yet, destroying one of the Donegal Guards and retaking four of the ten systems Halpman General Hogarth had seized. Nevertheless, the encirclement of the provincial capital was now complete. In the new year, the seven remaining regiments would combine to make an overwhelming assault on Kaladasa. As 2819 began, combat activity across the Inner Sphere was in a terminal decline, as exhaustion and lack of equipment became a rampant issue within each of the successor state militaries. In the final five years of the war, only two systems exchanged hands on the Capellan Freewell's border. Tit for tat action on Matheran the previous year showed that both sides barely had the strength to hold an objective, 
and the loss of one of the Confederation's mercenary regiments underlined the reality that House Liao could no longer muster an offensive at this stage. On the opposite side of the Inner Sphere, the Draconis Combine was making the last of its major raiding campaigns against the Lyran Commonwealth, targeting Alexandria, Kessel and Tamar. Another unit was dispatched to the edge, only to discover that the world was completely without garrison, netting Kirita an easy conquest. Other than that, the two realms took just two other systems from each other as the fighting came to a halt. The Federated Sons found itself dangerously overextended along the Combine border. Paul Davian made the difficult decision to withdraw from nine systems he had fought hard to take over the past two decades. Some of these were longtime Curitan holdings with unruly populaces, but others had welcomed the Fed Sons liberators with open arms. In total, fighting within the occupied territory, both during the initial invasion and the counteroffensive, have resulted in the deaths of more than a billion people. The last major offensive of the First Succession War, Operation Spiderweb, entered its final phase in February 2819. The garrison at Rochelle had been redeployed to the nearby provincial capital, meaning the planet fell to Ranier Hogarth's task force almost immediately. Expecting them to follow the same plodding advance as they had up to this point, the forces on Kaladasa and Solaris struck out in April, hoping to liberate some of the wells the Hauptmann General had seized during the advance. As the Matic forces approached their jump ships, Leiden warships entered the system, escorting all seven regiments that had only just taken Rochelle. The Steiner commander had not bothered to wait for reinforcements to secure the planet, and instead banked on their attack catching the Duke of Kaladasa flat-footed, which it did. The system wasn't totally without defense, however, as waiting at the Zenith were the last FWLM warships in the region. By this point in the war, there were barely any surviving shipyards capable of servicing such vessels, and so not one of the warships was fully functional. Only the LCS Chaffee survived the engagement, which also claimed most of the Marek militia who were caught in space. The attack group made landfall nine days later, the surviving garrison surrendering two months after that. With Solaris now totally surrounded, Hogarth enacted his master plan. Instead of dispatching his task force to claim the game world, he sent diplomats. The population was already in unrest as news filtered in and their situation became clear. However, the last thing Steiner wanted was for the hordes of mech gladiators on planet to take to the field to protect their home. Intense urban fighting would surely follow if that happened, leading to widespread destruction. The Lyran diplomats offered the civilian government special status within the Commonwealth as a neutral system under the protection of the LCAF, in exchange for a cut of the planet's profits. After three months of debate, Solaris seceded from the Free Worlds League on September 10th and demanded that the FWLM garrison withdraw by the end of the year. The Maddock commander prepared to seize the capital and enact martial law, but when it became clear that no help would be coming, they reluctantly departed for safer territory. The Lyran Commonwealth moved into their new holding early in the new year. The transition had caused a minimum of disruption, for which the locals were thankful. Operation Spiderweb had been a huge success for Haus Steiner. Reclaiming the Bolan Thumb had removed an ever-present threat to their realm as well as righting a perceived wrong dating back to before the Star League. But the capture of Kaladasa and Solaris, two enormously wealthy systems that had avoided the worst of the succession wars, was a far greater boon to their economy. Other systems in the region had been less fortunate. Shertan and Uhuru had been reduced to a shadow of their former glory. The Free Worlds League was not above petty retribution, however. In one of the few collaborations between realms in the First Succession War, in 2820, the Red Eagles Mercenary Battalion in the employ of the Draconis Combine was loaned out to the Free Worlds League to hit their shared enemy, the Lyran Commonwealth. Partnering with Clinton's cutthroats, the two units struck at Solaris in March. A reliance on mercenaries for attacks like this was becoming ever more common during the final years of the war, with the Free Worlds also signing on Salacia's defiance that year. 
the raiders sent to Solaris had come to cause as much destruction as possible, particularly to the water treatment facilities on planet. The two inflicted considerable damage before the garrison was able to organize and force them to depart, but as they did so, their warship escort maneuvered overhead to bombard Solaris City from orbit, killing thousands below. The raiding party withdrew soon after. This act of revenge may have hurt the planet's population, but it would ensure that they would never willingly submit to Marak rulership again. Despite the blow to relations between the two states, the reality of the First Succession War was becoming clear to both ruling houses. In late 2820, diplomats convened on Bella and began peace talks. Like so many terrible conflicts in history, the loss of life in what would be the final year of the First Succession War is all the more tragic because every side by this point understood that a ceasefire was imminent. After three and a half decades of carnage, they could no longer continue to wage total war against one another. Yet despite this, those in charge persisted in ordering raids and even 11th hour invasions right up to the bitter end. The Capellans had managed to force the Marek militia off Quamashu the previous year, but ultimately withdrew once House Allison sent in reinforcements. Ilsa Liao's main focus was on the Davian front. A raid on Helixmar and the capture of Rollis kicked off 2821, before she launched her final land grab in February. The Seacaf made use of fast-moving locust battle mechs to run rings around the garrison on Ulaanbaatar, taking back control of the contested system. Striking at targets of opportunity across their respective border, Davian and Kirita also undertook their final raids of the war. The AFFS would take this one step further, a late invasion seizing control of the immensely wealthy New Aberdeen, in the hopes it could help rebuild the devastated Draconis March. The proximity of the fighting caused the nearby Anting University to organize its student body into four regiments, offering their services to the DCMS as their rivals from the Sunzang Military Academy had for many years. Colonel Raymond Hempstead had spent the latter years of the war training one of the Lyran Guards regiments in fast attack tactics and manoeuvre warfare, hoping they would become the spiritual successor to the famed stealths. Lyran High Command, spurred on by the successful capture of Utrecht at the beginning of the year, ordered a last minute jab at the Draconis Combine as a way to trial their new performance. Now known as Hempstead's Greyhounds, the unit was dispatched on a deep raid against Otho, an attack that would prove disastrous. Despite his tutelage, the regiment was still untested, and the engagement on Otho proved to be their last. Hempstead, who had unsuccessfully petitioned to be sent along with his students, was distraught by their loss. Richard Steiner, meanwhile, was enraged that such a foolish venture had been attempted and demoted all those responsible. He recalled the former stealth commander back to Tharkad. When Hempstead arrived, the Archon declared that the former Amaris Empire soldier was to be promoted to Hauptmann General and given command of training operations within the LCAF. Furthermore, he was dispatched to the Kiritan front to take full control of the region. In the last and perhaps most ill-conceived move of the war, Captain General Thaddeus Marek decided to launch an attack on Gironne in April, in retaliation for a raid on Wing. The planet had fallen to the Commonwealth some three decades earlier, but rather than try to use it as a bargaining chip in the ongoing peace talks on Bella, he decided to take it by force. Leaving his flagship in orbit, Thaddeus took to the field to take command of the operation. On May 7th, as he met with his officers to discuss tactics for the upcoming battle, an artillery shell impacted his tent, and the Captain General was killed. In an ironic twist, just nine days later, Maddock and Steiner would sign the Peace Accord of Bella I, the First Nations of the Succession Wars to formally end the conflicts between them. 
When the Minister of Tikhonov, Dmitry Rogozin, tentatively called for an armistice around Chesterton, he found that the Federated Sons was open to the suggestion, with a formal truce agreed on September 24th. Likewise, Duke Jonathan Humphreys approached the Capellan Confederation looking to establish a ceasefire, which Ilse Liao ultimately agreed to in late November, ceding control of the contested Andurian systems back over to the Free Worlds League. By December, fighting between the Combine and Commonwealth had tapered off, but there was little hope of ever reaching a peace agreement with such an aggressive militaristic state. The same unofficial ceasefire extended to the Federated Sun's border. Raiding still took place, but rarely did it involve even a battalion of ground troops. The surviving successor lords at this time were looking around at the Inner Sphere to see what their conquests had won them. Certainly, the border regions had been hit hardest, but the loss of civilian transport meant that the human suffering extended deep into each realm, as colonies were forced to abandon their homes or simply left to wither and die without vital food or medical aid. Rationing had been in effect on almost every planet for three decades. Throughout our history of the conflict, we've mentioned specific raids when known but the strikes against those rare naval bases capable of constructing or servicing warships never ceased. Six more were destroyed over the course of the war, three crippled permanently and another three badly damaged. Overall production of jump ships was down by 95% compared to 2786. The Lyran Commonwealth, still the most industrious of the five successor states, had their manufacturing output halved. The new Dieron military district had lost more than 60% of its industrial capacity, and for House Davian, their income was less than 25% of their pre-war figures. The military losses were extreme. Some of the figures often quoted belie just how bad things were. For example, the Lyran Commonwealth began the war with 120 battle mech regiments on its rolls. Even including those units destroyed or disbanded, Wartime production meant that in 2821, they actually had 10 more mech regiments on the table. But out of all those units, the number of regiments operating just two full battalions was four. And the LCAF was the military that came out of the First Succession War the best. The hardest hit were the armed forces of the Federated Sons, who had lost more than 62% of their strength, primarily fighting House Curita. The human cost is truly unknowable. The chaos unleashed by absolute total warfare means that any figures will always be estimates. It's beyond question that tens of billions were killed in the First Succession War, but some sources count up into the hundreds of billions once the indirect casualties are factored in. A 2824 survey by the Comstar Safe Transit and Astro Navigation Project found that 22 colonies across the Inner Sphere had been destroyed from either bombardment or nuclear weapons. But on top of that, 31 were wiped out by disease, 72 planets died from famine, and another 23 succumbed to some other disaster. People will naturally ask, who won the First Succession War? The only appropriate answer is, no one did. Every realm came out of the conflict worse than they did when it started, whether they had directly participated in the fighting or not. We can, of course, look at it dispassionately and see that certain parties lost less than others. The Free Worlds League under Kenyan Marek had made enormous inroads into the Capellan Confederation and looked to be well on their way to dealing a knockout blow to House Liao until the invasion stalled. Their biggest accomplishment was reclaiming the ancestral home of both House Humphreys of Andurian and House Orloff of Carbonus. Unfortunately, all that goodwill went up in smoke when Thaddeus Maddock secured his position as Captain General through political strong-arming. Their intelligence agency SAFE had also lost the vast majority of their agents outside of the League, leaving them blind to events beyond their borders. Significant losses to the Lyran Commonwealth, notably the Bolan Thumb, and a military that was reduced by more than 60% preclude House Maddock from being considered the winners. The Capellan Confederation Armed Forces, despite also suffering 60% casualties, 
actually gained compared to their immediate rivals, coming out ahead of the FWLM and much closer to the AWFS. However, they had failed to capture their primary objective for the war, Chesterton. Furthermore, several of the worlds taken from the Terran hegemony had been lost to the Draconis Combine, a new dangerous entity on their Corwood border. Coupled with the many systems now belonging to Marek or their allies, House Liao is definitely one of the losers. The Federated Sun's counter-offensive under Paul Davian was amazingly successful, liberating almost all of the worlds they had lost up to that point. It came at an enormous cost, as previously mentioned, but it was nevertheless a victory for the First Prince who had further cemented his own power at home. But calling the Fed Sons a winner after the humiliation they suffered in the first decade of the conflict is dishonest. They were on the brink of utter destruction, and their recovery was a miracle made possible only through the atrocities committed by their arch-rivals. Further, the civilian population of the Davian realm was one of the worst affected by the conflict, with millions perishing from either starvation or disease after the loss of vital water purification technology on many raided worlds. The Draconis Combine was the only nation to gain on all three fronts, against the Federated Sons, the Lyran Commonwealth, the Terran Hegemony, and through them the Capellan Confederation. Reclaiming the Dieron system was something they took particular pride in. Their military losses, though severe, were not quite as bad as the AFFS who they had campaigned against. At home, these conquests were touted as a great victory for House Kurita, but privately, the collapse of Jinjiro's offensive had been a disaster. For them to come so close to outright domination over House Davian, only to stumble at the final step, was an indignity the coordinator struggled to deal with. With increasing frequency, Jinjiro was starting to show signs of a degenerative mental condition. Ironically, despite the Lyran Commonwealth Armed Forces consistently underperforming throughout the entire war, House Steiner came out ahead of their rivals, primarily because the brutal campaigns of Kenyan Marek and Jinjiro Kurita were targeting the opposite side of the inner sphere. The LCAF had begun the conflict on a relatively even keel with the FWLM and slightly behind the DCMS. Now, they were almost on par with the Mustard Soldiery and significantly ahead of the Free Worlds League military. Additionally, the key industrial world of Hesperus had survived three separate attempts to destroy it. Its survival guaranteed that Haussteiner's armed forces would recover faster than their rivals. What systems the Draconis Combine claimed along their Spinward border were more than offset by the removal of the Bolan Thumb and capture of Solaris and its neighbouring worlds, though House Kelswa would surely disagree. But as Steiner looked at the condition of those planets, they, like all those who had conquered worlds during the war, quickly discovered the miserable state of affairs on the ground. There was virtually nothing of value left in any of the border systems that so much blood had been spilled over. A shaky peace had slowly crept its way over the Inner Sphere. First between the Free Worlds League and Lyran Commonwealth in May, then the Capellan Confederation and Federated Sons in September. In November, House Humphreys agreed to a peace with Liao, which soon spread to all Marek territories, and by December, the Draconis Combine had ceased all but the most minor of actions against its neighbours. The First Succession War had ended. Word of the ceasefire filtered back to the royal palace on Tharkad. Upon hearing the news, the Archon let out a long sigh. <sighs> Thank God. It's over. <laughs>